This one happened a few weeks ago, and it happened really fast, in a matter of seconds. So, I'm working as a delivery guy for lunch meals in school. I basically start working at 3 a.m., loading my refrigerated truck with all the meals, a couple hundreds a day, and deliver them to all kinds of small schools that don't have a real kitchen, and they'll just have to heat up the meals for the kids at lunch. I have to start the work this early because, of course, all the deliveries at the schools have to be before noon. We also deliver to kindergarten and they need their meals before 10.30. So this morning, I've literally just started my delivery round as I'm arriving at the very first school I deliver. It's a village next to a big road, kind of on a mountain. And to get to the school, you have to drive all the way up to the top of the village, going on little streets. Then the school itself is a bit offset from the road. There's a few houses around, but on the very spot I stop my truck to make my deliveries, there's just a school on one side, and on the other side, there's a few meters of large grass, followed by a parking lot. At this specific spot, there's absolutely no light, since the public lights are off till 5am, and I'm here around 4am every morning. My only way to get some light is to get to the door where I need to deliver the meals, and to let the engine of my truck run, so I can light up the wall of the school with my headlights. Everything else around me is literally pitch black. So I do my delivery, come back out, close the back door of my truck, and realize I have to take a piss. So I stop by the grass against my truck to do it before hopping back in. As I said, it's pitch black. I'm literally facing darkness, and I can't see shit in front of me, except for the lights of the city that is like about 10 miles away downhill. I'm chilling here while peeing, looking at the sky because there's not a cloud. Since there's no public lights, I can see the stars pretty good. Then as I'm finishing, I put my head back down to my normal line of sight. With the lights of the city downhill in front of me, I see a silhouette passing in front of it. I literally get goosebumps thinking about it again and writing about it. I can just see the shape of a head and shoulders passing by a few meters in front of me in the darkness. And I only see it because of the city that's far away. At this moment, I'm done and closing my belt to get back in my truck, and I kind of instantly freak out, started walking along the side of my truck to get back in. I was behind the truck peeing, not close to the driver's door. I'm thinking to myself, nah man, that wasn't real. You didn't see a head and shoulders, just some leaves or a branch getting in the view, and you misinterpreted that. But I wasn't buying it at all. I was sure of what I saw, and I was freaking out. But here's the worst part. Once I'm back in my truck ready to leave, clutching into first gear, I take a look to my left mirror as I'm starting to slowly put my truck in motion and there, I fucking see a figure behind my truck peeking to check on me as I got back into my truck. It confirmed that I didn't imagine it. There is someone here at 4am in complete darkness, pitch black, walking here for some reason, just a few meters in front of me. And they could clearly see me because remember I left the headlights on to light up the wall. So I was watching pitch black but they could see me clearly and the engine was running next to me so I couldn't hear if they made little noises when walking around. And this person followed me back to my truck and peeked at me for whatever reason. I got so freaked out and I still am. I'm not delivering to the school for two weeks because it's winter holidays here in France but I'm generally scared to go back there. I might be a 6 foot 3, 230 pound dude, but this is scary as fuck. How could you even hope to defend yourself as someone wants to attack you if they can clearly see you and you can't? So this happened about 15 years ago when I was 18. I used to work in a news agent cafe franchise in a large mall. We got a lot of creeps for some reason, to the point that all of the girls stopped wearing makeup and tried to have the worst hairstyle we could to make us as unappealing as possible. So you can imagine the extent of the issue. I've always looked younger. I had to show my ID to buy alcohol until I was 30, so with no makeup I probably looked about 15. One day, a creepy dad comes in with his son. The dad was over 50, huge, bald, dressed in old leather biker style and his son was about my age and looks like the stereotypical nerd thin tall glasses looking at his feet first the dad asked to buy some bus tickets 
I checked the drawer, which is pretty low, and I had to bend down to look into it. This is important. But I didn't see any, so I asked my coworker to check if there are any in the back. She comes back and says, we're out. So I say, I'm sorry sir, we don't have any tickets at the moment. And here's where the creepiness begun. Oh, that's a shame. Could you maybe look in the drawer again? You look so pretty when you bend over. I'm a bit shocked, but I say, I'm sure, we don't have any left, sir. I can see him looking at our cigarette shelf, which goes all the way up the wall to the ceiling. He makes a smug face and says he wants Marlboros. They are at the very top, and I would have to use a ladder to get to them. But for that very reason, we had a box of cigarettes from the top shelf under the counter. So I make a smug face too, and pour the Marlboros from there. Oh no, I was hoping that you'd go on the ladder so I could have a better look at you. I was trying really hard to tell myself not to say fuck off. Well, I have them here, so no need for the ladder. Shame. Oh, what's that pendant you have there? Well, basically he's shoving his face into my cleavage. I jumped back, of course. I was really uncomfortable at this point. I now know that the easiest way out of it would be to ask my male colleague to take over. But this was my first job, and I didn't know any better. So I didn't say anything, and was just quickly packing his stupid cigarettes so I could get rid of him ASAP. In the meantime, his poor son, visibly embarrassed, pulled his sleeve once every so often, and went, Dad, can we please go? But the dad didn't react to that at all. I mean, total silence. Didn't even look at him. Finally, the cigarettes are packed. I tell him his total, and as he's paying, he goes, what time are you getting off work tonight, honey? With a sleazy smile. The son is completely red in the face and keeps repeating, Dad, let's go, but to no avail. At that moment, something finally clicked in my brain and I remembered an interview with a beauty pageant contestant who said the best way to blow off old creeps is to make them feel, well, old. So I smiled my most beautiful smile and said with a sweet giggly voice, Oh, sir, I think you're even older than my daddy. Well, that did it. He got red, grabbed his son, and literally stormed out, dragging the kid behind him. He even left his cigs, so there's a silver lining there. Because I'm a smoker, and since they were already paid for, and he didn't come back for them, my boss let me take them. Still, it was really creepy, and I'm uncomfortable thinking about it, even after these 15 years. I'm also sorry for the kid. He seemed nice, and I can't imagine the embarrassment I would feel if my dad was hitting on and harassing girls my age. I'm a 20 year old female. I work as a bank teller. I noticed a guy around my age who would come in with an older man. They'd come in and do their banking and would try to have a conversation with me. The vibe that they gave off immediately made me uncomfortable. They looked like sharks circling their prey. They would compliment me on how attractive I was and would say how nice my shirt showed off my breast. I wore business attire, so there was nothing inappropriate in what I was wearing. I tried my best to ignore it and focus on my job. Every time they'd come in, they'd make inappropriate comments to me. One day, I saw them walking from the parking lot towards the door. I quickly told my boss that those were the men that came in and that had been bothering me. She told me to hide in the back area and I quickly obliged. A few of my coworkers waited on some of the other customers. After 10 minutes, one of my coworkers came in to tell me that the guy had brought a pumpkin in for me as a gift. My boss told them that I was on lunch, but he insisted that he would wait to give it to me in person. After a half hour of these men standing in the lobby, some of my coworkers gave me glances of pity from where they were standing. My boss finally told them that I had to leave early and they left the pumpkin with one of my coworkers to give to me. I came out of the vault and three of my coworkers asked me, what was this all about? I filled them in and told them that I refused to wait on those men going forward. They laughed and asked why they were passing out a pumpkin as a gift. I quickly threw the trash and felt very uncomfortable. On another day, I was managing the customers in the lobby all by myself. We were shorthanded and it was during lunchtime. The same guy who gave me the pumpkin walked in. The older guy wasn't with him today. I nervously looked around and didn't see my boss in her office. 
He came to my counter with his creepy smile and asked how I liked the pumpkin. I was very nervous and I'm sure it showed, but he didn't seem to care. I noticed that he was moving his hands rhythmically below his belt while looking very turned on. I could tell he was trying to pleasure himself, but the counter was blocked from my view, thank God. But I remember that there were cameras where he was standing. He suddenly left when another customer walked in. When my boss came back into the office, I told her what happened. The next day, the two men came back in looking for me. I quickly hid and my boss motioned for them to step in her office. I don't know exactly what was said, but they were told not to come back to our branch location or they would experience consequences. I never saw them again. So about 25 years ago, I worked for a company that hired handicapped people to work at various places like recycling centers and so on. I primarily supervised two different crews, one during the week and one on weekends, and they had two people per crew. Most of the people I employed were mentally stunted in some capacity, but were hard workers. The two weekend workers I hardly ever saw, so I'm going to focus on Amanda and Peter. Not their real names, for privacy. Peter is the subject of the story, but Amanda was fascinating in her own right, as she admitted to me after working with her for a while that she never washed her clothes. She literally wore the same matted, dingy outfit every day, all day, and only bathed once a month. All their teeth were blackened, rotten nubs, and the sheer, unadulterated putrid smell that emanated from her body and her mouth was truly vile. I'm not exaggerating by saying that I could not be within a few feet of her for more than a second, and even then I held my breath. She was actually okay to deal with, and other than her extreme lack of any semblance of hygiene, was a good worker and generally amiable. But enough about her. So the first thing you noticed about Peter was that he was large. I am stocky, 6 foot, and wear XL, and Peter made me look like a medium. He also had a metal prosthetic where his right hand used to be. Naturally, being young at the time, I asked Peter what happened to his hand. Not immediately, but after working together a while. He explained that he didn't want to talk about it, but he did tell me that he has schizophrenia and that he took lithium. He was a big teddy bear generally, and unless spoken to, was very quiet. To be honest, he was kind of a sad figure that projected a somber loneliness to him. He told me once about how he was a security guard at an abandoned warehouse at one time and had to quit because he heard some disembodied voices communicating to him from the machine and AC noises. But mostly he was just quiet and gentle when he was around me. If not approached, he could just sit and stare at the wall for hours. And I'm not joking. We tended the grounds of the interstate rest area from late afternoon till evening. I stayed there a couple hours after Amanda and Peter left, and one night, Peter asked if he could stay with me and talk with me. This was almost after a year working together. I told him, sure, but it would have to be off the clock. We ended up sitting out in the company truck in the parking lot. It was about 11pm. We were talking about all random types of things that I no doubt brought up, as he was introverted. He suddenly asked me if I wanted to know what happened to his hand. I tried not to show my excitement, but I had been morbidly curious for months. Tells me that when he was a teenager, that he had got involved with a satanic cult. His words. In retrospect, he is from a small town and a very religious family. They were probably Wiccan or Pagan, or just having a laugh. So after a while, he becomes obsessed that these Satan worshippers had put the mark of the beast on his hand. He could not get the idea out of his head. I should also add at this point, he was not yet diagnosed with schizophrenia and no one knew that he was slowly losing touch with reality. Finally, after a few weeks of obsessing, he goes out to his parents' woodshed and takes a fishing knife and proceeds to cut off his own hand. I asked him what he felt, what was he thinking, what it looked like. He said that he couldn't feel much of it in his near religious psychosis, but remembers when he cut through the tendons and viscera of his wrists that they sprang back up the forearm like a top rope suddenly released of pressure. He said that all he could think over and over was, I'm going to heaven, 
since presumably he had cut off the mark of the beast. Meanwhile, I could only imagine the blood-curling screams probably got the attention of his poor parents. Warner both of them rushed out to see what was wrong. Can you imagine finding your child covered in blood, missing a hand, and ranting about the mark of the beast and revelations? So they grabbed him and rushed him to the nearest hospital. Since this was a very small town, they flew him to a larger town with adequate facilities for such trauma. Before sending him, one of the doctors asked if they had brought the hand so it could be reattached. In their haste and panic, his parents had overlooked it, so someone was sent back for the gruesome task of recovering the hand to send it to the hospital. The officer, or whomever was sent, went back, and the hand was gone. Now, I know what you're thinking. Bullshit. I thought so too, but it makes sense when you think about it. We live out in the middle of the Ozarks. Either a dog, a raccoon, or a coyote could have got it. Who knows how long it took for all this to transpire. In any event, he had surgery to heal the wound and was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. He later got fitted for one of those shoulder cables to open a prosthetic hook. It gave him limited use, but was better than nothing. This was before the cool prosthetics that they have now. I asked him about what would have happened if they reattached the hand, had they have found it. He said at the time, and under the state of mind, he would have cut it off again. There's more to the story, but it's too long as it is. I should also add, I haven't seen Peter in nearly 25 years, but I think about him a lot, and I hope he's doing better. On Tuesday, I had a person come into my job. I worked in women's clothing, and it was a customer I had helped on three other occasions over the last eight months. They said that they were a man with he, him as pronouns, but that his girlfriend liked it when he dressed up in women's clothing. I didn't find anything wrong with this because I enjoyed helping people feel good about themselves. I asked if this was consensual, and he said yes. He enjoyed it too. On this particular day, he came in, this time with a wig and dress on, which again, I found no issues with. In fact, I felt proud of him. He asked for the fitting room once no one else was in the store and asked for my opinion on something he was wearing. I agreed. He opened the fitting room door and was standing there with a blouse on and no pants, but was wearing a pink and white polka dotted diaper. I was shaking and uncomfortable, but maintained my composure and said that the top was cute and turned away. He tried on another outfit and was fully clothed this time and asked if we had anything shorter because his girlfriend likes when he's getting a pedicure and the lady doing his toes can see his diaper. I grew more uncomfortable, but being alone, I didn't say anything other than, oh, that's interesting. He asked if we had any long shirts that can be used as a dress, and I said yes, I went to fetch them. I came back, and one by one he came out with a top with his diaper showing, and even told me the story about him peeing himself at a sex store, and his girlfriend changing his diaper in front of the employees, who were turned on by this. The discomfort grew and grew until I was shaking and texted my coworker to come in early. He comes out of the fitting room in the dress he came in with and turned away and acted like he was on the phone, but I noticed it was a calculator instead. I stood there trying to calm down and everything when he comes back and says that his girlfriend gave him a task of taking a photo with me in his bra and diaper. I declined and said I wasn't okay with that. He said that it was okay, but that he was going to get a spanking from her later. He left shortly after, thanking me for my help, but not purchasing anything, which was a first. I brushed the experience off as a weird occurrence and went about my day thinking that I wouldn't see him again for a few months. I went home later that day and my coworker texted me saying that he was back doing the same thing to her and that he left again without making a purchase. The next day, I asked my coworker to come in early, so I wasn't there alone, and she did. He came in again, and I went to the back because I was about to have a panic attack. I felt sexually harassed simply just looking at him and picturing the look he had when he was staring at me in his diaper. I overheard him asking my coworkers my name and when I would be working again. She didn't give him either, and he left again, making a purchase on the blouse he had tried on the day before. 
My coworker told me he identifies as she, which threw me off since it contradicted what he had told me the day before. At this point, I filed a report with the police. An officer comes to talk to me and I tell him everything. The next day, I was off work and I get a call from my coworker saying that he drove by looking into the store and when my coworker caught him staring, he drove away. I went to the police station since I had to drop off my statement and informed them on what happened. The next day, I opened the store and had to go by the bank. When I was driving to the bank, I noticed this truck outside of an auto parts store. I called the investigator and told him about this and he got the tag number and noticed he had a sticker from a local campsite that expires Monday. It's February. Who the fuck is camping in February by a lake? All in all, I feel good knowing more about him than he knows about me. I know his name, where he works, and that he's got a campsite until Monday. I didn't see him yesterday or today, and I'm hoping that he got the message that he scared the fuck out of me. I'll keep you updated as this goes on. Edit. For context, I'm a 25-year-old female. I'm 5'2". The man from this post is about 6'5", 350 pounds, late 30s, mid 40s. Hopefully this will help shed some light on why I was worried to call this person out on their shit while I was alone. Update. He came in today while I was working and the cops were called. He has been banned from the store and if he comes back, he'll be arrested. If anything else happens, I'll be sure to post it here. About a month ago, I started working at a nursing home near where I live. I gotta say, it's not a bad job if strong smells and putrid sights don't bother you. The residents here are usually sweet and lovable, although there is rude, grumpy people here as well. Who can really blame them though? They don't have many years left and many of them don't get visitors anymore. It fulfills me to talk with them and give them someone to talk to since their families are no longer around. All was going well here with the job until they put me on the dementia wing. I've always known that I would have to work in this wing. They bounced me around floors, pretty much wherever they need me. At first, it was just another normal day, putting together my carts and cleaning the floors. However, after I came back from my 15 minute break, I started getting very unsettled. I'm not sure what caused this trigger, but if I had to guess, it was because I was too tired to really take in how creepy this side of the facility was. The rooms are strewn about, almost randomly, as if they are trying to pack as many people in here as possible. The residents here are often gray and gloomy, missing hair and teeth. I walked along the crowded halls, cleaning room by room, really taking in these people's lives and trying to piece together some story. What unnerved me more was the rooms without a lot of possessions, as if someone simply said, They're so far from gone, why would they need a lot of stuff? Broken clocks that no longer worked, or were set at a very wrong time, as if to really pound in my head that most of these men and women have no concept of time anymore. The overhead lights were drone on, the rectangular boxes that house a reminder of the back rooms in a vague sense. This reminder was greatly heightened in the residents' bathrooms, where the buzzing was harsher, louder, more vivid. I turned off I don't know how many lights in those bathrooms to ease myself a bit. The walls were a pinkish tan color. For some reason, the color seemed to fit perfectly with the unsettling atmosphere. The staff was even creepy in a sense. The way they weren't put off by it, but seemed joyful, made me feel more out of place here. I wanted to go home this day. I'm not a weak-minded person by any means, but something about the atmosphere was making me incredibly uncomfortable, like I was a ghost walking through these halls. Now, there's only about 10 to 15 rooms left. I pulled my car into the big open alcove in the hallway where most of the residents were sitting in wheelchairs, as none of them had the strength to walk anymore. They were staring mindlessly at the TV playing cute videos of animals, assumingly to put the residents at ease. However, this one thing that made me feel comfort quickly turned to dread. Their eyes, they looked at me with such sorrow, as if to say help me, without saying anything at all. I'm not really sure how many of them could actually speak. Some of them would look at me and ask me, where am I? 
and I'm at a loss as I don't know how to answer in a way that they would understand. Then, the screaming, the cries for help, the yelling for anyone to comfort them, yelling out blood-curdling screams when the nurses would remotely touch them in any way. I just have to watch as I'm just a janitor who cleans their rooms. No, their homes. I'm not allowed to touch the patient. No way to give them comfort other than words when they can barely hear, let alone process what I'm saying. This wing is so unnerving and sad. While listening and watching, all this does is remind me of a piece of art known as Everywhere at the End of Time. And I feel as if this experience is only more unnerving, having prior knowledge of this sad piece of art the worst part of all, this could easily be any one of us when we get old, not knowing what is real and what isn't, and crying out for loved ones who aren't there and will never come. At work on Monday, a guy came up to me asking if we had coupons. He was all leaned on the counter, asking me how my day was, asking if I worked third shift, and calling me beautiful. Then, literally today, I'm scrolling on Facebook and I see a picture of him, and the thing that said that he murdered his grandma, I'm pretty sure it was a few days ago, because it said the police went to do a welfare check this morning, so it makes me think that no one had heard from her for a little while. I'm stunned. So, I work the overnight shift at a hotel. We get some weirdos every now and then, but it's usually nothing more than the typical drunk asshats come from a nearby club looking if there's any available rooms. Around 1am, this very normal looking woman comes in and is taking a long while in the lobby before coming to the desk to check in. I look up a reservation and try to run her card, but it keeps declining. She responds by saying just check her in anyways and that she'll figure it out later. Obviously, I can't do that, to which she tells me to get a manager. I get my manager, who explains the same thing, and this lady switches up her entire demeanor instantly and starts acting fucking crazy. What follows was honestly more comical to me than creepy, but she starts speaking in third person, claiming that her vessel is being used by a demon and that if we didn't treat her with more respect, she would curse our entire lives. My manager says something along the lines of, Cool, but we still need a credit card. And then this woman starts mixing up all types of lore and terminologies from popular witch media, calling us muggles and listing off the curses that she would be putting on us and that it would be for a thousand years minimum. She also kept saying that she used to work for Teen Vogue magazine. Anyways, eventually security came to escort her out, but the whole thing was weird as hell. Cracks me up, but also creeps me out. I am a dog walker for a small but busy company. I have one client in somewhat of a nicer neighborhood that I go to twice a week in the mornings. Like most people who use dog walkers, they use a lockbox. They decided to keep theirs behind a vase next to their apartment door. It was already a busy Monday for me and I was in a bit of a rush. I was hoping to get Maya, their Bernadoodle puppy, by 945 so I could stay on track for the day. After finding parking, which is usually hell, I made my way up the apartment to the door. I wrapped my hands around the vase, intending to grab the lockbox. Nothing. I wasn't alarmed at first. Sometimes the owner forgets to put out the lockbox. Not super common, but it happens. I look around for a bit, but have no luck, so I text the owner. I'll call her Kay for her privacy. Usually when I do text her, I get no response since she's so busy. But I text her anyways, asking her where the lockbox could possibly be, since it's not in the usual spot. About 5 minutes pass without a response, and I'm honestly getting a bit irritated. I already have a busy day driving all around the city, and now I'm going to be running behind. So I start knocking. There's a chance that her husband would be home. Sometimes he is. I knock about 3 separate times until I hear some shuffling upstairs. So someone is home. It takes a bit of time, but I hear someone making their way down the stairs. The door opens. It's not Kay, nor her husband. A man stands in front of me. He's only wearing a white towel that's barely hanging off his hips. He's holding Maya in his arms, and he's extremely caught off guard. 
I'm confused and also caught off guard, but I'm not quite horrified. Maybe they're having a visitor stay with them, or maybe someone was having an affair. Maybe that's why the lockbox was absent. Hey, I'm here to take Mia for her walk. He lets her run out into the hallway and hands the leash and collar over, which are always on the staircase railing. I ask him to please give me the lockbox to keep outside since I need to get back inside and he gives it to me. We head out for the walk and I'm a bit flabbergasted. Did I just walk in on an affair? Was he a visitor? It wasn't too out of the ordinary. Sometimes clients forget to mention they have guests. Then during my walk I get a message from my manager. Do you have Maya? Then she calls. I pick up and let her know that I have Maya and we're on the walk. She says she just got a weird message from Kay, the owner. She had stated that a man had came by earlier, saying that he was the new dog walker and needed their lockbox code. I guess her husband gave him the code. I then told her about the man in the towel when I got to the apartment and how the lockbox was gone. Told her that I wasn't sure if I had walked in on something or if he was a guest. Well, he wasn't a secret lover or a guest. He was not supposed to be there. Police were called immediately. I was told to absolutely not go back into the home. I called Kay's husband and as he was on his way back over, Kay was en route from work. The husband tells me that he feels so stupid for telling the man the code and believing him, but that he was in a rush out the door and didn't assume anything bad. I continue walking down the street, quite a busy major street, and then I spot a familiar man across the street. He runs across the street towards me, holding a beer in his hand. Hi doggy, hi doggy, he goes. It was the same man from inside the apartment, and then he just ran back across the street. I immediately turned in the other direction, into one of the side streets, and called Kay's husband. He was near in the neighborhood, and tells me he just saw a man matching the description. Once Kay and her husband arrived, we went upstairs to scope out the apartment, expecting something to be missing. Nothing. Everything was perfectly in place, untouched. The only thing different was some dirty water in the shower that had just been used. I was so happy that no one was hurt, but how did he know that they had a dog walker? I work part-time at a grocery store, and I usually work the closing shift. About 30 minutes to close, a lady comes to my register. She's polite, friendly, and seemed very normal. She pays for her groceries, and I hand her the receipt. She leaves. Seemed normal to me. About 10 minutes after we close, I'm headed to my bike, but she stopped me before I could leave the store. She claimed that she had left her phone inside, and that she needed to get it. She hadn't left her phone. It would have been at the register, and I had thoroughly cleaned it, as well as the surrounding area before I clocked out. But I offered to go in and check anyways, because maybe it had been dropped on the floor. I wanted to get home, and luckily, my manager offers to call her phone, so I headed back to my bike to get going. The moment I take the lock off my bike, she drives over to me, making small talk. It's a bit weird, seeing that I'm clearly trying to get home, and she doesn't know me at all. She tells me that I have a cool bike, asking me where I got it. I explained to her that it's electric and I had got it from Amazon. She tells me that she didn't know that they made electric bikes, but then tells me a few minutes later about how she's been looking to get an electric bike for a while now. She asked to take a picture of my bike and then suddenly asked me why I was still wearing my mask, going on about how it could give me sinus problems. I declined to take it off since she's taken a photo, which I noticed the camera is aimed more so at me than my bike, even though I stepped away so she could get a better view of the bike itself. Unknown to me, my manager and another worker were watching the whole interaction, and after this woman finally left, they went over to me and asked if I was okay. I didn't really think much of it, telling them that it was fine and that she just wanted to know about my bike. I headed home, but on my way I thought a little bit more about the interaction. She came back to the store claiming she lost her phone, but had it on her the whole time. She took a picture with it. She kept repeating my name in our conversation as often as she could, almost like she was trying to memorize it. She took a photo of me, as well as my mode of transportation, all while trying to get me to take off my mask right before taking it, as if to be able to see my entire face. Sort of creepy. 
Even weirder was when I turned back to the store to see if she was still there. I saw a police car, which, after leaving the parking lot, turned its sirens on and sped off in the direction the lady left in. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but this interaction just seemed really strange. Anyway, let me know if I'm overthinking things, or if you'd be creeped out too. I'm a female. When this happened, I was 19 years old. I was going to a local community college, but I was working part-time at a local bakery to make some extra cash. I still lived with my parents. I worked for a nice family-owned bakery. I was a cashier. They hired professional cooks to do the rest. The layout of the bakery was like this. Front side, where the customers came in and chose what they wanted and paid. This is where I mostly worked. In the middle of the building is where the orders are taken and where the breads and cakes were packaged and boxed. The back of the store was mostly storage. All flours, sugars, and ovens were stored back there. There was a crew of about eight guys that worked in the back after the cooks left for the day. They mostly cleaned the equipment and almost never came up front. There was this guy around my age who obviously liked me. However, he didn't speak English, so we never spoke. I'll call him Rob. If I had to go in the back, he'd always wink or blow kisses at me. I mostly ignored him as I wasn't interested. Rob must have let the other crew members know that he was interested because every time I would go back there, one of the other guys would whistle and Rob would come out from wherever he was and stare adoringly at me. I didn't feel threatened yet, but it was getting annoying. I didn't tell my boss because I was embarrassed. They hired an extra person back there. Let's call him H. H heard that Rob liked me, so he decided to like me too. Soon, H was flirting, but was more aggressive than the other one. They were clearly competing against one another. I had to go back to retrieve some boxes, and H put his hand on me, told me I was his girlfriend. I was too afraid to tell him to leave me alone. I was leaving for the day, and both these guys were in their own cars, parked next to me. They are waiting for me to leave. I get in my car and H opens my passenger door and hops in. He tells me, you're driving me to my house. I was way different than I am now, 25 years later. Now, I would have told him to leave, but back then, I was scared and I always felt as if I couldn't defend myself. He grabbed my hand and kept calling me his girlfriend. I drove him and I dropped him off, which was close by. All the while, the car with this Rob guy and five other of the crew members were tailgating me all the way there. I could literally hear them keep yelling, bitch and slut in their native language at me. Because how dare I do this to Rob, even though I never said or hinted that I ever liked these guys. Another time, when I tried to leave work, Rob and those same five men tried to follow me home. I made a bunch of turns and ended up losing them. That's when I knew I couldn't take this anymore. I found a new job and put in my two weeks notice. Other than my boss, I told no one else I was quitting. On my last day, I had to go to the back room to get some supplies. H walked up to me and said, You're taking me home again. I'll see you outside at four. I look over and see Rob looking at me angrily and he called me a slut again. This is when I knew this was about to get a lot worse. It was bad enough that the other workers tried to keep tabs on me. One of them stole my number from the boss's office. Thankfully, they didn't find my address. My plan was I was going to clock out right at 4 and then hopefully get out of there without him catching me. I got my coat that I kept in the front of the store, which was usually kept in the back. I did this so I didn't have to go back there. Right at 4, I went to the office section and clocked out. There was no one back there. I got into the parking lot with nobody in sight and drove out of there. Later that night, H called my phone, asking for me. My mom told him that I was moving out, so he shouldn't call back. I'm glad that stopped it. I had to go back to the bakery a week later to get my paycheck. This was before automatic deposits, where your check goes right into your bank account. One of the friends of Rob was working and saw me. He looked at me as if I committed murder or something. I'm real glad I left that job when I did. The situation was going to get worse. I would have definitely handled this differently if this happened now.
I'm a 20 year old female. I was working at a retail store and needed to use a bathroom. As I entered the employee's bathroom, I noticed that someone else was in there, hiding in the corner behind the door. I was immediately shocked and scared and didn't know what to do. I tried to leave the bathroom, but the person grabbed me and pulled me back inside. They were a customer who had snuck into the employee's bathroom to corner me and I could tell that they had ill intentions. I struggled to break free from their grip, but he was way stronger than me. I screamed for help, but no one could hear me over the noise of the store. I honestly thought I was going to die, but just as the person was about to do something to me, a co-worker walked into the bathroom and scared him off. I was shaken and scared, but I was grateful to get away unscathed. I never thought something like that would happen, and it taught me to always be aware of my surroundings, even in a seemingly safe place as an employee's bathroom. So when I was in high school, I worked at Walmart. There were a few in my town that I grew up in, but this one was by far the biggest. It was also generally the easiest to get to because several huge roads ran right by it. Because of that, working as a cashier, you saw all sorts of people at all stages in their lives. Most people were nice enough, but every now and then, you'd get someone that just made you wonder about them. I was working later than I normally did one night because the weather channel was calling for snow late that night and school had been canceled. I didn't mind. I could use the hours. It was slow though because the normal pre-snowstorm rush had already been through and people were just holed up in their house waiting for the storm. I was on one of the express lane registers and finally had a customer come up. He only had a few things but the first red flag was the way he put them on the counter. Normally, when you only have a few things, you just set them up all at once, right? He held them out to me individually and would make sure that his fingers touched mine when I took them from him. I rang up his few things and bagged them. I told him the total and he handed me the payment all in ones and change, which means I had to count it, so it took a minute or two longer than a credit card transaction might have. In that time, he was trying to make conversation about how he was just at a club with all the ones he had and the amount of meth it looked like he consumed on a daily basis, I can imagine what club it was. He told me that all the girls had turned him down, so now he was just going to go home all alone and eat a sandwich of his own. I made some sort of sympathetic noise, finished counting and tried to give him his change and receipt. He made no move to get them from me and instead kept on talking about how they would taste so much better with someone else. Getting nervous, I made some comment about being underage because of the way he was looking at me and I was pretty sure he was referencing me. Then he leaned across the register, ran his tongue across his nasty teeth and said, Well honey, that don't matter unless someone tells. For a second, I stood there in shock, then set his stuff down on the belt, turned my light out and walked away to find my manager. I was lucky to have the mama bear one on that shift that night. So I knew she would take my side when she found out what happened. So to the meth mouth guy that insinuated that he was fine with taking a minor home, let's not meet again. So a few years ago, I used to work at a petrol station as part of a supermarket. It was on Christmas Eve, just working a, I'd say not so bad late shift. With about an hour and a half left on my shift, this drunk guy enters to buy some food. I served him, and I'll admit, since it was Christmas Eve, thought I looked the part as I was wearing a full face of makeup, mainly to save time after my shift as I was going out afterwards. The drunk guy just stared at me in silence after I rang him up, and I'm just staring back at him and say, You all good now? You okay there? And he says something with a speech all slurred. Fucking hell, you, you're beautiful. Like, you got really nice eyes. Sexy eyes. I just respond with, um, thanks. Then he says, are you single? Are you? Please tell me you're single. I have a fiance now, and I've had more than a few encounters before. And what I've learned when I tell most of the people I have a boyfriend, either in honesty or just in defense sometimes, they don't give up and carry on badly flirting because when I told him, I'm not single, 
He quickly responded, I bet your boyfriend doesn't even realize how beautiful you are. I can treat you better than him. My male colleague suddenly sensed that I was starting to get uncomfortable, but I looked at him and said, let me handle this. So I found a new way of shutting him down, which had worked for me 9 times out of 10 in situations like these, but only in this time it didn't. So I said, Sir, my wife always notices my good looks. Yes, I tell him in other words, I'm a lesbian. The guy just stays silent in defeat while he was, which I'm guessing, soothing that burn. I carried on filling a shelf. I had bent over to pick up an empty box on the floor, and just as I did, the guy came from behind me, and I shit you not, he slaps my ass and shouts, I bet I can convert ya. Hearing that enraged me. Without a thought, I turned around and threw my fist into his face. I basically punched him, but it hit his cheek, and at that moment, my male colleague hopped over from behind the counter, grabbed the man who I sucker punched, and threw him out of the shop screaming, You'll get worse from me if you ever come back here. I told my boss what happened and thankfully, I didn't get in trouble for it as she agreed he deserved it. A year later, same sort of shift, I was working with a young girl who was new to the job. She served customers while I was filling the shelves trying to make room in the back for a delivery. I come out of the stock room only to notice the same guy has returned and of course, he's drunk again. I forgot to mention, this guy was probably old enough to be my dad. I stayed hidden in the back, hoping that my colleague would serve him, and hoped that he would just leave. But I noticed he kept saying to my colleague, Hi beautiful, how are you beautiful? All oh, thanks beautiful. But of course, he didn't leave. But I noticed he was trying to reach over the desk and touch her, while my colleague was pressing her back against the wall, trying to keep her distance, but trying to maintain the customer service character. I could clearly see that she was terrified, so I had to rescue her. I burst out the back and get behind the desk, stand in front of her, pointing her to go into the staff's kitchen to get away from him. Then I turned to the man and told him, Listen mate, you need to leave now. The guy laughs and says, I'm not doing no harm babe, I'm just chatting with her. I had to cut him off and reaching over to touch her. That's not okay, the girl is just trying to do her job. We are paid to fill the shelves and be nice to people. Get it through your head that just because a 20 something cashier is smiling at you and being nice doesn't automatically mean she wants to fuck your brains out. Then he started to get cocky. Oh, I remember you. You're the lesbian with a nice ass. This guy was super lucky that there was a counter between us and to add to that, he was also lucky that there was nothing in my hand to throw at him. I held up my fist in response. Yeah, I'm the lesbian who fed you this fist. Unless you want to turn the other cheek, I suggest you fuck off and consider yourself banned. He left the store with his tail between his legs. The funny part after this was there was a customer behind him and the customer's jaw dropped after overhearing the whole thing. But he had time to hear the whole story. And I also explained to my colleague that I basically told the creep that I was a lesbian in hopes that he would back off, but he didn't. So I punched him in the face. To give a little context, I used to work in an apartment complex. As a result, I've had my fair share of creepy encounters. Most residents keep to themselves and don't cause issues. Probably about 95%, but the other 5% took up almost all of my time. Isaac was one of the 5%. When he first rented his apartment, he definitely had stoner vibes, but he was nice enough and passed his background check. Almost immediately, however, he started causing issues. The lady next door complained she could smell his smoke constantly. The guy downstairs complained he could hear his stereo all hours of the day and night. Another resident accused him of following him home one night. The police were regularly there to break up fights between him and his girlfriends. We caught him hiding two large dogs in his apartment and he regularly let them run loose, which ultimately resulted in another dog and two people getting attacked. He accidentally discharged a gun in his apartment once. Needless to say, he caused a lot of issues. At first, he was apologetic and said that he would make an effort to remedy the problems. But 
things kept getting worse, and after a year of weekly calls or notices from the office, he eventually became standoffish. One morning, I received a call from Isaac letting me know he'd broken up with one of his girls and she wouldn't leave the apartment. He asked me to personally come up and remove her. I'm a small woman, so even if I wanted to take the risk, I physically wouldn't be capable of wrestling an angry woman out of his apartment. I suggested that he call the police. He then asked if I could make a maintenance man come up to remove her. I offered to call the police on his behalf, but Isaac said that he didn't want to involve them and hung up. A few hours later, Isaac came down to the office with a jump drive and said that he needed to print out a 50 page plus document. Residents weren't technically allowed to use our office printer, but on the rare occasion someone asked to, I usually didn't say no. It was a good way to build good rapport. But between Isaac becoming such a problem tenant and how large his document was, I told him that I couldn't print his document. I gave the excuse that our paper, toner, and printer history was monitored and we would get in trouble for printing such a large document out for him. Not liking my answer, he started screaming about how it was bullshit. He accused me of being useless, bringing up my refusal to fight his ex, and power tripping. He called me a fucking bitch multiple times and he said someone needed to bring me down a peg. I was pretty over him at this point and told him that if he was going to behave like a child that he needed to leave. He told me I couldn't make him. Bluntly, I told him he would leave or I would call the police and have him removed. I also told him I would ban him from the office going forward. Normally, I tried to kill the residents with kindness, but his lease was ending in a week and I didn't care anymore if he hated me. My threat seemed to work. He angrily knocked my pen holder over and then slammed both doors as he left. The following morning, a cop was waiting for me when I got to work. He asked if Isaac was a resident and I confirmed he was. The officer explained that a body of a teen had been discovered the day before and Isaac was their primary suspect. He was the last person to text the kid asking him to meet where his body was found shortly after the message. The police believed Isaac had been paid to kill him. Based on the timing of the text and when the boy was discovered, Isaac would have had to left my office and gone directly there. Ultimately, the police wanted to use Isaac's move out date as an opportunity to try and catch him. To nobody's surprise, he didn't show up. When I walked into his apartment to inspect for damage, there was a lot. I found a bank receipt from the day of the murder. Someone had wired him $17,000. I thankfully never saw Isaac again. He was caught in another country a few months later and is now in prison. I'm a female, so when I was 15 I worked at a pizza place. One thing about me is I'm 5'1 and I look like I'm 12. Today a guy came in, about 50 years old, and he made me extremely uncomfortable. I walked up to the counter to take his order as I was the only one available to do it at the time. And he looked at me and said, today is half price day, right? I kind of smiled and didn't say anything because it wasn't funny. I'm literally just there to take his order. He kind of laughed it off and said, I should grin more. He repeated the word grin instead of smile, which I found kind of odd. He finally told me what he wanted, and as I was writing it down, I'm pretty sure that's when he told another joke. I honestly don't fully remember what happened because I was so uncomfortable, and I think I tried to block it out of my memory. I didn't laugh or smile at his joke because I'm already slightly uncomfortable from the comment he made about me grinning. He's like, what, do you not grin? Do you ever grin? At this point, I was ignoring him. I finished ringing him up and walked away and I started taking the order of whoever the hell he was with. The manager happened to be walking by as he started walking away. He looked at her and said, do y'all have a policy against grinning? And she kind of laughed and said no. I feel like more than that happened to make me feel as uncomfortable as I was, but like I said before, I don't fully remember the encounter. I'm going to talk to my best friend about it tomorrow. She was there and saw the whole thing. She told me that as I was ringing up the next people, after the man and his friends walked away, all three of them turned around to check me out. 
A few minutes later, my manager told me that he used to come in all the time and tip the youngest girl that worked there and that he's super creepy. After that, I walked away and started talking with my friend. I was literally about to cry being so uncomfortable and I just wanted out of this situation. My manager told me I wasn't allowed to take his food out to him when it was done because of the way he is. I'm a female and this happened when I was 16. I was working at an old folks home as a dining room server. My job was to basically take orders, bring them back, give them to the chefs, clean, etc. I'm 5 foot 95 pounds, a very small person. I look like I'm 18 with my hair up. So there was a couple, I call them Fran and Joe. They were very talkative which was great and all. But I'm working, I don't have time to discuss what the activities are tomorrow. I was never rude or anything, just polite. My coworker, 17 female, got harassed by them first. They started off by asking if she was at least 19. Then they moved into, please spin around, which she did. And then Fran said, we've decided you're pretty. So the encounter started with me like a week later. I was squatting down to retrieve yogurt from a fridge. I stand up and look where they're sitting at the bar and Joe is slowly licking his ice cream off his lips as he stares at my ass. Uncomfortable, but he has dementia, so I'll let it go this once. Three days later, Fran called me beautiful and then a day later, she grabbed my arm. Dinner service was busy that Monday. We were trying some new stuff out. That totally failed but I had taken their order, put it in, while Fran weighed me down, and Joe watched and grabbed my arm, tightly I might add. She asked me if I had put their order in yet, and I told her yes, the chefs are working on it now. She runs her hand up and down my arm and whispers, good girl. The next day I was taking a delivery service to a sick resident and came down. When the elevator opened up, Joe was standing there, we were perfectly positioned to switch spots, but instead he stepped in front of me and grinned. I moved to the side and he did too. Once, twice, and then I just slipped past. Now I brought my boss into it. He basically brushed it off, blamed their mental states, and told me to just leave it be. Well, I did until my last day of work. I didn't know it was my last day until the last incident. We had a party and us servers were outside. I lowered my mask for a quick second and Joe nudged Fran. He whispered something in her ear and she pulled out her phone and came over. She didn't give me or my coworker any time to deny a picture. With all their creepy encounters, I just gave up, talked to my supervisor and quit. Meanwhile, they've done this to almost all the staff and some residents there have been caught watching porn and doing stuff. So that was my over the summer creepy encounters that led up to me quitting a really fun, well paying job. I'm not sure how to start this story, so I'm just gonna go ahead with it. My boyfriend, 20, and I, female 21, live alone and both work weird hours. He leaves for work around 10.30 p.m. and I leave around 4 a.m. It's starting to get cold outside, and I drive a 30-year-old Honda, so it takes a while to warm up. One morning, I went outside around 3.45 a.m. to start my car, so it would be warmed up by the time I was leaving for work. I went outside to start my car. There was nobody outside, and no other cars that I could see, besides the only ones parked in my neighbor's driveway. There was not a car parked in front of my house. Then at 4 a.m., it was time for me to leave. I got all my stuff ready and I was walking in my car. As I'm walking, I hear this man yell, Hey! I ignored it because obviously it's 4am, dark outside, and I'm a female. But I noticed his car is parked directly in front of my house, which is honestly weird to me by itself. So then again he yelled, Hey! But it was a bit louder this time. I still refused to even look in that direction and pretended I didn't hear him. He yelled over and over again, Hey, can I get a jump? Asking him for me to jump start his car. He kept getting louder each time and seemed like he was starting to get frustrated. 
At this point, all I was thinking was that this guy wasn't out about 15 minutes ago. How did he suddenly pull up and his car conveniently die right in front of my house, all within those 15 minutes? So anyway, I continued to pretend I don't hear him, got in my car and immediately locked the doors and left. As I was driving away, I kept my eyes on the mirrors, and when I got about a block and a half away, I saw his car start up, and he drove away perfectly fine. It didn't look like he needed a jump at all. So why was he asking me for a jump if his car could just start up fine? What would have happened if I actually tried to help? I could be overreacting, but the whole situation seems suspicious. My grandmother always says that a man would never ask a woman for help, especially with a car. And my boyfriend said that one time he wouldn't approach a female at night just for the simple fact of making them uncomfortable. I told him what happened and he said it was weird as well. I don't know if it could have been a trafficking tactic, kidnapping, or what, but it definitely was strange. One of my friends joked that someone could be watching my house. And I guess that they were trying to be funny and lighten the mood, but it's definitely kind of scary when you have an experience like that. Especially because if someone was watching my house, they would know that I was completely alone for a few hours that night. Any thoughts? Still trying to wrap my head around this and figure out if I'm overreacting or not. This was just a few nights ago and honestly, I've been kind of scared about going out to my car or just being alone in general at night since. in a small memory care about five years ago and there were only two of us on staff on the evening shift. We had an agency CNA come in to work with me and it was our first time working together and meeting. This girl was young, 17 years old, and we began talking while we were working and she told me that she needed to go out to her car real quick. She goes and comes back and tells me about her boyfriend and how they were arguing over text. She told me that he was waiting in her car until she got out of work, which was an eight-hour shift. Alarms were going off, and I was thinking to myself how weird it was, and I was going to go outside and tell him to leave. But still, a small voice told me not to, and I listened. Our shift goes on, and we are continuing to talk, and she was telling me how her mom doesn't want her to hang out with him anymore due to the situation that happened. The backstory is that they got into an argument in her basement and he went upstairs and grabbed a knife and her stepdad caught him and asked the boyfriend what he was going to do with the knife and he said that he is going to hurt himself. She told me the story and I had this pit in my stomach and I looked at her and said he wasn't going to hurt himself and he was going to hurt you and you needed to get away from him. At the very end of our shift, we had a long talk and I told her that she's too young to be going through this and that there are a lot of other people out there and she doesn't need to be involved with somebody like that and I told her the next time I see you I don't want to see you on the news dead. The young girl left and before she left she told me that her mom was working for the same agency and would be coming in to work for the night shift. The young girl went on her way and her mom came in and I told her mom that she was still hanging out with that guy. The mom forbid her from seeing him and I could see why so I thought as a mother myself I would want to know if it was my daughter. The mom was really thankful and gave me a big hug and I went on my way. I started working at this agency myself and seen the young girl's stepsister who also worked at the agency at the facility I went to. I got really excited to see her stepsister and asked how the young girl was doing since she referred me to this job. With a straight face, she told me that she was murdered. The boyfriend shot and murdered her a few weeks after I had seen her at my job. I feel absolutely sick this happened to her and what the messed up part is, it's all over the news and that's one of the last things I told her was I don't want to see you on the news dead because of this guy. It really, really messed me up to the point of where I had to go to therapy afterwards. I'm glad I listened to my gut instincts because he could have easily hurt me if I went outside to tell him to leave when he was waiting in her car. A few years ago, I was working at a pizza chain in my hometown as a driver. I was 27, but made darn good money delivering. I had worked at a few other places, both local and both chains in the years before, and still work as a dasher on occasion, even after this happened. Now I can choose to deliver in much safer areas for this reason. 
I got luckier than I could even imagine. One night I was working and had a double, two deliveries to take. Both were cash orders. I had $12 left in my bank. The first order went smoothly. The guy gave me a 50 for a $35 order, so I was excited about the nice tip. I drove to the second delivery. It was an apartment complex with multiple buildings I had delivered there before. The sun was about to set, but it was still very light out. The chain I worked at had us drive company cars with a logo on it, white sedans. This is important. I grab the order and go to the door of the apartment building. A young guy comes out and a much bigger older guy was outside smoking a cigarette. The big guy went inside as the smaller guy came out. He looked around nervously and asked how much he owed me. The way that he was looking around just made me very nervous. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I told him the amount and he said that that wasn't what they told him on the phone. Something was very wrong. I felt someone else walk out from behind me from the door as the first young guy looked around down the parking lot craning his neck as if he was looking for someone. I told him the amount again and broke down the order trying to keep him calm. Then the first guy held a gun at my right temple. I also felt a poke in my spine. Two gunmen. I couldn't speak. Words wouldn't form no matter how hard I tried. Give me your money and keys now. The first guy growled and I fumbled immediately for my keys. I gave him my bank card but I hadn't realized that the 50 was mixed in. I gave him the keys trying my best to remain calm. Another guy came up from the left. He had poofy hair and was around the same age as the first kid. The big hair kid grabbed the pizza bag and ran off and hid. The first kid searched the company car. Luckily I left my wallet in my personal car. I saw him grab my cell phone. That's when the panic began to set in. I had pictures on the phone that I hadn't backed up of my five year old son who is absolutely my world. Please, please don't take that. I have pictures of my son who died on there. It's all I have of him, please. I lied. My son is very much alive. The kid behind me spoke softly. Trust me, just listen to him. You'll get it back undamaged. I don't want to be here either. I could tell that he had been crying by how his voice sounded. A car began pulling in and the three boys took off to the other end of the complex in full sprint. Before the one behind me ran, he dropped the gun right in front of me. Standard issue 9mm silver and black. Safety off. Looked completely real to me. He picked it back up and ran with the others. The car that pulled in saw me. It was a woman and her kid. Panic set in as I realized they could easily come back and do way worse to me as the sky started to get dark. I collapsed. They had taken my company car's keys, $72, the pizza, and my phone. The woman ran up to me and asked me if I was alright. She took me into her apartment in the next building over and locked the door. I was shaking so hard I couldn't even hold her phone up to talk to 911. As she set down her kid, her boyfriend I assume, helped me call. I spoke to the operator and told her everything. I'm colorblind but these guys were obviously wearing all black and white clothes, thank god. I had a full description of two of them. The poor woman who helped me was going to be late to work, but she stayed until I was off the phone and the cops had shown up. Man, she was harsh and blunt with the operator, but I'll never forget this woman's utter kindness to me and her boyfriend's. Cops showed up and contacted my store and my manager brought out the spare key for me to drive the car back to the store. After dealing with the cops, I drove back and was greeted by crying and beyond worried co-workers. All of them were terrified that I was hurt. It meant a lot to me about how much they cared, but I told them that I was fine. I filed the proper paperwork and the $72 was written off as a loss to the store. Thank God, because I had worked at other stores that would make you pay back the money out of pocket, even if you were robbed to prevent the drivers from stealing. I was told by the owner to take the rest of the night off and take care of myself. He gave me a hug. He was to this day one of the best bosses I've ever had. What I didn't know was I was in for a very long night. I called my best friend before I left the store from the store phone and asked where he was. 
we usually met up for drinks after work. He was around the corner at a bar, so I met up with him. His dad was a District 4 cop in my city at the time, the same district that this happened in. He told me that his dad had given him the heads up and he had two shots waiting for me to calm my nerves. After the two shots, we began playing pool when his dad called his phone and asked if I had met him yet. He said yeah and handed the phone to me. His dad asked if I could come to the station. I was honest and told him that I had two shots, so he sent a squad car to get me since it wasn't too far away. We get to the station. They had the suspects in custody and I was needed to ID them. Three boys and the driver. They had been caught less than 20 minutes after robbing me while speeding. The bolo had already gone out and they matched the description. They'd used the money to buy weed and gas and had taken off. They had at least 15 stolen cell phones on them. The order had been placed on one of the stolen phones. My phone was in the mix, in the box. The police told me to grab my phone only and I did. They asked me to unlock it. It had fingerprint verification, so it was easy. 9 out of 10 tries to unlock it had already been used before my phone would have completely reset. It was unlocked. I told the police every detail yet again, although my parental instincts kicked in. I told them that the guy behind me obviously was bullied into this and to show mercy. He was the one with the white shirt. The police went wide-eyed and told me he was the one talking. The other three denied involvement. That's when I found out about the fourth guy, the driver. We found out later that he was completely unaware of the robbery and was just picking up his friends. He was never charged. The boy who was behind me and the one that grabbed the pizza were 15 and 16 and both got six months of house arrest. The only reason the one behind me got off easy, despite having a gun to my back, was because I asked them to go easy on him. That he seemed like a good kid who didn't want to be there, and he was the only one confessing. Makes sense, since he said the other guy wouldn't have my phone for long. He was planning on going to the cops had they not been caught. But the other guy, the first kid who put the gun in my temple, it was his 18th birthday. He got the book thrown at him. In the courtroom, he made fun of me and was laughing at me. Seeing him made me panic. The judge scolded him over his behavior and he just grinned and glared at me with a joker-like grin. All I could see was pure evil. This kid will commit more crimes and I have no doubt that he will eventually take someone's life. You could see how cold he was just looking in his eyes. I grew up in a town full of murderers and abusers. I have never seen that kind of evil in my life and I never want to see him again. I asked to have my name stricken from the records and asked to remain anonymous if the case ever got out. I'm so glad I did because today I got a letter from the state. He's being released in February. The court had my old address, my parents' house, and my mom didn't think the letter was important. I missed a deadline to protest his release for probation. The plea deal was eight years and it had only been four. He was getting out due to overcrowding, not good behavior, overcrowding. He'll be out this coming February and I'm ready if he finds me. My wife, my parents, everyone I know knows his face and name. If he tries anything, we are ready, but for his sake, let's not meet. Hey, I'm a lifetime lurker. Figured I'd post about a weird experience I had when I was 17. I'm 25 now. I'm a woman, dress size 24 to 26. That would be kind of important later. I used to work at a popular women's wear plus size store. It was my second job ever and I worked there three times a week after school. I usually worked closing with my manager and one other woman. However, my manager would leave at 6 p.m. and I would be there till about 8 p.m. with my coworker. I should also mention, I was the youngest of our team. Everyone else was in their 30s or 40s and there was some internal mistreatment as a result. A lot of them, it was speaking to me like I was a toddler or making snide remarks about my appearance. I had piercings, dyed hair, stretched ears, etc. I had two core work friends that I loved dearly. 
They were in their 30s and 60s. Fabulous people who were also alternative. But sadly, the rest of them were competitive and mean-spirited. There's one particular co-worker who I was closing with that night. She was very fend for yourself with almost all the staff members. She was very proper, very religious, so she hated me. And she took everything super literally. A real peach. It was about 7.30 p.m. and we were starting to do our closing tasks. I was putting clothes away, cleaning tables, etc. And my coworker was behind the cash register. A woman came in, maybe mid-50s, skinny, lanky, short hair, skin damage level tan, colorless eyes. I'm talking pupils and nothing else. Looked like she lived in a fire pit. She didn't say much at first, but made a beeline for the lingerie, which is where I was cleaning. She looks over at me a couple times, and I get the feeling she's trying to steal. I subtly let my coworker know by using the code word in a sentence, and she notes the same thing. I kept my eye on the woman for about 15 minutes. During this time, she was shuffled between racks almost like a crab, side to side, back always facing me, muttering something to herself and her hands would move jaggedly and sharply towards different items. She almost looked animated. Her movements felt unnatural. Eventually, she turns to face me. She has a pile of lingerie hanging on her arm. She smiles widely and says, My wife and I had an argument. She won't let me come back to our apartment until I give her a gift. I'm thinking something that will benefit both of us, if you know what I'm saying. It's at that point that she dudges me. I, a nervous teenager, nervously laugh and ask if she knows her wife's size, pointing out that she had grabbed multiple different sized items. She ponders for a moment and says, You got more brains than me. I don't know her size actually, but come to think of it, she looks a bit like you. As she's saying this, she begins to hold up lingerie against my body, sizing me up. This made me extremely uncomfortable for obvious reasons. Anyone touching me against my consent is a big no-no for me already, but especially in a sexually objectified manner. Regardless of who they are, I take a step back, turn to my coworker, and give her the help me eyes. It was at that point my coworker shrugged and turned the other way. I could swear she was giggling at the situation, and I realized I was now alone in dealing with this woman. I gently offered an alternative option, a bathrobe, a pretty safe bet, and more flexible if it's oversized or undersized. Plus, you can return a house coat. You couldn't, however, return a lace thong. The shopper practically jumped at the idea, still giddy and animated, and I start to think she merely had a lapse of judgment before. Boy, was I wrong. She takes the rope from my hands and goes, Oh, this is perfect, but I'm still hesitant about the size. Say, you guys offer try-ons, don't you? We did. We would sometimes model products for customers with limited mobility who wanted to see garments in action. I shook my head at this and explained that we only do that for business attire and not for casual wear or lingerie. She sighs, scuffles around, and goes, Well, you're the same size as her. Let me hug you to be sure. Before I could react, she put her arms around me. I froze, couldn't feel my arms or legs. I remember my heart racing as she patted my lower back. Something finally kicked in and I took a quick step back, but I couldn't say anything. I was shocked. She smiles and goes, That wasn't so bad, huh baby? And I was right, you're exactly like my woman. Curves in all the right places. You sure you can't amuse me and try this on? Every word put me on edge. I began stepping back to the safety of the cash register counter where my coworker was. It was at this time my coworker decided to clean the fitting rooms. Once safely behind the cash register, I check the time and say, Uh, I can't do that for you. Against store policy. Are you buying the robe? We close in five minutes. She seems surprised about the change of tone. I'm in a full freeze, flight, fight mode, and my emotions are all over the place. I just want her gone. Yeah, I'll take it. She goes to pull out her wallet. Surprise, surprise, no wallet in sight. She fumbles around for cash for a good five minutes or so. During this time, she decides to go into an extensive detail about her and her wife's sex life and how it got worse after they got married. Eventually, she finds a crumpled up $50 bill and buys a robe, confirming that it was returnable. 
As she leaves, she says, If she doesn't like this, I'll be back tonight. If you're not here, I'll come back every day until you are. I like you. I told her that we were now closed, and my coworker unlocks the door at this point and gestures for the customer to leave. She didn't have any parting words after that, but did blow a kiss at me on the way out. I winced at it. That's all I know. My coworker giggled when the woman left and said, She sure did like you. I didn't say anything back, got my stuff and left. About two weeks later, I put in my two weeks notice following a similar incident involving a serial shitter using her changing rooms as a bathroom. He would also try on women's lingerie. That's a story for another time. Thankfully, the robe woman never showed up again while I was still working there. Although, at one point, my manager told me that a short-haired woman was looking for me during the hours of the following day. I'm certain it was her. So glad I'm safe now, but it was definitely one of the creepier encounters I've ever had. I'm a 24-year-old female. At the time, I was 21. I lived in a small city in the Midwest. At the time, I had no car but a bicycle and hardly enough money for public buses. I worked at a retail battery, lighting, and repair store. I worked there full time and only lived a little over a mile from my job. Since I'm a female in a male dominated field, I was often used to targeted abuse from men that thought they knew better. Many times I stood my ground and flaunted my knowledge in subjects that these men couldn't grasp. Because of my willingness to learn and my close proximity to work, I often worked all sorts of hours, mostly by myself. This time I wasn't the closing person and had a co-worker, Joey, 22 male, who came in for a part-time shift after he wrapped up his classes at the local college. We had a close friendship and we often stood up for each other and stood in when we were flustered or needed to go to the bathroom in the back. Joey received a call on a possible repair on a smartphone, probably LG, a low tier phone though, and he wasn't 100% sure if it was a phone that we could repair. He asked a young female caller to stop by for a consult. She had quickly agreed and said that she would stop by at around 5.30 p.m. This was the night that I was supposed to get done at 6 p.m. and catch the bus at 6.12. It was a windy, drizzly, early fall night. I remember because I had my bike with me and it became my anchor that night. A little after 6 p.m., this frantic, terrified, bawling 19 to 20 year old woman came into our tiny shop. I was at the counter switching out aging price tags and doing general store maintenance. I looked at her confused, willing to help. She looked at me in deep eyes asking if Joey was here. At that time he was pooping in our tiny bathroom in the back so I had to step in and help out any customers. I told her that he was currently busy and I was willing to help her. She handed me her smashed cheap phone very timidly. My customer service skills couldn't prepare me for what she was going to say next. She quietly told me that her boyfriend, who was out in the red truck in the small parking lot, got angry and smashed her phone when she tried to call her sister that afternoon. I took the back end off the phone and tried to research the model for any possible screen repair. No results found. I tried to hand back her destroyed phone and she pushed it back into my hands with a pleading look. Then the honking commenced. There was a light drizzle outside, so the front glass door was covered in beaded drops and was slightly fogged over. I couldn't see who was honking out there. I told her that I couldn't help her and for her to try our cell phone repair competitor down the road. The tears started to really flow down her cheeks and I was freaked out at this point. She kept throwing glances behind her and the honking would not stop. I shook with fear and rage at this point. I myself was in a domestic abuse situation at the time and knew what this girl was experiencing. I broke my locked stare at her and tried to look in her system a second time for a replacement screen. Nothing. I looked up from our computer and saw a shadowy figure of a young man pacing in front of the store. I was just happy that the honking stopped, but I was increasingly shooken up. My whole body vibrated with fear and I whispered across the counter if she needed me to call 911. She slammed her hands down on the counter, said that I couldn't do that. She begged me not to. 
At this point, Joey came out from the back and asked me what was all the honking coming from. We had a lot of elderly, farmers, lazy, or disabled customers that would honk their horns for us to pick up heavy battery cores from their cars. He thought that it was one of those situations, but with a look on our faces, he knew that something horrifying was happening. The young guy stopped pacing outside and began banging on our front door. Joey took the girl's phone from my hand and said for me to go in the back and lock the back employee only doors. I did what I was told, grabbed my bag, my bike, and my jacket. I looked at the clock in the back and it read 614. I spent 15 minutes with this girl, both of us feeling like trapped animals. Joey did bodybuilding during his free time and was a gentle, non-confronting, short and stocky Asian guy. I was a short, obese, kind lady that would respond either of two ways, like a doormat or ready to stand my ground. I knew I couldn't fight a customer and neither could Joey. Not because of physical reasons, we'd lose our jobs and I had no idea what to do. The young guy threw the door open and the wind kept the door open. He had this manic, hateful look about him. A total predator he was. He was slim but muscular, early to mid twenties and at that point was soaked by rain. He took the broken phone off the counter and took the girl in tow. He hurled insults at us and I gave the girl a pitied look. He slammed the door shut and both Joey and I stood there in absolute silence. He snapped out of it and ran to the front door and locked it. I told Joey to call the manager of the store from our landline and stood around while he did. I noticed that the guy had moved his truck directly in front of our door. He was watching us from his truck, watching us behind the counter as we were on the phone with our manager. I had to leave to go home. The last possible bus came at 642 and I couldn't pedal my way home in this weather after all that just occurred. Time was around 618 and I just needed to cross the busy highway, go down the sidewalk about an eighth of a mile to the nearest bus stop. Joey, the guy, and I played a waiting game. It was 623 when this dickhead finally left our parking lot. I told Joey that I would leave at 625 so I could arrive at the stop safely. Joey opened the front door and I threw myself on my bike, pedaling harder than I could ever imagine. Now mind you, our store was in an industrial shopping area at the very edge of town. We worked next to a sub shop and worked across from a strip mall with a bullseye store and a local chain grocery store with other retail stores and a bank all in that large lot. It started a downpour as I tried to pull out of the parking lot straddling my bike. I caught a glimpse of the red truck looping around the sub shop. The highway had dual lanes each way and I had to play real life frogger if I wanted to make my destination in one piece. There was a few cars that slowed down for me as I hauled ass to the other side of the road. I jumped off my bike and threw it on top of the curb. I promptly hopped back on and tried to pedal off. My front wheel was stuck in the grassy strip and my right foot slipped off the pedal. My shin struck the pedal and I had to act quickly. I grabbed the frame of my bike and jogged awkwardly to the bus stop. The red truck pulled into the bank parking lot of which I had just passed. The truck pulled around and went through the entrance across from the sub shop and took the closest lane to me. He went at a crawl and turned at the red light so he could circle the main parking lot of the shopping center. There were three ways into the parking lot, one to the left, one in the center, and the other one to the right next to the grocery store. I stuck to the sidewalk since it felt safer and was in front of people. The truck patrolled the parking lot looking like a hunter stalking its prey. I felt cold, sore, and concerned just like an injured animal. There was a couple of cars that pulled out into the left entrance of the parking lot causing the truck to stop from re-entering the lot again. I almost collapsed in the shitty bus stop and I felt my phone buzz. I saw that it read Joey so I rested my bike on my person to answer the call. Joey told me that he was watching and even though he had an elderly couple in the store that he was helping, that he wouldn't allow this guy to hurt me. I started to cry. All of this had just gotten to me. The red truck looped around again and again. I saw my bus pull up early at 639 and I couldn't be happier. I knew the driver since I used this bus to get all around town, errands, shopping, and to go to and from work. 
I had my stupid fucking bike with me to worry about. I hung up the phone with Joey, putting my phone in my jacket pocket and strapped down my bike on the rack in front of the bus. I struggled since I was shook and my bike was slick from the rain. I got on the bus and turned to the open bus doors and saw that the truck took a left at the center entrance of the lot. I could finally let my guard down. I sat in the front of the bus, my hands shaking, while trying to get the $1.25 for the fare. The driver said it was okay and that I could take my time with the change. I kept my backpack on and pulled my damp phone out of my pocket, dialing Joey's number letting him know that I was fine. In under 15 minutes, I made it to my apartment safe, but deeply disturbed. I took my bike in so it wouldn't draw any attention to where I lived. All of this gave me the idea to leave my own domestic abuse situation. To this day, I wonder about that girl, and I hope that somebody more darling and stronger than me called the cops on her abuser. That she had the strength to leave that violent man, for her to write her own story, and recover from it all. I'm currently doing significantly better in life and finally have my own car. I live a couple states away, safely from my past life. Even though it's states away and it's been three years now, let's not meet. A few years ago, I moved back to my hometown after divorcing my ex-husband. About a year after I moved back, I got a job at a local boutique. My workspace was in the back, where the girls took deliveries and the clothes were stored before being put out front to sell. Soon after I started working there, I realized that all the girls were creeped out by our local FedEx driver. When the girls saw the truck pull up outside, they'd usually yell, He's here! My boss would literally hide in her office so she didn't have to talk to the guy and it didn't take me long to figure out why. Now, I'm a very friendly person usually and I like to treat everyone the way that I'd want to be treated. This driver, let's call him Jeff, would come in to drop the boxes off and he'd always linger. He would make conversation and his conversations got progressively weird. The first time I met him and introduced myself, he said, oh, did you used to work at the funeral home? It was a little strange to me, but it's a small town so I just said yes and that was it. I hadn't given him my last name, so I just figured he remembered my face. One of the next times he came, he told me that he'd just dropped off some packages off at my house. When I looked at him and asked how he knew where my house was, he just laughed and said, It's not a big city. I remember names and don't take long to realize who's who. It made me feel weird, and when I told my boss about it after he left, she agreed it was weird, but I just kind of let it go. When my girls told me that the FedEx guy was weird and said that he always tried to talk to them when he came by, my warning bells went off. One of the next times he came in, he made a remark about a big box he had delivered to my house and gave me a couple of small packages that were addressed to my house and said, with it being so close to Christmas, I don't want to leave these. I know you don't have a big man to get that box inside, so you want me to come help you get it in that house when you get off work? I immediately replied, no, I got it, but thanks. This remark creeped me out bad. That told me that he was either watching my house or paying attention to the names on the mail. Either way, it was enough for me to warn my girls not to answer if he came to the house and to start trying to hide when he came in. One day, I even heard him ask one of the girls up front where I was. I started trying to take my lunch break around the time he made his deliveries. I did everything I could to avoid him. One evening, I heard a knock at the door of my house and then the sounds of packages being left on the porch. I waited a minute or so and then went to get the boxes. Jeff was parked in the church parking lot across from my house, watching. As soon as I came out, he grinned and waved and then started to get out of his truck. I quickly backed into my house and shut the door. He didn't come knock, but his truck was in the parking lot for another 15 minutes or so. My daughter watched him from the bedroom window and told me he kept looking at the house and I figured he was waiting to see if I'd come back out. I called the local FedEx facility to report it. I explained the whole story and the manager told me they would look into it and thank me for letting me know. I figured nothing would be done. A couple days went by and I got a call from a manager at the FedEx facility. He told me that Jeff would no longer be a problem and apologized for everything. 
I assume maybe they changed his route or something, but the next driver happened to be a high school friend, and when I jokingly told him, I'm glad you're our FedEx guy now, that last dude was a creeper. He said, yeah, he got fired. Dude was stalking folks, apparently. It made my blood run cold. I watched for him for months afterwards. It's possible that he was just overly friendly, but I don't think so. I used to feel bad that he lost his job, but he crossed too many lines. I I've had my share of creepy encounters with strange people, but this one bothers me the most. I'm a female. I was 19 at the time, attending a community college close to home. This was my first year, so I was taking elective courses and planning on getting into a major the following year. So I was taking a philosophy course. You get a mixed bag of students that are majoring in a wide range of things. There was this guy who sat behind me. He was maybe 30. He was husky build and tall. I weigh 115 pounds, so he could easily have crushed me. He seemed overly friendly with me. He was always asking me questions about my studies and about my life. It became obvious he had some type of crush, but I was not attracted to him whatsoever. I answered some questions, but did my best to avoid him. He had this creepy vibe to him. One day in class, we were supposed to get into groups for a project. So it was him, me, and another girl. He suddenly grabbed the girl's hand and started caressing them. She says, dude, stop it, and moves away from him. So the creepy vibe got more intense after I saw that. One day when class was over, I was walking to the next one. I had to go outside to go into a new building. As I was about to enter the building, I caught a glimpse of his reflection on the door. He stayed far enough behind so I wouldn't see him, but I could tell that he was debating if he was going to keep following. I was very unnerved by that, but thought maybe he just has a crush and he's socially awkward. The next day after class, he started to follow me and asked if he could walk me to my next class. I said, yeah, I guess. His personality was more aggressive than mine. I was always such a people pleaser. In this particular building had way less people than the others. We walked down the staircase where there was nobody in sight. He suddenly looked at me and said, Have you ever heard the story about the girl who was raped near the staircase? He had this creepy smile on his face, but it didn't register right away with me. I said, What girl? What staircase? He repeated it again very slowly as he looked at me and the stairs. I suddenly felt very uncomfortable that we were totally alone. I couldn't answer and felt sick. I said something like, I'm late for class and left him behind. Thankfully, he didn't follow. Soon after that, it was final exams. In the class I shared with him, the instructor passed out our test and said to complete it and turn it in. Once we do that, we are free to leave and have a nice summer. I knew that I had to keep away from this guy, but he leaned over and said to me, after you finish, wait in the hallway for me. I felt scared. I knew I had to finish the exam before he did so I can get away. I went through it as quickly as I could. I didn't even care if my grade wouldn't be as good because of how quickly I tried to get through it. I just turned it in. I tried to look as nonchalant as possible. I walked out and sprinted out of the hall, out into the parking lot. Thankfully, I never saw him again. This happened at school when I was seven or eight. We used to have compulsory evening preps where we would study from seven to nine. There were no excuses, even us day schoolers had to attend. On that evening, one of the teachers sent me and my friend to go take some keys to the boys dormitory warden. It was around 8 p.m., so it was very dark. My friend and I were apprehensive about going because the path to the dorm was very dark, but we couldn't refuse the teacher, so we went. As we were walking, one of the boys jumped out and scared us. It was so sudden that I immediately started running. 
As we ran, we passed by a bigger group of boys that were hidden in the corner. When they saw us pass, they immediately started chasing us and shouting that they only wanted to play. This made us run faster towards the dorm. We realized that the only way back was where the boys were chasing us from. It looked like the end for us. I desperately looked around to see if there was any way of escaping and I saw a newly dug garden that was next to the boys dorm. I swiftly steered my friend towards it and as we got closer we realized that it had a fence but luckily it had spaces between that we were able to squeeze through and we ran like hell back to the teacher. When we got to him, we tried to tell him that the boys had tried to grab us in the dark and all he said was that they were playing. I got so mad that he wasn't taking us seriously, but he just shrugged and instead got mad at us for not delivering the keys. Immediately, my dad came to pick us up and we went home. I told my parents what happened and they moved me to a much better school. I later found out that my friend had left that school too. I was so glad that the garden didn't have a normal fence or we would have been attacked. This is something that happened to me when I was around 15 or 16. I used to be painfully shy as a kid, so I had a small group of friends that I was always around. My first day of sophomore year, I met this guy, let's call him Seth, 18 or 19, in one of my classes and he seemed a little strange. I didn't think much of it at the time because he seemed really nice. Finally, it was time for my favorite period, lunch. Lunch was reserved for my favorite people, Two boys who graciously accepted an awkward 13 year old me after a dramatic move to my dad's home. One of the boys was actually my best friend and first boyfriend. Let's call him Jay. So we were really close and I trusted him more than anyone else. The other, let's call him Harry, was in the same class with me where I met Seth. Anyway, I sit at our table and we begin comparing teachers when Seth randomly joins our table. I figured that he was one of their friends, so we just continued like normal. After a few weeks, I started getting a little creeped out by Seth. He seemed to be everywhere I went in the school, and always stood way too close. If I asked him to step back, he would point out to other guy friends who stood closer. For context, I am in a wheelchair, and he is very tall, so my head is at the same level as that area. I eventually found out that he had seen my school login and saved it to his computer. Now, I didn't want to immediately freak out and report him, so I decided I was just going to ask him to delete it. He said that he would, and that was the end of that. As the months went on, Seth started to get worse. The class we had was a film class where the students would go out during the period in groups to do the project independently. This is very scary because he would immediately claim me in his group and I was too nice to decline until we were put in pairs. He would always try to get me to go film with him in the back fields behind our school. The way he would suggest it got me so scared that I would refuse to leave the room. My teacher was amazing and didn't force anyone to go out. He would end up doing it alone and I would edit. While Seth was out I decided to see if he deleted my login. He hadn't. He had at least 20 other logins saved into his document, and this time I was scared enough to report it to my counselor. My counselor was a complete idiot and decided to tell him that a girl in his class reported him. I found out because the next day he came to lunch and started accusing me and seemed really angry. I denied it and Jay and Harry stuck up for me. It was shortly after this that I found out that neither of my friends knew Seth. He had only known me when he joined our table. My counselor decided that my concerns were not important enough to notify the teacher, nor the police. I guess it was not serious enough to warrant anything outside of school. They didn't even notify my dad. After everything happened with the report, he went back to being creepy, but in a worse way. Every day he would try to convince me to go somewhere with him behind our school, and it had gotten to the point that he was trying to tell me I had to. He would make up excuses for us to go somewhere alone. I didn't tell anyone about it besides the school and my teacher later because at the time I wasn't sure if I was just being crazy. I think my friends might have expected that he was getting a little pushy because they started walking me to class whenever they could. 
When I told my teacher what was going on, he immediately started assigning seats and talked to another girl in my class to see if I could permanently join her group. Seth graduated at the end of the year and decided to resurface in my email inbox when I was 17 or 18. I blocked him. I'm attending a small private college in the Midwestern United States. As a fine arts major, I spend many late nights in the art building. This particular evening, several students were there along with me and one of my professors. I was going to take some creepy photographs for an assignment in the building's basement. I had been there before and it's basically a concrete coffin for storage. I wasn't scared, but I persuaded my friend Beth to join me. The staircase came out in the middle of a slim rectangular structure divided into several rooms. We turned on all the lights to see the stacks of artwork and old documents that were piled in every corner and crevice and there were cobwebs over everything. We had to leave at one point to help another student moving pottery and upon our return to the stairwell the light was on but the entire basement was pitch black. I was certain we had left the lights on. I asked Beth, but she just mumbled a quiet, I don't know, and I figured I had just forgotten. We were in a room about 40 feet long, and we were positioned on the side of the furthest to the stairwell. Our only light source was coming from the far right room. The white light spilled across the graffiti wall I had been photographing. The back of the room was occupied with a huge heating and cooling duct system. It took up almost the entire back wall and pushed into the room about five feet. Stacks of cardboard boxes and tools cluttered the area around it. I tried to pass the time with chatter. I almost thought some horrible, grotesque art project gone wrong would jump out of the shadows. About 20 minutes had passed when we heard a faint sound coming from the stairwell. It sounded distant. I asked Beth if she had heard it too and received a nod. It sounded kind of like someone clapping their hands together, but we were definitely the only two down there. I shivered internally and continued talking. There was a scraping sound and all talking stopped. It sounded like someone was dragging an object across the hard floor, like a cupboard across the concrete. I stood up. That sound came from inside the room near the stairs. I instantly thought animal, but how would it get down here? There was only one entrance and exit. My eyes darted from side to side, searching the darkness. Then, without warning, a small cupboard box shot out from behind the far end of the duck machine. It slid across the floor, and my stomach dropped like a weight. It wasn't like the box fell and rolled across the ground. Someone had thrown it, pushed it, or kicked the damn thing. It came across like a fucking rocket. Something had to be in here with us. I grabbed Beth's arm. Her eyes were glued to the box. She was terrified. There was no way anyone else had gotten in here without us hearing them or seeing them. My logical brain was screaming the fact, but what on earth moved that goddamn box? My brain was reeling as I shifted back to the lit room. The light felt safe somehow. Do, do you want to go? I heard Beth whisper. Was she crazy? I, if you want to go, I'll go too. While I give her props for her manners, we couldn't just go. The box was sitting right in front of the opposite door. Our only escape to safety of the staircase and the light switch. There was no way I was just going to waltz by whatever kicked it out there. I stayed silent though. I wasn't sure I could talk. During that time, we heard small sounds from behind one of the big machines. Like a continuous tapping sound. Like an impatient hand drumming against a metal desk but it soon escalated to loud bangs. It was so loud and the tight space made it echo and intensify. We didn't know what the fuck was going on and we had no idea what to do or where to go. All we could hear was a constant noise, but we couldn't see anything in the darkness. It was so frustrating that I somehow found my voice. Who the he hell are you? I managed to choke out. It sounded much less intimidating than intended. You, you better not get the fuck off. My hands were shaking, and it was then that the noise changed and we heard one of the most disturbing sounds I've ever witnessed. But it wasn't because of the sound itself. 
This awful screeching and scratching reverberated across the room. It literally sounded like nails on a chalkboard, but I knew what it was, and it scared the shit out of me. Something was crawling from behind the damn machine, and I could tell that it was coming towards us, and it was coming fast, really fucking fast. That was the most disturbing part. It moved so desperately towards us, straining against the machine and scraping the wall. It was like running a concrete block against a cheese grater and amplified times a thousand. It must have been a tight fit for whatever it was and we still couldn't see a goddamn thing. In my head, all I could imagine was some sort of disgusting and disfigured person scrambling towards us. Probably had gross teeth and five legs with a knife. Maybe they had been down here for a while and we had disturbed them in their hidey hole. People didn't venture into the basement often, and there certainly weren't routine checks. Someone could have theoretically hid down there. Either way, I knew that they were trying to attack. Nothing moves that fast to say hello. My adrenaline was pumping, and Beth looked ready to keel over in fear. I scanned the room for some sort of weapon, and the closest object was this nasty looking plunger. It may not have been the most gracious choice, but it was better than nothing. Another noise echoed from the other end of the room. It was definitely a cell phone hidden in the concrete on the far end, but it wasn't either of ours. Instantly, all my fear turned to anger, like a light switch was flipped. I knew who it was. My best friend. Carrie, you bitch! You dropped your fucking phone! Get out here so I can kick your ass! I was seething. Adrenaline doesn't mix well with anger, at least not in this situation. I started moving when whoever had been moving towards us behind the machine jumped out right behind Beth and I. It was a short, hefty person, but the face looked remarkably like a bleached pig, complete with beady red eyes. I quickly realized that it was a disturbing mask. The person instantly sprinted towards us and I stumbled back with a gasp. My hand was in a fist and I swore I was going to punch someone out when I heard stifled laughter. Of all people, my fucking professor comes crawling out from the boxes. I can remember going, what the fuck? I was dumbfounded. Carrie came out from behind the machine sheepishly, clutching her shitty phone, and the mass sprinter was revealed to be another student. These idiots decided on a whim to prank us. They were successful. The pottery student and even the janitor were in on it, tasked with distracting us so the others could sneak downstairs. They had turned off the lights and I had walked by their hiding spots several times. We were in there for almost about 10 minutes thinking that we were alone. Naturally, I ordered them to get the fuck out so that I could finish my assignment. Though I wasn't happy to see my friends, I'm glad I met them instead of my imaginary alternative. This happened to my daughter when she was just four. I have four kids and they all have their own rooms, but this particular night my middle daughter wanted to sleep with the oldest one. Our house is pretty large and the kids have their own section so my room was on the other end of the house. We live in the south and it's extremely hot but this night it felt unbearable even with the air on so I was up and down, I was so restless and couldn't sleep. Around 3 a.m. I go to the hall where my kids are and I hear a little voice coming from the girl's room. Next thing I know, I see my four-year-old coming out of the door, going towards the front door. I rush to her before she can open it and ask her, what are you doing? She said that her teacher was outside her window and wanted her to open the door. I thought she may have been dreaming, but she insisted we had to let him in. She went to preschool and her teacher was a woman, so I knew it wasn't her teacher. I went to the room to take a look and I see a shadow going past the window. I just start shaking. I called the police but he was gone before they got there, but they found size 11 footprints outside. We questioned her to see if we could figure out who it might have been and she said he had long hair and was her teacher. Finally, a couple weeks later in Sunday school, she pointed to a picture of Jesus and said, Him, he's my teacher. So whoever it was looked like that. 
We got an alarm system and nailed the window shut because I wasn't about to take the chance of one of my babies being taken. Junior year of college, this random guy approached me and my friend working a booth at an activities fair and asked us to help him get in contact with his buddy that he was supposed to go camping with. Mind you, this was winter in New Hampshire, so really fucking cold, so it was already starting to sound sketchy. Not only was this guy not a student at the university, but he didn't even know the name of the guy he was supposed to go camping with, nor did he know the phone number. He said something to the effect of, Oh, I was supposed to pick him up this morning and give him and his girlfriend a ride to the campsite, but she's not picking up her phone. Can you help me find them? He kind of knew her name. Kept saying it was something like Emily or Emma. I was mad creeped out, but pretended to help nonetheless, as my friend seemed okay. He tried guessing the name of the male friend, but all the info he really had was the girl's name. His main goal in all of this was to figure out where he could find these people. He said he was trying to get into a building where he thought they were and couldn't because it was locked. You can't get into residential halls on my campus without a student ID. He even hinted that he was hoping that one of us could help him get into the building. But we just shrugged it off with, oh we wish we could help more but we're stuck here until 2pm. After we failed to help him, we directed him towards the dining hall because we had no idea where else to send him. He walked out of the building and my friend and I looked at each other and we both were like, holy shit, did you get freaked out by him too? I firmly believe that he was an abusive, jealous ex trying to find out where his ex-girlfriend and new boyfriend were. I really try not to judge someone before I know them, but something really just wasn't right with him, you know? P.S. This guy was 100% the Ted Bundy type. He had piercing turquoise blue eyes, was very handsome, had charming mannerisms and a striking jawline. I'm a 17 year old female and many other girls who went to my elementary school look back and see how creepy one of the teachers was. I'll call him Mr. B. From others I was told that he did the most with me. So Mr. B was a teacher of mine when I was around 9 or 10 years old and he was the average teacher, wasn't the best and wasn't the worst. Later on when I was around 12 or 13, I joined the volleyball and basketball teams. He was a coach for both. Here's when things started to pick up. One day during practice, he wanted to practice the bumping technique where you body check someone with your back. He called me from the back of the crowd and made me practice this on him from three different angles so the others could see. Later, I started helping around school with my friend and he would always invite us to help him out during recess and would move all of his work to sit next to us and would offer us donuts and treats when we were there. Then the pet name started up. He would call us, there are my beautiful girls. He would tell me I'm his lucky charm and needed to pet and play with my hair. When talking to us, his eyes would flicker either on my body or on my face, but rarely in my eyes. He would come visit us in class randomly, just to chat. One time, he sniffed my hair while playing with it and commented that it smelled like hairspray. For sports teams, he would let me join without making me try out because he missed me on the team and it's not the same without you. We need you. To this day, I still see him because my friend's siblings are still in that school. I asked my friend if he comments on her or anything, and she said no, that he barely says anything to her. But when I visit, he again greets us as, my beautiful, beautiful girls. He would chat and tell me how good I look, and would touch my shoulder when saying goodbye. He also even expressed that seeing me makes his day, and that he loves when we come back to visit. My friend goes every other day for her siblings, so obviously, that doesn't make any sense. I've known this man for years. He acts like a creep, but I still know him by being on the team to helping him for so many years that I don't know how to feel. Is he just treating me differently due to all those factors, or is he a creep? I just feel very creeped out when I think about it.
A few years ago, during what was probably the darkest period in my life, I worked overnight at a local Walmart. Six days a week I would spend 9pm to 7am stocking anything from fishing lures to makeup. I've never been in a more depressing environment. Everyone was really apathetic and too caught up in their own depressing lives to care about anything or anyone else. This included the managers. Walmarts have generally a weird vibe to them anyways, but this was a 24 hour super center in rural West Virginia. So you can imagine the characters, meth and opiate addicts mostly, that would show up throughout the night. We had no security guards and from what I have come to understand, a lot of the cameras, especially in the parking lot, haven't worked properly in a while. Being one of the few young female overnight stalkers, I encountered my fair share of unwanted advances, but the one that took the cake was this guy who would show up every time I went outside for a smoke break, regardless of the time, 2am, 4am, 6am, it didn't matter. Dude would appear around the corner and try to strike up a conversation within seconds of me stepping outside. It didn't matter which entrance I used, and there were three. At first, I assumed he worked there. Why else would anyone voluntarily lurk around this shitty Walmart at all hours of the night? Pretty much everyone on that shift smoked during their two nightly 15 minute breaks, so it wasn't out of the question to think he was doing the same. Maybe the timing was just a coincidence, but no. I came to find out that he didn't work there, even though he often wore a dark blue t-shirt, just like the overnight employees. I stopped going outside alone and would only venture outside with one of my guy friends, particularly one that I've been friends with since middle school. Even their presence didn't deter him and it kind of became a store-wide joke. I was weirded out but not alarmed until he started getting a little more aggressive. He would ask me if I was seeing anyone and would ask me out pretty much every chance he got. I was playing GTA 5 at the time. So I came up with a story about my scary long distant boyfriend Trevor from Northern California. Even then he wasn't phased. I was done feigning politeness and began ignoring him. One night when my main guy friend had called in sick and the others were working on something on the opposite side of the store, I went outside with two older women in my area. After a few minutes they went inside and just as I was about to follow them, Walmart Creeper suddenly appeared. Pretty sure that he had been waiting around the corner. He insisted on me going to his car with him to see something. Taking my hand in his. Not hard, but I was still pissed that he touched me. I'm a genuinely angry person anyway, so I lost my shit. I ripped my hand away and sprinted inside. I reported him to the head manager that night and found out that he had a cousin who worked in the back, unloading trucks. Apparently, he liked to hang out with his cousin at work. The cousin apologized profusely and said that he'll talk to him, but the management was a whole other level of shitty and didn't even say anything to the creeper, let alone ban him from the premises. I ended up quitting because of the horrible management, although it was over an entirely different situation. Found out through a friend that the guy, who was still hanging out at the store every night, was still doing this creepy thing with other women and tried like hell to learn my name and where I lived. He was apparently asking around about me for weeks later after I left, before disappearing himself. I can't help but thinking about how those parking cameras haven't worked in such a long time, and if anyone would have cared enough to notice if I had just disappeared on one of those long, tiring work nights. So this happened about six years ago in a very rural town at a gas station. By very rural, I mean drive over an hour before you even see signs of civilization. I was 16 and needed a job, so I applied and was immediately hired at this gas station. I was supposed to work the night shifts with another coworker, Jules, until I got the hang of everything. The first three nights were quiet, two customers max each night and we spent most of our time talking about college. On the fourth night, around 11, we get our first customer, John. Now, everyone in town knew John for he had some brain damage and was effectively six. He was pretty big. 
We both knew John liked Jules and thought he was great. He was sweet and funny. On this night, he had brought in $10 and wanted Snickers and Gatorade, which we gave him. He sat at the table that was out and started snacking while telling us about his new kitten. 30 to 40 minutes later, we get our second visitor, who turned our whole lives upside down. He was a man in his 30s or 40s. He had black hair and a leather jacket. He looked like a greaser. He wanted beer, which was locked up in another room and required someone to get it. Since I was new, Jules went to get it for him. The man said hi to John and me and started trying to strike up a conversation about school. Pretty soon, he started to steer the convo towards more inappropriate things, which, since I was a 16-year-old female, I found it weird. He wanted to know if I had a boyfriend, was a virgin, what kind of sex I liked. I silently prayed Jules would hurry up and return, and after dodging his questions for 10 minutes, she did. She gave him his drink and he paid, but he didn't leave. He started talking to her about the same things that he had with me. She was 18, still young, but also older than me. Thus, she was more bold, I guess. She shut him down and asked him to please leave. But now he told us he needed gas, so she unlocked one of the pumps, and he went outside to get his gas. Five minutes later, he returns. It's apparently not working. He asked if one of us could come out and help him. Jules volunteered, but before she left, she handed me the keys. I wasn't allowed them since I was new. She also handed me a piece of folded up paper. On the paper it read, lock the doors and keep the lights on. I don't know if this is true everywhere, but where we were, if the gas station lights were on, including the signs and decorations, not just the normal ones, something was up. It was a sign to call the police in my area. She leaves with him and I lock the door, but I stay by the window so I can see them. John joins me and starts asking questions. What's happening? Where's Jules? Who is that guy? I explained the best I could that I didn't know and that if something happened, we needed to run very fast to get help. It had been about 20 minutes and I couldn't see either of them because they were on the other side of the truck facing away from the window. The worst situations were popping into my head and I started to freak out, but suddenly Jules appeared and I unlocked the door to let her in. The guy's truck peels out and I lock the doors again. She tells me that the guy had grabbed her ass and told her that she could come home with him. Of course, she told him to fuck off or she would call the cops. We spent about 15 minutes calming down and eventually we all leave together. I quit the next morning and got a job in town, but Jules stayed. About a month later, it was on the news that she had been sexually assaulted by a guy who came in late at night. They never caught him. And whenever I go back home, I see her, and we talk about that night. It was the same guy, she's sure of it. She's doing good and has a husband and a daughter. John moved to Cali with his mom and cat. I'll never forget that night though, and now whenever I go to a gas station, I check the lights. When I was 18 years old, I started my first job at Spirit Halloween, a seasonal Halloween store. It was my first job, so I was excited and eager to work, finally making my own money for college. Because it's a seasonal location, as you can imagine, management was pretty disorganized. I didn't know half of the staff, scheduling was a mess, and I pretty much just picked up shifts when I wanted to work, and they always needed the help. One day, I'm in the break room and about to head back on the sales floor when a manager I hadn't met came in. He starts asking questions about my name, age, what I was studying in school, etc. and insisted that I stay on break a little longer and sit down and drink a Red Bull with him. We sat down and he proceeded to brag to me about how when he was younger, he used to work on movie sets and used to be in production. The entire conversation revolved around him trying to impress me with these stories. I thought it was weird, but I never had a job before, so I thought maybe he was just making conversation with me. After our conversation, we both went back on the sales floor, and I noticed he would guide me over to a section to work by touching me on the small of my back and making suggestive comments that slowly started to make me uncomfortable. 
Later that shift, I asked him for his email so that when the season ended and I needed to apply for other jobs, I would have his contact information. He told me to send him a text with my full name so that he knew who it was. I texted him while we were still at the store and didn't think anything of it. That night after work, I was up late doing homework when he texted me back. Throughout the night, he kept texting me and it was all unrelated to work. At this point, my alarms are going off in my head that this seems highly inappropriate. My 45-year-old manager is trying to talk to me at 1 a.m. outside of work. I stopped responding and left it at that. Later on, I went on Facebook and realized that when he had me text him my full name, he used it to look me up and try to add me as a friend. The next time I went into work, I planned to try to avoid him as much as possible. However, as soon as I got there, he came up to me and started asking me questions about whether I drank or smoked, stating that we should do it together sometime. This man literally told me I should come over to his house and I could teach him how to roll up and that we should get high on our breaks together. Mind you, he's 45, a manager, and I'm 18. At this point, I knew that what he was doing was inappropriate because he would only make these kind of conversations when we were alone. Anytime coworkers or other managers were around, he would stop, so I tried my best to keep around my other coworkers. This shift though, he pulled me away from my normal section and told me he had a special task that I had to help him with. He takes me in the back of the store where we keep the inventory and had me help start marking down some items. I was on very high alert because we were alone in the back of the store where there were no cameras. Again, he keeps making comments about how we should hang out and continues to tell me stories about old jobs he used to have in his youth to try to impress me. He lifted some lingerie type shorts and made a comment he used to wear those when he was a stripper. Eventually, he tells me about the cool Halloween decorations he had set up in the front of his house and wanted to show me a photo of it. He pulls out his phone and opens the camera roll. As I'm looking at his phone waiting for him to find the photo, I notice something familiar in his camera roll. His most recent photo was a photo of me staring back at me. He had screenshot my Facebook profile photo and it was just sitting there in his camera roll. I gasped as a reaction and tried to hide my surprise because at this point I was creeped out to the max. He made some weird comment about how I was just so beautiful. I couldn't help myself, and I felt disgusted. I didn't confront him about how off-putting that was, because I was just in shock. I texted all of my friends about what happened, and they all agreed it was horribly inappropriate. The remainder of my working there that season consisted of him hitting on me and continuing to make me uncomfortable. Because it was a seasonal job, I didn't report him because it's not like we had an HR department, and as it got closer to Halloween, I knew that they weren't going to fire him when we needed workers. I just tried to avoid him as much as possible, but he continued to text me and try to talk to me every time I was at work. Looking back, it makes me sad that my first ever experience working a job was spent trying to avoid the advancements of a manager that was 30 years older than me. I'm grateful I trusted my gut about him. I'm 5'3", 115 pounds, so I guess I'm pretty small. That's my reasoning for being very submissive over all of this. When I started working at this fast food chain, I was 16. It was my first job and I was excited to finally take my first steps into adulthood. This coworker of mine that was training me, for privacy reasons, I'm going to call him Frank. Frank at first glance looked young, 19 to 21 at the most. We got along, and nothing was too bad, nor alarming. Like conversations about anime and such. I remember things started to change slightly when he was talking about a video game character, and none of our co-workers knew who it was. When I saw the green hat character, I said, Oh, that's Link, how cute. I used to watch my brother play Legends of Zelda, Four Swords. He looked at me and said, Marry me. I laughed it off and continued on with my day. For the rest of my shift, he would hover over me, asking me personal questions like my age, favorite things, etc. Being the open, friendly person I was, I answered happily, 
I told him that I loved butterflies and that I was 16. I'm 17 now and I've had several jobs since. When an older man asks for your age as a minor, it's never a good sign. Moving on to December, I've been at this chain for a month now. My manager asked me if I wanted to come to their company secret Santa party and I agreed. When the day came, I arrived with my now ex-boyfriend. Frank arrives on his phone, acting busy and such, and I thought nothing of it. During the whole party, he was on his phone. I was getting food when he tapped me on the shoulder, still on his phone, and handed me a beautiful butterfly necklace. I didn't know what to say besides thanking him, thinking that he was my secret Santa. Then later, my coworker comes up to me handing me a gift card to Starbucks and a plush. I asked why and she said that she was my secret Santa. I thought it must have been a mistake and went on with my night, listening to my old best friend telling me how I should date Frank, which in my mind was never on the table. January rolls around and it's Frank's birthday. We were just working until I heard one of my girl co-workers, who was into him at the time, wish him a happy birthday. Being that person, I wished him a happy birthday while the other co-workers asked how old he was turning. He said, 27. Might I add that every shift I worked with him, he would take several photos of me before and after the shift, commenting about my hair, my skin, and eyes, often said how cute my nose was. Again, not wanting to make a scene, I just laughed everything off. That's always the case, isn't it? We don't want to cause a scene. I did start telling him to please stop, but of course he wouldn't no matter how many times I asked him to. Now I'm going to skip into May, my birthday month, and of course, I was working on my birthday. I went to the back door as usual. Due to COVID, I had to ring the doorbell and wait for someone to open the door. Out of nowhere, Frank pops out of the bushes, handing me all kinds of gifts. That day was his day off, so I was generally confused. I remember thinking, how the hell did he know it was my birthday? I never talked about it since I don't like celebrating it. He followed me around for a few minutes before awkwardly leaving when I apologized that I needed to get to work and not get yelled at. July is when I finally found a new job. I quit due to sexual harassment I had endured for the nine months I had worked there from my shift lead. That's a whole nother story. But when a man starts getting handsy, don't laugh it off. Shut that shit down. It got really bad when my ex-best friend that I mentioned earlier started showing all my co-workers, including Frank and that shift lead, explicit photos of me that he stole off my phone without me knowing. I was very insecure at the time and was in an abusive relationship, so I'd give anything that boy asked of me. Anyway, at that point, I had about had it. After being interrogated about that shift lead, I put in my two weeks. On my last week, everyone was talking about how the shift lead got laid off for sexual harassment. Frank and I were doing the dishes and the topic came up. I awkwardly told him about it, not knowing how everyone knew my story. The shift lead would often grab my ass, rub my thigh, talk about my boobs and about how, if they were bigger, things he would do to my body, etc. I would say stop politely, but he would continue. When I started yelling and saying stop more aggressively, he would often make me do tasks like clean the greasy floors on my hands and knees or clean in the dining room when it was close due to COVID. When I told Frank this, he shrugged it off and said that was no reason for him to be fired. I remember being absolutely shocked, retorting, I'm glad I'm leaving this hellhole and left after that. A month into my new job as a hostess, everything was going well. It's a restaurant, but everyone comes in there to drink, so it's more of a bar. On one of my 2 a.m. shifts, Frank stops by on his bike. I tried to be friendly, but was getting frustrated when he kept cutting me off from talking to other people. I then walk away to bus tables because no one else would do it, and he couldn't follow me to the restaurant. Outdoor seating, of course. After busting all the tables, I came up to the counter to see my coworker giggling. What happened? I asked. The hostess smiled. That's so cute how your boyfriend takes photos of you while you're working. That's so cute how he obsesses over you. He wouldn't stop talking about you to us. 
boyfriend. I was and still remain single after that bullcrap of a relationship. The only person they could have been referring to was Frank. Then it dawned on me. How the hell did he know where I was working and my shift schedule? I didn't tell anyone besides my parents and my brother. A week goes by and Frank comes back. I may have gotten a little overdramatic, but I didn't know what else to do. I told the other host at the counter to tell him I'm not working today and dashed inside. I told my manager that this man, Frank, keeps taking photos of me as I'm working and it's making me uncomfortable. My manager told me to stay in the back room while he went out and handled the situation. Our restaurant is very popular in the area and it's very crowded in the front. Frank with his bike was blocking customers and that's what my manager was telling him. My idiotic ass was popping my head up a little under the back room window where I could see what was going on in the front. I freaked out a little when I saw Frank getting aggressive with my manager. He begins thrashing while my manager tries to lead him out of the front. Frank throws his bike and tries to head into the building. A few male waiters see what's happening and were informed by my manager. I remember one waiter standing in the back room with me watching the door as another was practically fighting with Frank. I could only hear yelling outside the door and then it went quiet. I spent the rest of my shift like that, cleaning silverware with that male server. From then on, people would walk me to my car, even if it was broad daylight. From August to November, he would be on his bike passing by the restaurant from a distance. He would just be watching and taking photos for about 10 to 20 minutes before leaving. Now, the reason why I thought of putting this here was now it's been a little more intense besides just looking from a distance. Due to COVID, I'm not needed anymore because now my restaurant is takeout only. I had been working seasonal jobs while working at that restaurant, but now I'm not working, waiting to get my schedule. Because I was bored this day, I drove to my local mall just to do a little Christmas shopping. While driving, I look in my rearview mirror to see a recognizable face. It was Frank. I practically choke on my spit seeing his face in my mirror. I try not to get the best of myself and knock it off as a coincidence. Yeah, it wasn't. He followed me throughout the mall and later followed me while I was driving home. No one knows where I live besides that old friend and I'd like to keep it like that. So I drove for an hour getting lost and taking random turns until I finally lost him. I now believe this is how he tracked me down. My car isn't common, but it doesn't stand out too much. It's January 2021, and ever since the start of the new year, I've been getting phone calls going like this. Hello? Hello? And then they hang up. Along with that, I've gotten many random messages asking me about gifts and delivering me a gift. I'm not one that usually uses social media, but these messages were all over mine. All of them from newly made accounts across Snapchat and Instagram. On one occasion, an account started sending me photos, photos that I never sent to anyone. These photos were photos of my cat that I had saved in my Snapchat album. Just photos and photos of things I never sent and ending with, I have a gift for you. I deleted both apps along with deleting almost everything off my phone. A week ago I downloaded Snapchat again due to some dumb assignment my teacher wanted us to do with that crap social media app. One of my old co-workers sent me a message. I opened it. Frank wants to give you your Christmas gift. Wanna stop by? Maybe I'm just overreacting or maybe those accounts were Frank. I just want to say that my personality has changed because of all this. I'm very protective now, rarely talk to anyone, I'm not as friendly as I was then. It's only been a little over a year, yet I feel like I've aged 10 plus. I just want to say, Frank, let's not meet, and fuck your Christmas gift. A lot of this is told from my co-worker's perspective because I didn't notice the guy. Anyway, a guy walks into our store. 
walks up to my coworker up at the front and asks, do I have a sunburn on my neck? And turns around and he pulls up his hair. He has red spray paint on his neck. Later, this guy has been there for an hour lurking around the store. My manager said that she heard the guy creeping around the back during that time too. Eventually the guy left and was still lurking around the store. He saw my coworker folding shirts and began to follow her around. So my coworker goes back in the front and gets my manager up there. So they are both there. I walk up front because it's almost closing time. I grab a basket full of items and start walking to the area to put them away. The creepy guy was also near the front. He looks at my coworkers, then looks at me and starts following me. So my manager uses the walkie talkie and calls me up to the front. I walk up there and we start talking about what we're going to do when we close. My manager leaves because he notices the guy has disappeared and goes to check the back. In the meantime, my coworker tells me about the guy and I was like, huh? I didn't see him at all while I was working. That's creepy. And then my manager comes back and tells us where the guy went. My manager had walked to the back and saw that the guy was trying to hide inside one of the boxes in the back. My manager kicked him out the back door because he didn't want us to see the guy. That's what happened today at work. Creepy shit. I probably saw him during the day, but just didn't notice the guy and how creepy he was. I work alone until quite late at night in a rural place. It's a shop, so people do pop in, but it's generally very quiet. Two recent encounters in the last year or so. First was last year. It was about 10.30 p.m. in the middle of winter, below zero outside, really cold and very windy. There was already frost on the ground, and it was snowing on and off. I can barely see out the window, as there aren't many lights out there. There's a road directly outside, but the street lights are far and few between. Anyone looking in can clearly see me in the shop because it's bright. I was peering through the window to see if it was snowing yet. I thought I caught sight of some movement, but figured it was a cat or something. A few minutes later, I look out again and see a man walk past. He has no top on, naked from the waist up, weird as it's so cold. I immediately felt nervous. I carried on, doing whatever job I was doing, but I'm still nervous as I'm on my own. I'm a female if that matters. I glance out and he's walking past quickly again, still across the road. This time he looks at me. I know he sees me, but he carries on walking. I then decided I'm going to lock the door, and I do. I lock it and scuttle back to the till where the window is. And he's standing right there with his nose almost pressed up against the glass. He is breathing on the window and the frost is melting. I bolt to the office and lock the door. I phone the police. The whole time I hear him rattling the shop door trying to get in. The police came quickly and he had just left. They said later that they caught up with him and he was from a mental facility. There are a few in my area and he just basically walked off. I don't work those late nights anymore. So this just happened a few hours ago. I am a recruiter for a big company and I was at an event today with a table set up to tell people about job opportunities at my company. Everything was going great at first. People are taking my flyers and asking questions. Then this guy that works for the same company I do but out in the different center, walks up to me and starts off pretty normal. We're talking about how he's a driver. Mind you, I don't know this man at all. Then everything went downhill. He pulls out his phone and shows me a picture of myself from a few hours before because my hair was down in the photo, but I had put it up very early after arriving. To make it clear, in the photo I wasn't aware that I was having my picture taken. It also creeped me out because he said he sent my photo to a few of his friends because he thought it was funny that our company had a hiring fair. I was very uncomfortable, needless to say, but didn't know what to do because I was at the event by myself. I quickly ended that conversation. 
Five minutes after I was sure he walked away, I packed up my table and supplies and left. I informed my employer of what happened after I left because I was so freaked out. Unfortunately, I didn't get the man's name, but my supervisor is going to see what he can do because I know his office and position. I don't think anything is going to be done about it, but I reported it in the hopes that maybe my supervisor will have two recruiters at events rather than having me alone. So me, 38 female, and my girlfriend, 27 female, used to clean banks for extra money and we always had to wait for the banks to close and all the tellers to go home for the evening before we could begin cleaning. Well, one night, we ate a big Mexican dinner and fell asleep at home afterwards, waiting on the tellers to go home. I woke up at like midnight and realized that we hadn't gone to clean the bank yet. We darted up and out the door and headed to the bank. We had the bank codes to get in and out and to disarm the alarms, so it didn't really matter what time we cleaned them as long as they were done before the tellers arrived back in the morning. Well, we cleaned the bank and we're all done, so we grab the trash and head to the dumpsters after we lock back up. The dumpster is located in the dark alley behind the bank, but there was never anyone out there ever. I was in front of my girlfriend, so I threw my bag of trash in the dumpster, then turned around to walk back to the car while she was throwing her bag into the dumpster. Here comes the scary part. As I'm turning around to walk back to our car, which is located by the bank door at the end of the alley, I am frozen in fear. I mean, I have been in some pretty scary situations in my life and have never ever felt terror like this. At the end of the alley is a tall man wearing a dress and a blonde wig and wielding a machete. Not just wielding it, whatever that means, but twirling it around his fingers, legs standing far apart, ready to go into attack mode. I remember being frozen with fear, thinking to myself, this is it, this is how and where I'm going to die. My girlfriend is still throwing her trash into the dumpster and hadn't seen him yet, so I turn and scream for her but no words would come out. She eventually turned around and met my terrified stare and looked past me at the man. She was scared too, but in her tough girl voice, managed to shriek out, Can we help you with something? He didn't respond, just kept twirling the machete. She screams this time and says, You better get the fuck out of here now, because I'm calling 911, and we will fight you to the death until they come. He laughed this eerie, crackling laugh, and walked away. I dread thinking about what he would have done to us had either of us been alone that night, which sometimes we did if the other one isn't feeling well or was too tired to go. I work overnights as a janitor at this old abandoned gym that has been converted into a construction office storage unit. So tonight I was working, and about 20 minutes or so into my shift, I hear a loud bang sound. It startles me a little bit, and I think nothing of it since it's storming really bad outside. I hear it again, and glass breaks at the same time. I follow the noises and hear more loud banging, and some screaming. I get closer, and I am led to a window in the back of the building. Then I look outside, and see that someone's outside the window. The windows are triple layered glass and one way mirrors as well. He continues to hit the glass with a chunk of concrete and the glass starts chipping in square pieces. He screams some more and manages to get through the first layer of glass. He gets pissed off once he realizes there's more glass. I tell him stop and leave or I'm calling the police. Then he starts threatening me saying something along the lines of I'll bite your kneecaps off. So I finally get the cops on the phone and tell them what's going on. I was waiting by the window with this big ass wrench in my hand, ready to swing if he manages to get inside. Not even a few minutes later the cops finally show up and they have their guns pointed at him. They get him cuffed and he tells them some wild ass story saying that he owns this place and lost his keys.
So I work at a deli counter. This tall and intimidating man walks up. He looks like he's fresh out of prison. He asks for some baked chicken. We're all out. So I say sorry in my cheery customer service voice. I'm so sorry, but we're out at the moment. He responds with leaning in and quietly but sternly said, that makes me so fucking mad. I almost can't stand it. Um, huge red flag. I can tell that this guy wants anything to set him off. So again, I tried killing him with kindness because he was starting to scare me. I say, I'm sorry about that, but we have some fried chicken left. I don't want any of that dry ass shit. We have a fresh batch coming out in five minutes. Would that work? He says, fine, and then proceeds to pace back and forth in front of my department, menacingly. When the chicken comes up, I half jokingly tell the fryer, make sure the temp's out because this man will come back and shoot up the store. While I pack up his food, I try to make small talk and I'm being really nice to him. I've worked customer service for 15 years, so I was laying it on thick. I just didn't want anything to set him off. He thanked me and left. I told security and the lead clerks about him as well. Now the effed up part. A few days later, my lead clerk told me that the same man was arrested for pulling out an AK-47 on someone that same night, just a few blocks away. Fast forward a few weeks, I have no idea how he served such little time. He comes back in. My heart drops. I immediately go to help him as I had a new hire on and my coworker was really young. 18 a male. I didn't want them to say anything wrong. This time he's all smiles and jokes and super sweet. It was a complete 180. After I serve him he says, you know, the last time you helped me I was in a bad place. I was looking for trouble. You were the only person that was so kind and helped me calm down. It stopped me from doing something really stupid in the store. I was like, yeah, I know. You really scared me, man, but I guess it didn't entirely stop you from doing a stupid thing. And we both laughed about it because he knew I knew about what happened later. He comes in every so often. Security keeps an eye on him at all times. But the last time he came in, this motherfucker has the audacity to ask me out. I fucking hate it here. In July 2014, I got a job at a meat shop in a grocery store. I had no experience at all, but they hired me because they were desperate for help, and I took it because I was desperate for a job. I didn't care what kind of job I had to work, or how hard it was, because my wife was pregnant and the baby was due in October. I probably would have never even thought to apply at a meat department, but my sister-in-law worked in the office and told me to apply. The next day, I get a call to come in for an interview and a drug test. I did and was hired that day. The person from corporate, we'll call him Carl, started showing me the meat shop and telling me my job duties. While doing so, the meat cutter I've known since high school, who was friends with my older brother, we'll call him Steven, was showing my new manager Mike. We will use Mike's real name because I'm leaving a link to a news article which tells the name I'm not protecting this creep. Anyway, Steven was showing Mike how to clean a saw. I started the next day and everything went okay. It was all of us in the shop, including Carl. He was only there to help us out until I got the hang of my new job and Mike got the hang of his. Mike said he had experience, which he did work in a meat shop before, but he was really awful at his job. His cuts of meat were unidentifiable and he did anything he could to get out early. He didn't get real bad until Carl left about two weeks later to take care of other shops. Carl still popped in every now and then and always checked out the shop on his way home. Anyway, Mike creeped me out on his looks alone. Also, it didn't help on my first day. It was just me and him near the end of the shift and he was teaching me how to put the tenderizer back together after cleaning it. He said, just like sticking a dick in a pussy. Like I said, I thought he was creepy, but I was afraid to say anything because everyone liked him and I didn't want to lose my job. A few times I was going to because anytime he messed up something, he blamed me. 
About two weeks in, Stephen was telling me how much he disliked him when we were on our way to the front to clock out, and I was relieved and said, Oh, thank God. I thought I was the only one who thought he was creepy. Stephen then talked about how much Mike sucked at his job and assured me that him and Carl talk every day and they know I'm not messing up. They know it's Mike doing it. A few more weeks pass by and on days when it's just me and Steven, he fills me in on other stuff Mike did while I was off. The one that freaked Steven out was, he said he swore he saw Mike staring at a 12 year old girl's ass as she walked up the aisles. Anytime he would try telling someone, they would say he was bullying Mike or misunderstood something, that kind of stuff. A few weeks later, Stephen, who lives on the farm, fell off the barn and split his ass cheeks open. He didn't go to the doctor or anything, he just bandaged it up himself and moved on. He was telling us at work only because he had to go on break to change his bandages. When he came back in the room, Mike asked where he had discarded the bandages and Steven said, in the bathroom trash, with the eyebrow raised, wondering why in the hell that was so important. Mike yelled out, I want to see, and went through the trash with his bare hands to find the bandages. A few days later, Steven and Mike had to go to a meeting at the store in the next town over. They took separate vehicles, of course, but Steven said Mike was following him everywhere. Steven kept taking the back roads trying to lose Mike so he could change his bandages, but Mike kept following. He started to change them, and just then, Mike pulled up beside him with a huge grin, rolling down his window and asked, What are you doing? Steven was so pissed and told Mike, I'm trying to change my damn bandages, and I guess started cussing Mike out, and Mike took off. Fast forward about a year later, Mike has been in trouble over and over again and Carl met Mike at the front doors before opening and sent him to another store two counties over, a place Mike didn't want to go. Steven and I think it's because people know him there and know how he was. Mike told Tall Tales was a pervert and just downright disgusting. Steven became the manager and everything was normal for once and clean. Carl stopped by the shop one day and informed us that Mike was missing. He went on vacation and never came back. A few days later, Stephen texted me on my day off saying to look up Mike's name on Google because Carl had told him to do the same. I did, and well, there's this. We don't know if he's still in jail or what. I hope so. From 1989 to 1993, I was the key holder for a local family-owned bakery located in a sketchy neighborhood in my hometown. My job called for me to arrive at 2 a.m. by myself, get the ovens and machinery started, and get the first batch of dough mixing. The initial mix needed to proof for about 30 minutes before I could start feeding it through the scowler, so I'd be able to relax during this half hour. I would generally sit in the front room of the bakery which was where we always kept pallets of flour, stacked one or two high, a few unused machines, and a long winded bench along the wall. This room, which was about 35 feet by 35 feet, was lit only by whatever light was coming through the door, leading to the bakery proper, as well as the illumination of the street lights, which spilled in via the front door windows. This meant only about one quarter of the room, the quarter with the long bench of the wall, had any light. The remainder of the room quietly faded into darkness. The feeling hit me within one or two minutes of sitting down. I was being watched. I knew I was being watched. Those of you who have ever had this feeling know how palpable this is. Because of the hour in the neighborhood, I religiously locked the front door behind me upon arrival, so I knew someone couldn't have entered the room and hidden there while I was occupied in the bakery. After stewing in my own paranoia for a few minutes, I happened to gaze in the darkened corner of the room. That's when I saw them. Two eyes, just visible through the blackness, looking directly at me. I shot to my feet, my heart pounding. The eyes disappeared with a clatter, as whoever, or whatever this was, has jarred something in its attempt to remain concealed. I stood motionless for a moment, and then I heard footsteps, but clearly not human footfalls. They were soft, 
being produced by something that had more than two legs and weighed a whole lot less. Something passing through the lighted area of the room caught my attention and then I swiveled my head to get a look. It was a possum. Not sure which one of us was more shaken up at this point, but I either grabbed the broom or a piece of wood. The memory's a bit hazy here and arm myself, hoping that I wouldn't have to fight off this rabid animal. The creature scurried under a wooden incline which led to our freezers, an area I couldn't readily access. I banged on the incline several times, getting no response. After a few minutes without any traces of activity, I called it a draw and got back to baking. Later that day, a dead possum turned up in our parking area. Its neck had been torn out. If I had to guess, I'd say it messed with the wrong neighborhood dog. In any event, we never found out exactly how that stealthy possum accessed our flower area, and there was never another incident of that sort. So I work at a retail store as a cashier, and a few weeks ago I had an older couple, late 30s, early 40s, come in. It was around 9.40pm and the store was practically empty. This lady comes up to me to exchange an item, and in the middle of the transaction, a dude comes up and stands next to her. He also has an exchange that I have to call my manager to approve. She approves it and leaves. While I'm exchanging what they bought, the lady says, Your eyelashes are really pretty. I wear big falsies. I thank her because it's pretty chill and nice, you know. But then the dude follows up with, Yeah, isn't she pretty too? And she agrees. I'm a little weirded out by it, but I thank them again. The man asks, So when do you get off work? Even if it was just sarcastic and a weird version of a compliment, what are you supposed to say to that? I just asked him if he had a rewards card, and he chuckles and makes another comment about me not answering his question. I ignore him and tell him his total. When they leave, I'm low-key freaking out. I was scheduled to get off at 10, and our parking lot is mad sketch. It's huge, with one light in the middle of the lot. Now I park under the light because that's the safest, but it's a terrifying long walk to it. We also have zero cameras. The only co-worker at the registers was too far to hear the exchange, and no other customers were around. Now I'm debating asking my manager for someone to walk me out. I'm female, 17. But I've always told myself that I'd never be at risk at being attacked as I'm 5'11 and 245 pounds with linebacker shoulders. I also frequently got confused for a 20 something year old. Just adding onto the idea in my head that I'm too threatening to try. But sitting at the register thinking, I realized just because the man was 5'8 and the girlfriend was 5'4 doesn't mean they don't know a 6'2 bitch or a few other bitches to face me. I broke and walking to my manager to come see me, and I explained to her what happened. At first I just told her the guy was being weird because I thought she would believe me more. But then she informed me she had helped them in the store, and the girl referred to the guy as her boyfriend. I then told her how she was also being weird, and she agreed to walk me out. At the end of my shift I had a mini panic attack in the break room, and my manager, plus one of the coworkers, walked me to my car. Painfully awkward because I felt so dumb as no one was out there. Okay, so for a little bit of background, I used to work at a drive-up cafe shop that sells coffee and snacks like bagels and muffins. I live in a relatively small town and I never had anything happen like this before, so I was pretty shaken up. So it was a Sunday night and I was closing all by myself for the first time ever, being a new hire. And it was getting kind of late and virtually no one was coming through. So I just did some closing activities like sweeping and mopping. This is important because we stored the mop and the broom in a separate room that can only be accessed by going outside and unlocking the room with a key. So I had the employee entrance unlocked since I was going in and out. It was starting to get dark and I'm due to leave in about an hour when this old Ford drives up. The driver was an older man, maybe 40s or so. I wasn't too phased by it because a lot of people work on the oil rigs in my town 
and if they're on the night shift, they'll stop by for a pick-me-up before making the three-hour drive out to the rigs. I opened my window, asked him what he'd like to order. This is where it gets weird. He didn't order any coffee or food. No. He asked me, Are you working alone? I most certainly was working alone, and even both of my managers were no longer in the neighboring pawn shop that they also owned, and this just makes my blood run cold. Thankfully, I'm smart enough to lie with a response. Oh no, my coworker will be back in a second, and my manager is coming here in about five minutes. He needs to take inventory. At this point, the man looks past me into the shop, directly at the crack door behind me, and gives me a really creepy smile before pulling forward and signaling to turn down the road that goes right next to the open door. As soon as he could no longer see me, I jump over, slam the door shut, and lock the doorknob and the deadbolt. I was worried to leave the building that night because I didn't want to walk across a parking lot to my car. I thought he might be lingering around the area, waiting for me to get off work. I'm really glad that I never told him that I was working by myself. That was the creepiest encounter I've ever had at work. I live in Atlanta. About a month ago, a woman was walking her dog at a nearby park and was stabbed and mutilated along with her pit bull. The brutality shocked the city to the core and has everyone on edge. Add that to another young woman who was followed home from a gas station after leaving work as a bartender and was kidnapped and murdered. This means we had a whole bunch of scared women in the city. Anyway, I worked very close to the park where the woman and the dog were killed and I've been extra careful since it happened. Last night I was working alone and I had scheduled a new client for a 5 p.m. appointment thinking I'd be done around 7, 7.15 at the latest. However, she needed some extra work done so it wasn't until after 8.30 by the time I walked her outside to her car. We stood talking in the parking lot for a couple minutes before she got into her car. Here I should add that the parking lot is small and fairly secluded because of a large hedgerow and a retaining wall. After I made sure she was safely in her car, I went back into the salon and locked the door behind me with the intention of cleaning up and locking up. I was inside for maybe less than 10 seconds before I turned around and saw a man pulling on the door. There had been no one in the parking lot that I could see and there were no other cars other than mine and my clients. The guy appeared out of nowhere. As I said, I'm already on edge so I just stood there for a second, not sure what to do. He stood there staring at me with his hand still on the door handle. Finally, I walked up to the door. It's a glass door so I could see him and he could see me. I said, what's up? I could see that he was surprised that I didn't just unlock the door and open it for him. And he stuttered a couple times before pointing out the hair product on the wall, saying, uh, oh, I just wanted to buy some of that makeup over there. This is when I notice, one, he's got a pretty good black eye, two, he was wearing a fairly large surgical mask outside alone, which made me think he was trying to hide his identity. I told him that's not even makeup, that's hair products because this is a hair salon and we're closed. Then I turn off all the lights in the front of the salon and walk towards the back wall to hit those lights as well. Once I had all the lights out, I could see him, but he could no longer see me. I watched him because I didn't want to go out right after that. He ended up pacing back and forth at the front door for a couple minutes and then walked to the upper part of the parking lot above the retaining wall and stood there, half behind the tree and bush. He would stare at the salon door, then crouch down, then walk away all nonchalant, then come back to his hiding spot and stare at the door again. After watching him do this three or four times, I decided the next time he walked by, I would make a run for my car. As soon as he turned his back and started walking towards the direction of the park, I ran out, locked the door, and sprinted the 20 feet to my car in a full-on panic. Thank God for keyless entry. I had no idea what he was up to, or if he was really a serial killer. Probably not. Probably just someone trying to rob me. But what I do know is he definitely saw me in the parking lot talking to my client and I did not see him. I also know that if I hadn't locked the door, I would have had a much different night. There's no question in my mind that he was going to harm me in some way. As a side note, lots of people have asked me if he may have been homeless, and I absolutely don't think so. 
He was well dressed, his head was bicked, and while he definitely scared the crap out of me, he did not give off the desperate vibe that a lot of the homeless, mentally ill, addictive people I've encountered in the past do. Those people don't really scare me, mostly because I feel sad for them and try to help them in some way. The guy had every alarm in my body screaming at full volume. If you're coming to the A right now, maybe don't. To give context, I'm a 25 year old male. I started a job at a company that makes lenses for glasses and immediately I was introduced to Nate, an awkward guy around my age that seemed like he had good intentions. He was nice enough, but I figured most people humored him when it came to talking to him. I was convinced that he was on the spectrum in the realm of Asperger's. I had a friend in the past who had it and I didn't really mind. Besides, we seemed to like the same things including Dungeons and Dragons. My D&D group was very small and we wanted more people and knowing that he was into D&D, I invited him to come join. My now wife, then fiance, immediately grew uncomfortable when he came into our home to make his character and when it came to actually playing sessions, another girl at the table also expressed that she felt uncomfortable. I didn't feel great about it, so after three or four sessions, we kicked him out and continued playing but I still had to see him at work, which led to him always being sad around me, but I wasn't going to give in. Eventually, I kept telling him that I was starting up another group and that he could join one, yada yada yada. His pity party was starting to annoy me, so I said whatever to keep him at bay. One day at work, he had the day off and the following weekend. Not me or my coworkers saw this as strange, but then when Monday came, he didn't show up. Tuesday, no show. This is very unlike him, because he was practically a teacher's pet. Soon one of my co-workers was moving around the warehouse with a phone in her hand, stopping people and sharing the news. Nate had been arrested in North Dakota as he attempted to meet an underage girl for sex. We were all in disbelief because that's the first feeling that hits you. You don't want to believe that someone like that could live in your town, but worse, work right beside you. Indeed, he was in contact with a minor over the internet and they set to meet up in a park with the intentions of having sex. The police were tipped off as a teacher happened to see one of the messages on the girl's phone. I nearly peeked when I heard the news. He was in my home and made comments about my kids being so cute, especially my daughter, which definitely made me more sick. He would talk to me sometimes about wanting a girlfriend and that he was just waiting for the right one to come along. Someone in his church group and it now scares me to think about how old this girl was. One of my best friends at work mentioned that he went to install the washer and dryer at Nate's house, and when he was looking around, he was yelled at by Nate not to go upstairs. Not in a, oh, that's my room, and I prefer no one to go up there type of vibe. More like, there's something up there, and I don't want you to see it type of vibe. He was arrested and is in prison, and remains there to this day. Just to show you that you can't really know everybody, and that's what's truly scary. Hello, I'm a woman, and basically that's all you need to know to understand how something like this could happen. In 2017, a guy wrote me on Facebook. He told me that he used to go to the same swimming class. He told me a story about how we met, and I didn't remember the story, but not the guy told me how he looks now, but he had no pictures, so I didn't know. He gave me the most basic feature, brown hair, not muscular, but not thin or fat, brown eyes, relatively tall. This literally could have been anyone in my country. I told him I remember the story, and I didn't think much of it. He told me about a girl he was going to class with, and I told him I know her. That was basically our first convo. I tend to barely reply when I'm not interested to let them down easy. He wrote me half a year later that he saw my speech on YouTube. He asked a few things about it. I answered as little as possible and he stopped texting again. Then for a whole year, nothing, and I forgot about it. He wrote me in late 2018 asking, Did I see you in the supermarket today? I was a bit creeped out because I did go to the supermarket, so I lied and said, no, I wasn't there today. So three years later, he wrote me, I randomly thought of you today. 
Hi. I said hi. How are you? I'm fine, working. I was actually ending work, but yeah. Oh, as of right now, or just in general? Both. Cool. And what's up with school? I'm in uni. Wow, which? I didn't tell him the city, or which specific training, but it's on my Facebook. Wow, cool. You like it? Yeah, my boyfriend lives nearby, so it makes it easy. This was my way of forcefully letting him know that I was dating. He casually chatted a bit more, then he stopped again. I thought I was done for another four years. He didn't bother me, more like annoyed me. I gave him clear signs of no, and I didn't think he wouldn't understand. Well, he didn't. Today I'm at work, and thank God I work with tons of people, and my boyfriend was there too. I suddenly see a guy around my age, just standing at the fence watching me. At first I think nothing of it, but he stares at me for 40 minutes. I'm finally done with my class and go up to my boyfriend and guy friend, telling them both that I think it's the same guy that has been texting me. They say it probably isn't, but then we all see him changing positions outside the fence so that he can see me better. There was a bush in the way. He got in his car after an hour staring. He left the doors open and kept sitting in his car for another half hour. My boyfriend said that he would park right next to the gate when I'm done, so he can't approach me. Luckily, he left before we finished, but I'm terrified to think that he would be following me, even though I don't remember him too well. I'm a 20-year-old female that works at a home improvement store. My coworker, who also happens to be my team lead, is a mother of two children and married. This is important and comes into play later on. We were in the self-checkout area. She is fixing one of the registers. The register she was working on put her with her back facing towards the customers. Nothing weird happened at first and I was doing my normal rounds. Then this old dude comes up to the register I had just cleaned so I greeted him and he did the same. This guy must have been in his 50s. He started scanning his stuff, and I noticed one of his items had a security tag on it, so I went to grab the magnet. As I'm walking towards him, I casually mention that I have to take the tag off, and he doesn't really say anything, and just nods. I start striking up a conversation with him. The guy is answering, but he's not looking directly at me. His eyes are fixed behind me. I thought the guy was just zoning out. When he sees that I notice, he quickly looks at me, and continues the conversation but it's pretty obvious that he's forcing it. Anyway, I took the magnet off and went to return it. I come back around to do my rounds when I noticed the same guy was still there and that he had changed the way he was facing. He was folding the receipt, but I could see his eyes were staring at something in front. It didn't hit me at first until I turned to see what he was looking at. He was staring at my team lead, well more specifically, a certain part of her. She was bent down to lock up the register I felt my stomach drop and suddenly had the urge to throw up. I turned my back to the guy and noticed he had pulled out his phone. Before he had a chance to do anything, I walked up to him and asked him if he needed help with anything. In a low voice he says, Yeah, can you help me get a piece of that beauty over there? Without thinking much I said, I'm sure her husband thinks she's beautiful as well. After that he stares at me blankly and says, He doesn't have to know with this predatory look in his eyes. By this point, I'm not even disgusted anymore, just livid. In a loud voice I say, thank you for shopping with us, have a great day. At the sudden raise of my voice, a few people turned around and that was enough for him to take off in a hurry. My team lead hugged me after I told her what happened. So creepy checkout dude, I hope we never see you again. Years ago, I worked at a natural food store. I started there within a year of graduating from my first college and was trying to get a handle on working a regular job and paying for my own apartment by myself. Working in the store was alright and it became better as I was allowed to work in the grocery department which gave me more freedom to move around the store and a wider variety of tasks to perform. Periodically through the day, I would circulate through the stock room to check on our receiver to see if there was any new stock to put away. At times, independent local vendor representatives would drive up to the loading dock and bring the products that we ordered and needed to check in. 
For some reason, I crossed paths with one of the vendor reps from a local bakery, and any time he was in the building, his attention would snap onto me. At first, I thought nothing of it. He usually was giving out prepackaged samples of new products to hand out in the store, and he would usually give me a couple even though I had no authority to order things. I just thought, oh cool, free snacks. In case anyone has alarm bells going off because I was getting food from a stranger, this was a trusted vendor that had been at the store for years and years, and the baked goods samples were packaged where they were made. So they were the same safety and quality as if you had gone to the store and bought the full size products. I had no reason to be afraid. So it continued off and on for a couple months. Eventually, the guy started asking me seemingly innocuous questions that were dispersed far enough apart that my naive brain didn't feel the need to put up my guard. He asked me things about like what car I drove and did I like it. He would cover up for his questions by adding extra explanations such as he was thinking about getting a used car and was asking around for information. I told him I didn't have a car, which was true. I lived a few blocks away from the store at the time. After that, the guy wrote his number and his first name on a piece of paper, telling me I could call him if I ever needed a ride anywhere. I still didn't get it and thanked him politely, though I knew I would never take him up on that. Anywhere I needed to go, I could get there on a combination of buses and walking. I was very independent and didn't like to feel like I was inconveniencing anyone. One day I came to work as usual and went through the stock room. On the way to the time clock to punch in, the receiver rushed over and snatched me into a tight hug, telling me that she was so glad that I was okay. I thought she was just being funny, so I asked her what for. She told me that the former vendor rep, who seemed to be enamored with me, had gotten a girl to get into his car with him. Then he drove to her apartment, attacked her, assaulted her, beat her bloody, then set her apartment on fire, fleeing the scene. Luckily, the woman that was attacked was able to escape the burning building by climbing through a window. I became much more wary of acquaintances after that. I feel really fortunate to have never put my trust in this guy and gone anywhere with him. You never know with some people. I was a store manager of a nationwide mall computer gaming store. This is long before GameStop and cell phones. We were located on the left side facing the middle of the mall with JCPenney's to the left at the end. This detail plays into what happened. My ex-wife is a strikingly beautiful Latina woman. She was only 20 and my daughter was one and a half at the time. Unfortunately, fortunately for us, we had very beautiful babies. They almost looked like dolls. The reason why I say this is because my daughter attracted too much attention as a baby. We stopped going out in public because people were constantly approaching us and trying to touch her. It's a Sunday and I would work the whole day since it was a short day. The three of us would go to work and my ex-wife would dress our daughter up and herself to make a day of it. She liked to shop and wander for the day and come back to have lunch. Being a manager, I took long breaks as well. Everything is going fine, like any other Sunday. I go and give her some money, and my spidey street senses start going crazy. I look to my left and see a man intently looking at my wife and our daughter. I meet his gaze, and he doesn't look away. We had a huge wedding, 200 plus guests, so I asked my wife if she knew the person that was staring at her. We both look up, and he was gone. It couldn't have been more than two or three seconds since I last looked at him. There was something strange about him, I remember to this day. He was dressed in a dark gray suit and had a gray overcoat. Not to trouble her, I told her not to worry about it. We had lunch and we took the long way back to the store. We stopped by mall security. I introduced her to the security guys who had become good buddies. I pulled them aside and told them what happened. They were concerned. We both stepped into the booth and I'm telling the person working there to let me know if they see him. My ex-wife loves to shop at JCPenney's and goes shopping in the store. Before she goes in, I tell her about the man in the gray suit. She lets me know that she'll keep an eye out for him. There's a call on the store phone and the employee tells me it's the phone. And I'm like, yeah, I heard it ring. He tells me he needs some help. 
He pulls me aside and says, It's your wife. She sounds scared as hell. I jump onto the phone. She tells me that the man that I described had been following her for over half an hour. When he first showed up, she said he was reaching for our daughter. I immediately called security. They come up the middle with an employee standing and watch at the entrance of JCPenney. I go out the back to the parking garage, which was no more than 50 feet away. There's two ways to enter the store, front and back. Lots of emergency exits on the parking garage side. Luck would have it, a police officer had pulled someone over from the street and was in the front parking lot. By this point, I don't want the gentleman to go away. I want him caught. Everyone starts converging on the store. He's got nowhere to go. They walk to the station where my wife is surrounded by the store manager, several employees, and they have our baby behind the counter. The police officer had been alerted. Mall security escorts both of them out of the store to me. We put them in our car and they drive straight to her mother's. They continue to search the store, every nook and cranny. He was never found. To this day, I remember every detail, but the detail that sticks with me the most, his eyes were coal black. I'm a 22 year old female, and I used to be a cashier at Walmart. While this Walmart wasn't in a super sketchy area, Walmarts are just sketchy in general. When I worked there, from ages 18 to 21, I was in multiple areas. I was a cashier, customer service, and electronics, so I have plenty good Walmart stories besides creepy ones. This one, however, happened during the first few months there. At the time, I was just a cashier and hadn't cross-trained in other areas. It was a normal day and I was manning the self-checkout and basically just watching the clock. There was really nothing to do besides that, unless you were called over by a customer or being yelled at by someone. Suddenly, a man came up to me. He looked to be in his late 40s to mid 50s and was pretty rough looking. All the self checkouts were taken and he was the only straggler so I decided to ring his items out at my station and send him on his merry way. He only had a couple. I greeted him like I normally would and immediately he began to shower me with compliments. He said how pretty my smile was, how nice my voice was, and how it was a pleasure to meet another pretty woman. Of course, I was uncomfortable, but being a naive 18 year old, I just politely thanked him and continued the transaction. Then he started talking about all the ladies he had in his life, his many girlfriends. It went from that to, you could be one of those pretty ladies too. I'll treat you so nice, buy you anything you want, take you anywhere you want, you name it. I'll do it. I was silent out of shock and really creeped out. Again, this guy looked rough with a capital R. I know not to judge people, but this dude didn't look like what I imagined the sugar daddy would look like. Then he whipped out his phone. Let me show you pictures of my girls and how well they're taken care of. He then shifts to where he's beside me and shows me multiple photos of women, all of them posed on the bed in very provocative poses and revealing lingerie. He went on a tangent on how he could buy me nice things and how I could model it for him if I wanted to be one of his beauties. At this point, I wanted to throw up. I finally got some words out and said, Sir, this is really inappropriate. No thank you and have a nice day. He shrugged and then went to leave, but he just sat by the bench by one of the doors and just watched me for a while before he finally left. I called my manager over and explained the situation. She kind of yelled at me for a second, asking why I didn't call her over sooner, but eventually just had to AP do a sweep of the parking lot to make sure he still wasn't there. Apparently, trafficking had started to become an issue in the area because of how close to the highway it is. AP ended up walking me to my car, but since nothing illegal happened, there wasn't much to make a police report on, so they weren't called. I don't know if this was a trafficking attempt, or an attempt to coerce me into prostitution, but I never want to find out either way. I was working for the city of Fort Myers on March 23rd, 2007. Some wooded area across the street from us was being surveyed. When we came back from our lunch, we noticed a cop is there and she looks a bit disturbed and is calling for backup. She told us while we waited with her that the surveyor had called in and reported finding a skull 
so she came to check it out and found two more. By the time everything was done, they had found eight victims, all killed the same way, all skeletons from the mid-90s. I think they have identified five now, but other than a person of interest, the murders are unsolved to this day. My manager is creepy. I'm a 16 year old female and I work at a retail store. My manager is in his late 50s. There have been many things to lead up to this point. I've seen him snort white powder on multiple occasions. I've asked him about it and he says this is the anxiety medication. He calls me kiddo and trouble. He fist bumps me whenever I walk by and constantly asks me about my personal life. He has asked me how old I am multiple times. Yesterday I went to go check out some stuff I needed. He rang me up. My wallet shows the top of my ID so he looked at me and asked to see it. I didn't think and gave it to him. He looked at it for a good two minutes before saying, Ha nice. I've told my family about it and they are scared that he might stalk me considering he now knows my address. I'm beyond creeped out. My other coworker feels the same way too. I don't know what to do from here since the company doesn't have a corporate HR. When I was in high school, I worked a closing shift at a fast food restaurant five nights a week. There was this guy that came in a couple times and flirted with me, but I didn't pay him too much attention and just kept doing my job. One night after close, around 1am, I started walking home and I hear someone holler from behind me. Hey McDonald's girl. I ignored it and he hollered again. Hey McDonald's girl. And ran to catch up with me. It was the same guy. I was completely freaked out but didn't know what to do so I just kept walking and he just kept walking with me. I tried to make polite small talk but I was so scared. This was in the early 90s so no cell phones to call for help. I didn't know what to do so I just walked home. I turned off the street before mine. I have no idea if he continued to follow me undetected or not but I rushed to my house and I never saw him again after that. When I told my mom what happened, she started dropping her car off for me after her work was over and eventually got herself a new car so I could have her old one. So I got a new car out of the deal. Well, new to me at least. I'm interested in crime solving forensic TV shows. I worked in a hospital as a night charge nurse for years. I had a certain housekeeper that was male that was regularly assigned to my area. He was not particularly conscientious or good at his job. He often wore his work shirt unbuttoned with a dingy grayish hued white t-shirt underneath. He appeared to wear a hairpiece. He always seemed a bit off to me. He looked at everyone as if we could be insects he studied. I always treated him kindly just as I tried to treat everyone. I would often notice him secretly watching and listening to conversations of myself and other staff members from behind doors, around corners. He just seemed to lurk everywhere. I once mentioned this to another staff member who worked in the labs down the hall that he seemed like a serial killer to me and was spying on us constantly. The other staff member said, well first impressions are often correct. Once someone was talking about a negative girlfriend situation. And he went off saying how his girlfriend once made him so mad. Then his face contorted and demeanor seemed scary and super loud and menacing. Barely able to control himself. One day he approached me and asked me if I would submit a positive review about his work to his supervisor. So he could get a bonus. I said sure no problem. I submitted the positive review for him and he did get the bonus. My coworker asked... How could I do that when he's barely mediocre? I replied, I think he's a serial killer that just hasn't been found out yet. So I know when he picks his next victim, I've given him no reason to kill me. My story is not as scary, but it still weirded me out every night when I was working. I used to work night shifts at a small hotel, which was situated on the outskirts of the town I lived in. It was an old industrial site 
But they had built a lot of new stuff there, and there were no longer any factories. The whole area was a bit shady, and got quite dark there as well. The whole setting was already a bit creepy. Our hotel was small, and the staff changing rooms, showers, and toilets were situated basically in the basement. I hated to have to use those facilities, since I always got an uneasy feeling every time I went down there. It's hard to explain, but it's just an overall uncomfortable feeling. The toilets and showers are in the very back. To get to the toilet, I would have to pass the showers, which had shower curtains on them. Every time I would go past them, I was sure that I would hear a rustling and weird quiet sniffling noises coming from the showers. Sometimes the water was running on one of the shower boots, even though nobody was taking a shower. I had to always open the shower curtains on my way to the toilets since I hated the fact that they were closed and anything could be behind them. It was always nerve wracking to do so. Then I would run to the toilet as quick as I could and then run back upstairs. But every time I would go back downstairs, the curtains would be closed again, even though no one had been down there. It was generally creepy down there, and the more time I spent down there, the creepier it got. The feeling that something bad is going to happen if I spent more time down there than necessary. I tried to ask about this from my colleagues, but no one really knew anything about the building. But I was certainly not the only one that hated to use those bathrooms. I am happy I don't work there any longer. I can do my business in the toilet without rushing. I'm a female. Several years ago, I was about 19 and studying in college. During exam period, I would always go to the public library in the city center to study. They would have special places for students to study. This particular day, I had went there with a classmate. It was the weekend and I finished studying about 2 p.m. I asked my classmate if she would mind if I left. She said no, so I packed up my stuff and left the library. As I walked out of the library, I walked straight into the city center. As I left, I felt something brush up against me. Considering that I had just walked out of a quiet library into a crowded street, I brushed it off. I proceeded to walk through city center to get to my bus stop. After about 5 minutes of walking, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was way too close to me. So I grabbed my phone, held it up, and looked against the screen to see if someone was behind me. And that's when I saw a man, about 40, walking behind me with his eyes set on me. I felt uncomfortable because he was giving me the weird vibes. He just looked off. He was walking with a limp while staring right at me. He was wearing a scarf with a suit jacket, really old track pants, and old gym shoes. I didn't think he was homeless or a junkie, but he was just weird. But to be safe, I put my phone in my bag and put my bag over my other shoulder, away from him. That's when he walked up to me and started walking next to me. At this point, I had been walking for about 10 minutes through busy streets. He kept his eyes on me and was walking close to me, as if him and I were walking together. Once I almost made it to my bus stop, I saw my bus drive off. I didn't want to wait for another bus at that bus stop and have this man wait with me or know which bus I was taking. I decided to continue walking down to Central Station, which was about 8 minutes away. As I crossed the street, I noticed the man kept walking and didn't cross the street. I felt relieved and pulled out my phone to text my mom that some weirdo had been following me for about 15 minutes at that point. Not even a minute later, this man comes running out of the alleyway right in front of me. I almost tripped when I saw him, and he kept walking in front of me. Every 10 seconds, literally, I counted, he would abruptly turn his head and look back at me. I had even made a small Snapchat video of it. At this point, I was so nervous, but I was almost at the central station, so I just kept going. That's when he stopped, turned around, and started talking to me. I saw you at the library, he said. I didn't respond. We were together at the library, he repeated. Again, I ignored him. He didn't get the hint and kept talking. Hey, where are you going? Are you going to Central Station? I'm going there. I take the 312 bus. Which bus are you taking? At that point, I had enough. There were people walking by and nobody said anything. So I just ran to the Central Station and got on my bus. I sat behind the bus driver just in case the creep decided to run after me. I saw him looking around before getting on his bus. 
Once I was on the bus, I finally had a moment to think of what happened and realized that this man had been sitting there at the library, watching me for hours and watching me leave and went after me. I remember feeling uneasy the whole time, but I ignored the feeling, thinking it was just my nerves before the exams that were coming up. This experience really made me uncomfortable because I had been coming to this library to study for years. Even in high school, I would study there till 9 p.m. and leave by myself in the dark. I could only imagine what would have happened if I met him then. So psycho library stalker, let's not meet again. I'm a 27 year old female. I graduated from high school about 10 years ago. In my freshman year of high school, I was known to have a lot of friends. I was very friendly and every time I saw someone alone, I would greet them and offer them my friendship. Sometime during the year in my math class, we had a new guy. We'll call him Jose. Jose had recently moved to the US from Mexico and he hardly knew any English. Me being Hispanic, I was able to speak to him in Spanish and make him feel welcomed. Jose had no friends and always sat by himself. In math class, I started helping Jose a lot. He sat behind me and he would always play with my hair. I sort of felt like he had a crush on me and he was not bad looking, so I didn't look at it as a big deal. For a few months, two or three, he played with my hair. It became a norm. Towards the end of those months, he said that he wanted to play a game and asked me to write the things I loved most in my life. He would do the same and we could both share the papers. Of course, I wrote down my family, God, friends, and a whole bunch of other things. When I gave him back the list, he wanted specific names and he said he would do the same. I ended up writing my friends and family's names. One day, we were just hanging out in class and Jose said, Can I show you something? But you can't tell anyone or else you're going to pay for it. I was so confused and thought maybe he was going to ask me out. Jose pulled out a Ziploc bag and I couldn't really tell what was in the bag. It wasn't until he placed it on the table that I noticed it was a Ziploc bag full of hair. My hair. Jose pulled up his sleeve to show me his arms. He had about 10 heels from knife scars. Lines that he made with a blade that went down his arm. There was a fresh knife wound and he grabbed my hairs and placed them on top of the freshly opened wound from the night before and said, You are mine now. I know who you love, what you love. If you don't do as I say, you will pay for everything, anything and everything that happens from now on. Think of me. My heart sank. He started smirking. I ran out of the class crying. I ran to the office. Everyone was so confused. I asked to speak to the counselor immediately. I explained to her what had happened. Jose was pulled out of class, taken to the principal's office, and was expelled that day. I feared for my life. They found all these notes of other people in his backpack. Mine was there as well. They saw the scars and found my hair. I never heard of Jose again. I've had some pretty fucked up shit happen in my life after that, and I always think of Jose. I haven't talked about this in years, and I'm afraid that if I mention this, he will hear me and bad is to follow. After that, I got so close to God, closer than ever. Until this day, I don't know if Jose was just messing with me, but I will tell you that after that encounter, I am no longer that super friendly and open hearted person I once was. Back in high school, I went on an overnight trip for my art class. Before we had left for the trip, the teachers had assigned us our rooms with three other people to share with in a hotel that we were staying at. I lucked out and only had to share it with one other girl, who I didn't know very well. Let's call her Anna. Anna was the type of girl who never really talked in class, but when she did, it was always a weird comment under her breath. She always came to school wearing the same thing, a My Little Pony shirt and pajama pants. To be honest, I've never really seen her in any other outfit. Anyways, on the day of the trip when we first checked into our hotel, before going out to dinner, we hung out in our room for a while. I tried to make a bit of a friendly conversation with her, but she didn't seem to respond much. But I did hear her talking to herself for a few minutes after our initial conversation. I couldn't make out what she was saying though. Later that day, I was in a group with Anna and two other students from my class. 
After visiting the first art installation, we headed our way to the next one. As we were walking down the sidewalk having a casual conversation, Anna turns to me and says, If you get ran over by a car right now, I'd laugh my head off. And then all went silent. I had no idea how to respond to this, so I just brushed it off with a laugh, as if it never happened. A few hours had passed and we had stopped because one of the students in our group had saw a friend that he knew and decided to talk with them. As Anna and I waited on the side as they talked, she seemed really angry. She was pacing and sighing intentionally loud as if she was in a rush or something. She looked at me with the creepiest glare and said, I wish I could just throw myself off this balcony. Maybe then we would get somewhere and continued to pace around. At this point, I was very uncomfortable about being around her, so I tried to stick near the others for the rest of the time we spent out. Nearing the end of our trip, the two other students in the group decided to branch off and go to another exhibit while Anna and I met back at the hotel. We both got back on the bus and I sat near the back and she followed me. I was hoping to have a little bit of space, but she decided to sit right next to me. A few minutes passed and I noticed she looked at me for a good while without saying anything until she suddenly whispered to me, I really need to tell you a secret, but I want to wait until we get back to our room. At this point, I nodded and scooted away from her a little, towards the next seat, dreading when we got back to the hotel. When we got into our room, I headed straight to the bathroom to avoid talking to her, but she stopped me at the door, putting her arms out so I couldn't pass her. I want to tell you what I was going to say on the bus, she whispered to me. I felt a bad feeling in my stomach and awaited her next line. She leaned in closer and said, well, when we were on the bus, I wanted to tell you that my nipples were tingling a lot. It wouldn't stop, and it's still happening now. After she said that, I pushed past her into the bathroom and locked the door behind me. I was super freaked out and disturbed by her, so I hid in there for 30 minutes until she went to sleep. When I went to bed, I put a wall of pillows so she couldn't see me, and to be honest, I was up for a while shaking and wanting to leave the room. The next day when it was time to go home, I avoided her as much as possible, and thank god I never really saw much of her after that. Okay, so buckle up because this is gonna get weird. This isn't something unknown amongst my friends and the people local to me as I live in quite a small town. So in ninth grade, I would have been around 13 or 14. I had no friends. I was and still am kind of weird and it threw people off. Making friends in high school was difficult for me because I refused to change who I am just to fit in. During the second week of school, I met George in my English class. Our teacher had sat us together so we began talking and building a friendship. George was very nice and we had a lot in common. He had came from a different elementary school. It was odd because the people from his elementary commonly went to a different high school. Although he insisted that he wanted to go to this high school because there were certain classes he wanted to take that the other school didn't offer. After about a week of talking together during English, he asked if I wanted to eat lunch with him. We had the same lunch period and he said how he noticed how often I sat alone. I thought it was a nice gesture, so I agreed. We ended up having lunch together for a while, but then I started making some new friends. I always invited him to eat lunch with a few of the friends I had made, but he always declined. Then one day in English class, he passed me a note. This was very strange since we were sitting right next to each other. The note said something like, I need to talk to you. Can we please sit alone together for lunch? I wrote back that I would sit with him, and we hardly spoke for the rest of the period. I got a really strange vibe from him. So at lunchtime, I see him sitting at the end of the row. Our cafeteria consisted of a large harvest tables and benches. It was not separate chairs and tables like you see in restaurants, but rather a long, long table with benches on either side. I go to sit down and he says, No, let's go outside to talk. So I agree. He looked generally upset and I wanted to know what was going on. When we got outside, he led me over to sit on the curb in front of the school and started talking very aggressively. He told me that it was unfair of me to make other friends when he was the one who befriended me first. He told me I had to eat lunch with him because when I was alone, he ate lunch with me. 
So now that he was alone, I was obligated to eat with him. It was a very bizarre conversation. I explained that he could sit with me and my friends and that there wouldn't be any issues and that he could make some new friends. I told him I had enough friendship to spread around and that he had nothing to be upset about. What he said next completely shocked me. I could see the anger in his eyes. He grabbed my arm and said, I don't think you understand. You owe me this. You will sit with me. I got completely freaked out at that point and told him we could sit alone together every other day. I just wanted to get away from him and go back inside where more people were around. After that day, I started getting weird messages to my email. I never forgot the first email I was sent. It said, All women are Satan. The devil lives in you all. I didn't recognize the address and assumed it was just an internet troll trying to scare me. Then they started coming more frequently, all with the same message. Women are the devil. Satan lives in all women. I started getting scared, so I showed my friends these emails. They agreed it was weird, but also agreed that it was probably a random person trying to scare people. But my one friend Stacy told me that she thought it was George. She told me that she heard stories about why he came to our school instead of the high school that his 8th grade graduating class was going to. She told me that he was so obsessed with one of the girls in the class that her mom actually got a restraining order against him over that summer. I told her it sounded insane and I didn't believe it. I was still having lunch with George on alternate days and we were still friendly during English class, but I really wanted to distance myself from him. After Christmas break, our schedules changed for the second semester. I was honestly very happy about this because I knew I'd have a different lunch period than George and we wouldn't have English together anymore. I could slowly disassociate myself from him, but I was wrong. He started leaving me notes in my locker, confessing his undying love and explaining that we were meant to take the world over together, which at the time I thought was a very nice thing for him to say, but the feelings were not mutual. Eventually, I had to tell him that enough was enough. I explained that he was overwhelming me and that I needed a little space for my friendship. He seemed to understand. He didn't get upset or yell. He just agreed to give me space, which lasted about two days before the email started getting worse. He started threatening my life, telling me that he knew where I lived and went to school. I went straight to my mom when this started happening. I know I should have done it sooner. My mom called the police and the police informed the school. The school was able to look up the emails and their records and found out that it was George sending the nasty emails all along. George was suspended and wouldn't even look at me anymore. I was honestly relieved. One year later, after we graduated high school, George and his mother went for a drive. While she was driving, he stabbed her over a hundred times. He had a psychotic break. When police found him, he tried saying it was a car accident, but when they questioned him about the stab wounds, he admitted to killing her and trying to release the devil from his mother's soul. He pled insanity over the murder of his mother. He was eventually found not criminally responsible for her murder. So lately, I've been talking to my friend about stuff and we've been realizing how weird our school was. One story I have is perfect for the subreddit. So I was in my first or second year of high school. Our school was mainly populated by kids from tough backgrounds, poverty, homelessness, neglect of parents. So about once a quarter, our school would do something called potlatch, where teachers and students could essentially donate things that any of the students could grab and take home be it clothes, bedding, books, little knickknacks, whatever. What you need to know for this story though is how everyone got super hyped for the potlatch and would fill the main hall to see what there was, even if they weren't planning on taking anything. Our school also liked to invite representatives from different companies and organizations to hand out different flyers for whatever they worked for. Since a lot of kids were looking for opportunities to make money to either support themselves or their families. During one potlatch, this one guy, he was super nice, was handing out flyers for a gig that was too good to be true. The thing is, as I know now, something that's too good to be true usually is. 
Basically, they said they get to fly out to Seattle to live in an apartment that they owned, rent free, and all you had to do was be a door-to-door -door salesman for them, and they would pay you like $15 an hour. Some of you reading this probably already noticed the red flags, but we were dumb teenagers, and like the school invited them, we figured that the school wouldn't bring in something sketchy like that. I had just quit my job, and so this offer seemed awesome for the summer or something. However, almost immediately in the next period, we got an announcement basically telling us to throw away any flyers and not to, under any circumstances, call them. For those who didn't notice the red flags earlier, these guys were using common sex trafficking tactics. Basically, they offer a job that seems amazing, and if you bite, instead of sending you where they said they were, they would kidnap you and sell you. After doing minimal research, I found that the company that they were fronting was already a known sex trafficking front, and our school just invited them into the space with gullible teenagers. When I was 8 years old, I would walk a half a mile to school every day. Several times on my walk, a man would approach me and tell me how much God loved me and would ask me about taking Jesus into my heart. The guy gave me the creeps, but I was always polite since he was a grown up. One day he asked me for a hug and that was it for me. I ran home and told my mom about the guy. Needless to say, I was driven to school after that. A few months later, a girl at my school was molested by that guy. He was a minister at her church. I went to a Catholic school in the 2000s and we had this gym teacher named Coach Ricky. Now thinking back on everything, there were some giant red flags with this guy. But as a kid, you don't notice these things. First red flag, he would keep the boys and girls separated. All the other gym teachers never did that. Second red flag, he would pay more attention to the girls and practically ignore the guys. He would also get very angry if he saw one of the girls talking to one of the boys and that was the only time he would ever actually acknowledge the boys. He would also be adamant that the girls had to be exercising. Meanwhile, the boys could just sit around doing literally nothing. But if one of the girls was to sit down, even for a second, he would get really angry. I remember when I was diagnosed with a heart murmur and the doctor told me I couldn't exercise because of it. And when I told him that, he seemed irrationally irritated that I couldn't exercise anymore. So we left for Thanksgiving break and come back and the guy is just gone and when you would ask about him, they would act like they didn't know who you were talking about. So I asked my favorite teacher about it and she finally told me what happened. He apparently got caught watching the girls undress in the changing room and there was a rumor that he had tons of videos on it on his phone. My teacher didn't even know the whole story because my school kept it from the teachers and they didn't know whether or not the police were called because you never saw anything in the newspaper. I live in a small town so that would have definitely been a scandal. To this day I kind of wonder if he ever got anything of me. It makes my skin crawl thinking about it. I hope that bastard is in jail for what he did. So my sister, who was 14 at the time, was walking home from our local primary school with our German Shepherd. She starts noticing a black car doing laps, but assumes it's just a parent. She then, after a while, notices a man getting out of the car and getting into a white SUV and driving up the road closest to the side of the oval where she was. My sister starts getting a little creeped out, but walked around the other side and didn't think much of it still thinking it's apparent. Maybe about 15 minutes of the cars doing laps, she realizes that the two cars are parked on the two easiest streets to leave. My sister didn't bring her phone with her, and at this point, she was crying because there's two older men following her around to school and she can't contact anyone. She luckily finds a teacher and manages to contact my parents who come to pick her up. As soon as my parents get there, the two cars take off speeding in opposite directions before any number plates could be recorded. I hate to think what could have happened if she didn't have her dog with her and didn't notice.
When I was in high school, a friend of mine would walk to my house in the morning and walk to school with me. After school, we would wait for each other to finish our after school activities and then walk home together. One day in our sophomore year, he had to get home as soon as he could because he had to babysit his sister. My house was only a few blocks away, so I told him no problem. It was the first time he didn't walk with me all the way to my house. I noticed an SUV while him and I were saying goodbye because they slowed down while driving. My first thought was to go to his house until his mom got home. I shook off the feeling and decided that he slowed down because we were next to a park. I walked down the road by myself and the SUV drove by again, slowing down a lot. I bolted down a dirt road into a place with construction workers building a house. The SUV turned around and began slowly driving on the dirt road. The construction worker closest to me could have passed off as my dad. I told him what was up and he took me inside the house. He took out a notebook and jotted down the license plate number as the man slowly drove by, staring into the house. The construction worker walked me home after a half hour or so and he called the police to report it. Never told my mom, only ever told my friend about it. He didn't let me walk the rest of the way home alone again for the rest of our walking days. I never brush off my gut feelings anymore. I was about 8 years old and at the exit of my school, all the kids wait for their parents. I was waiting for my babysitter who would always pick me up about 5.30pm. I was a bit confused as my babysitter wasn't there. She was never late. But I did not panic, just kept patiently waiting. Suddenly, a woman in her 40s, long curly brown hair, with a disturbing smile expression, came up from a group of parents and said to me, Your mother sent me to pick you up. She clearly saw my confused face and thought I was an easy catch. I had never seen her in my life, and if such thing happened that she was picking me up, my mother would have let me know. All those thoughts passed through an 8-year-old's head in a few seconds. I responded, moving my head to the side in denial. She never stopped staring at me with that psycho expression and repeated the same thing. This time, slightly approaching me, ready to take my arm. Looking over her shoulder and other parents in the entrance, I noticed a black van parked, which I'd never seen before. I was always well aware of the cars that parked there because once I saw a Lambo and we were all waiting to see it again. At that age, I already realized that her tensions were not good and that the situation was way too strange. I didn't move an inch and said, no, again in a calm voice. The woman knew that she wouldn't be successful in her try. She knew that she couldn't take me by force because of all the other parents and some teachers were around. She didn't say another word. She took her eyes off of me and just stood there, looking for another child. A few minutes later, my babysitter arrived and I told her. She was very surprised and pissed but she didn't alert to school. At the time, I just thought about going home, but now, 16 years later, I think we should have told the school. I was aware of kids being kidnapped in my neighborhood, so I knew this could happen. I will never forget how that woman looked, and I hope that nothing ever happened to any of the kids at that school. I just rediscovered the subreddit, so I thought that I'd post a creepy encounter that one of my friends recently reminded me of. This creepy encounter was kind of prolonged and got especially creepy at the end. I was a fairly awkward and introverted teenage girl, so my high school guidance counselor encouraged me to take the theater elective in 10th grade to help me come out of my shell. The class was terrible and miserable. I hated every single second of it. But it did more than just take me out of my comfort zone. It introduced me to a really weird guy. I wouldn't say that I really thought this guy was a creep from the beginning. He had a fairly obvious crush on me, but he wasn't too weird about it. He wrote me the occasional note and asked me to one school dance. I told him no, and he took the rejection fairly well. He still tried to talk to me all the time, but he eventually started dating someone else and then left me alone. I assumed that the relationship lasted through 11th grade, as I only saw him occasionally and he never tried to talk to me. I went to the 12th grade homecoming dance with a group of my friends, 
and we actually spent a good portion of the night dancing and really enjoying ourselves. At one point, we sat down to rest and have a snack. The guy from the 10th grade theater class came over to me and sat at our table. He seemed upset and actually started crying, so I asked him if he was okay. He told me that his girlfriend had just dumped him, and I responded that that's pretty shitty of her to do at a high school dance. I guess he took this as me making a move on him because he immediately grabbed my arm, yanked me up from the table, and pulled me to a fairly secluded corner. He was immediately in my personal space, asking me if I would be his new date. I tried to push him away, but he had a pretty firm grip on me, and then tried to go in for the kiss. I was in total shock that this happened, and kind of froze. Luckily, one of my friends swooped in and told him that I was her date, so he should back off. He spent the rest of the evening dancing fairly close to us, but he luckily didn't say anything. Flash forward to the rest of 12th grade. I didn't have a class with him, but his locker was fairly close to mine, so I unfortunately saw him a lot. He stared at me a lot, but he didn't say much to me until right before graduation. He asked to sign my yearbook. I was afraid that he would say something weird in it, so I told him no. I did wish him good luck in life. He responded that I was what he would miss the most about high school. I kind of forgot that he existed until about three and a half years later. I was in college and got a message from someone asking me if I knew him and when we had last spoken. Apparently she was his girlfriend. I had told her that we had gone to high school together and hadn't spoken to him since we graduated. She asked me why he talked about me all the time. I told her honestly I had no idea because we weren't even friends on social media. Then she asked me why she found my first and last name in his wallet. I was incredibly confused by this and asked her what she meant. She told me that she was going through his wallet and she found my first and last name on a piece of paper. She said he'd said that I must have stuck it in his wallet as a joke when we were hanging out, which obviously never happened. I think she was expecting me to confess that he was cheating with me or something, but all it did was freak me the fuck out. I found him on social media and blocked him, then blocked her too for good measure. Luckily, I haven't heard from him since, and this was about 11 years ago, but I have to wonder why he had my name in his wallet. As a side note, he was on the local news just a week or so later because his dad met someone online and then locked her in the basement for a weekend. He was defending his dad and calling the woman a liar. I'm pretty sure that his dad wound up in prison for kidnapping and criminal confinement, so the apple didn't fall too far from the creep tree. So another post reminded me of this man. I'm a female. When I was in high school, I was always in advanced math, which meant calculus 1, calculus 2, and other math classes, but I don't remember the subject. So for all three years of high school, I had this man as a teacher. If a female had a question, he would sit as close as possible, as in thigh touching thigh, with his hand on their neck. If a male had a question, he bent over the top of their desk, not touching at all. This creeped me out. At the time, 1990s, there had been a satanic panic in the United States where a bunch of kid educators were fired for rumors. At this time, everything was bouncing back so that the educator was now automatically believed over any child. As I said, I was 15 or 16 when I first met him and 18 when I had my last class with him. I don't know what prompted me to tell my mom about this man's inappropriateness. I just knew I had to tell someone because he was super creepy. I will never forget my mom's reaction. Don't you ever say that about him. He's a good man who lives with his elderly mother and volunteers to teach migrant farmers children. I learned that my mother would believe an adult pedophile over her daughter. I never shared any of my feelings about strange kids or adults ever again. To be honest, this grown-ass man had too much control over a bunch of kids who may not have spoken English very well. 
and the fact that he never dated or moved away from his mom creeped me the hell out. I never heard of him actually touching a kid, but I also wouldn't be surprised. When I was in 7th grade, I had an older English teacher whom my parents worked with a long time ago. So at first, I thought that was pretty cool and I was super friendly with him. For my first year, he'd always bring me candy, give me extra work when I asked for it. I like to study so I'm not nervous about exams. He would let me and my friends have lunch with him in the classroom. After a while of this, my friends started teasing me saying that I had a crush on him. They would do that joke a lot in class. I don't know if he heard because he started being even more friendly. I told my friends to stop, but they were very toxic, so they didn't listen. One winter night, it was really dark outside and my dad had a very important meeting, so he had to pick me up about 5 p.m. I didn't take that bus that day because I went to after school activities and music. So I was just sitting there on the bench by the door, playing some game on my phone. He came out of the nearby hallway and said, Hey, why are you at school so late? Because of my friends teasing me, I didn't want to talk to him, so I just said that I was waiting for my dad. Then he proceeded to offer me a ride home, since it was obviously getting late. I said no, and he kept insisting. I got annoyed and he eventually left. I did tell my dad, and he was just glad I didn't accept. After that, he stopped being nice to me and just became very cold. I didn't care though, and the next year, I didn't see him again. I don't know if that was creepy or not, but it generally made me feel like he was grooming me. Plus, I was only 12, I'm 16 now, and I don't know if I was being weird because of my friends or if he was actually creepy. I recently saw a post on TikTok that made me think back to this creepy male sub I had in middle school. I was 12 or 13 at the time and attending class with one other kid. It was a computer class and we sat on opposite sides of the rows of computers. This young male substitute teacher was helping the other kid and when he was done he asked me if I needed help with anything. I politely said no because I knew what I was doing at the moment. He didn't like the answer and insisted that he should come help me. I kept declining and let him know that the other kid needs his help. He ignored me and sat down next to me. He sat so close that his thigh touched mine. I kept inching away from him, but he kept moving closer. This went on for 45 minutes until the bell rang. At the end of class, it was my teacher's policy that we get candy if we passed all the tests that day. I hadn't passed any due to the lack of focus on my work because of the creeper touching my thigh. Anyway, he let the kid, male student, have candy for his past test, then offered me some. I informed him that I hadn't passed any tests, so I didn't get any. He said he wouldn't tell if I did, and kept insisting that I wanted candy. The other student had already left, so to avoid being alone with him, I took my shot and ran out of the room when some kids were passing. I later told a teacher I trusted whose classroom was down the hallway. He had already had his eye on the sub and walked me to and from class in that hall for the whole week the sub was there. Thankfully never had that sub in my class again. Writing about my old poetry teacher it reminded me of all the weird interactions I've had with teachers growing up. This one is probably the creepiest, which is why I probably blocked it out of my memory for so long. The memories are a little fuzzy, honestly. When I was in second or third grade, my music teacher went on maternity leave, so we had a sub for a semester. He was a large man, but kind of had a gentle giant vibe, or that's what my kid brain called it. I loved his classes. He talked about how music can make us feel and affect emotions. I always raised my hand when he asked questions or wanted a volunteer. I remember there was a turning point, but I don't remember what it was. I remember that he started singling me out. 
He would talk to me before class as everyone was sitting down. He would pick me every time I raised my hand to pass out papers. He always picked me first when questions were asked. As a kid, I loved the attention. My older sisters are triplets, so his attention made me feel special even though I wasn't a multiple. We would always walk together during fire alarms or when we walked down the hall. I was always the last person so he could walk beside me and talk. I started talking about him to my mom. I remember she was weirded out by it, but he never touched me and he wasn't going to be there forever so she just kept an eye on the situation. Eventually I started getting weirded out by it. I was picked to pass out papers and all my classmates groaned. One even said, you only ever pick her, no one else gets to pass out papers. And that's when I started getting uncomfortable. I really was the only person he picked or talked to directly. I stopped raising my hand and he would still pick me. I stopped answering questions, but he would still ask me first. I wouldn't openly talk when he walked beside me between classes either. For a while, I thought he was paying attention to me because my dad had a well-known music store in the area and it had been a staple of the city for more than 100 years but he never asked me about my dad or his business. Eventually, my mother had enough and talked to the main teacher. She told her that he needed to back off and that his attention made me and her uncomfortable. But he didn't stop. If anything, I remember him making more of an effort to talk to me. He would ask me if I could hear music and the fire alarms and he said that maybe I was uncomfortable because I wasn't used to being special. He hugged me after the last one, and I just stood stock still until he let me go. Eventually, it was Christmas, and he was going to be gone after the Christmas play. I had done everything to distance myself from him, but nothing worked. I was relieved that I wouldn't see him after Christmas break. At the end of the play, he came and introduced himself to my parents. He told them how special I was, and that I was amazing and a helpful student. He offered to tutor me privately. Obviously my mother said no, but my dad didn't think anything of it and just thought he was a nice guy. Seeing as my dad is also creepy, it makes sense now that he saw nothing wrong with the man's behavior. For a good five years after that, he would write me letters and send me Christmas cards. He would ask to see me or for me to write back. I still don't know how he had my address. My mom used to open them and read them but something about them eventually made her start throwing them away as soon as we got them. Then after a year of no responses, he stopped writing. Now that I'm older, I realize that I'm probably too old for him to be interested anymore. I don't remember his name, but I remember his face and creepy hug. I was an 18 year old female at the time and a first year college student working full time and taking 18 units of college classes. My parents paid all my school expenses and they did not want me to work. They hoped that I would just concentrate on my studies, but I worked anyway. So I'd go to school all day, go directly to Taco Bell afterwards, then go over to my boyfriend's house for a couple hours, then home. I was young and energetic and able to keep up with my schedule. So one night around 10 p.m., the rest of the restaurant employees were already gone and I closed and worked alone for the last couple hours. A tall, large black man came to the window and asked what the cheapest menu item was. He ordered it. I took his money, closed the little window, made change, and then handed him his food, then closed the little window. It was at that time that I noticed on one of his hands, his left, all his fingernails were at least an inch past his fingertips and filed into sharp pointy claws. I thought to myself, that was odd, but whatever. He then asked if I could make change for a $5 bill so that he could have exact change for the bus. I opened the window, took the $5 bill, and then turned to the cash register on my left, about 18 inches away making change. I hear something and look back and this guy's head is coming through the window followed by his arms and shoulders, and he's grabbing and clawing at me. I think he was trying to reach around me to get the cash in the register, but when he grabbed me, I thought he was coming in to assault me. 
Now in hindsight, I could have done a bunch of effective things to drive him back. Instead, I was screaming and started pummeling his face with my fists. I had brothers. I fought him off, grabbed the paper bills out of his hand, and drove him back through the window and shut it. I missed hitting him a couple times and hit the edge of the counter with my palms. I got big bruises from that. He ran off. I called the police and then called the owner of the restaurant. The police came and I made a report. The owner didn't want any press and was upset that I called the police. So a couple days later, I'm in a chemistry lecture, which is in a small amphitheater of maybe 150 students. The lecture is about to start and this guy sitting next to me on the right drops his calculator on the floor right in front of me. I kindly say, oh, I'll get it for you. I pick it off the floor and hand it back to him right into his open left hand with long cloth fingernails. Cue my racing heartbeat. I pretended not to know that he was the guy that robbed me and assaulted me. Coincidence? Not likely. As soon as class ended, I raced past five or six people to my left, practically flew right over them, and once I get to the main aisle, I look back at him. He raised his arms with a clawing motion towards me and growled at me as he was in pursuit of me. I took off out of there. The next time I went to that class, he tried to sit close to me again to intimidate me, and it was working. I decided to call the police from home that afternoon and explain the situation. The guy seemed to be following me around the campus and it scared me. I don't know if he followed me from school to my workplace to attack me there. They were many miles apart. The police had an undercover watch me at school before chemistry so I could point out my stalker. I had to tell my professor the situation of why I had people watching over me. The plan was to sit in the grass outside my chemistry class and when I saw the guy, I would give a nod and walk into my class. He didn't show up the first stakeout day, but did the second day. They arrested him. Now, the restaurant owner dropped the robbery charges as he didn't lose anything and didn't want the press. Nobody asked me and I was the one attacked. The police told me that they warned him never to look at me or talk to me ever again if we ran into each other. They will arrest him if he keeps it up. I never saw him again. He dropped the class. My professor gave me a B even though I never got better than a D on the test. He had a lengthy rationalization of why I deserved it, but I know he felt sorry for me. Fortunately, that helped because I was awful at chemistry, stalker or not. I gave my two weeks notice at the restaurant and every remaining night I worked, my parents would sit at an outdoor table and play cards until I left for home safely. Today I got into a lift and the lift driver was an older man, probably in his late 50s, maybe 60s. Anyway, my destination is less than 10 minutes away, a quick trip down the street. He starts making light conversation how's my day going, and whatnot. I make a joke that I don't even remember, and the next thing he says to me makes my blood run cold instantly. What if I just kidnapped you? I'm silent. <laughs> Bad joke, huh? Um, yeah, a little bit. At this point, I'm just praying that God takes me home. I start thinking about how to open the door and jump out if need be. Thankfully, I arrived safely at my destination and sent an email to Lyft about the incident. But seriously, what the fuck? I must start the story by making a disclaimer that I was a little bit high at the time of this event. I had smoked with my boyfriend two to three hours before, so it was minimal really. With that out of the way, here it goes. I was at my boyfriend's house after a night of cooking and watching movies. I could not stay the night because I had a matter to attend to the next day. Usually my boyfriend would just drop me off at home, but like I said, we had smoked so I preferred he'd stay home and I could just ride an Uber. It was quite late, a bit after midnight, and of course he did not like the idea. 
but it's usually safe to get an Uber back to your home, so I brushed it off. The time came for me to leave, and my boyfriend came to me to the Uber's door saying goodbye and making sure he took a look at the guy and the plates. And I was off. The drive from my boyfriend's house takes about 15 to 17 minutes. When we were about 7 minutes from getting home, he suddenly started talking to me about gas prices and whatnot, asking me if that was my boyfriend. I said yes. Mind you, it was quite obvious. And he just started giving me weird vibes, asking how old I was, if I drive a car, what car, etc. At some point, we were passing through a quiet, desolate, somewhat long road. I live in part of the city that is pretty covered with trees and nature, and there was a car stopped, seemingly having trouble. Then the guy asked me, Hey, if the car was suddenly stopped in the middle of the road, what would you do? I would let my parents know exactly where I was, so that they could come, and then ask for help. Smart. Now what if it stopped and there's no one around, and you had no battery on your phone? That wouldn't happen. I always had battery on my phone. He kept on insisting on what I would do in the situation. It felt weird and creepy, and my heart began beating so fast. He suddenly stopped asking, and I was letting my boyfriend know all that was happening. When we were very close to getting to my house, which again is in an even more desolate and dark area, he started talking about how dark and far from everywhere this was, and how he had never been here before. I don't know, it was weird, I didn't even want him to drop me off in front of my house because of not wanting him to know where I lived. When we got to my house, he just said bye, and I sped walked home and locked my doors as fast as I could. I'm not sure if I was just paranoid, or if this was just really off, but it felt weird, and the next time I will definitely be staying at my boyfriend's. So this all happened a few months ago. It was my friend's birthday party. We had a few drinks. The night went well. But my friend was wasted, so some of his friends took him, and I was waiting outside for a lift. Then a car stopped right before me. A man asked me what I was doing. Being a little overly tipsy, I said that I was waiting for my ride. He proceeded to tell me that he's an Uber driver, and that his client had just canceled, and that he could take me right in. Right then, I started to feel uneasy, but I said I was fine, I'm waiting. He demanded I cancel my trip and get in his car. I'm not dumb, I didn't cancel, but I showed him that the nearest Uber was 8 minutes away and he was right before my eyes, so he was obviously lying. For some reason, he showed me Google Maps as if it would prove anything to me. It just made me even more suspicious. He was being really persistent. But luckily, there was a cop car behind him, so he left. I was relieved for a second, but then two minutes later he comes back, and I tell him my ride is literally here, and it was cheaper anyway, so I won't take him. He said he would take me for cash. It's illegal for an Uber driver to take cash, so I was pretty sure he had ill intentions. At this point, I just freaked out, and thought that he could snatch me at any time now. Then he moved his upper body closer to me, as if he was trying to pull me. I was going to fight back, but I wasn't really prepared to. Some group, my friends I guess, asked me if I was okay and if he was bothering me. Right then, I explained to them everything, and they started yelling at him. He said things like, I didn't do anything to her, and argued with them some more, then left. They stayed with me until my ride was there and even checked the plate number and stuff. Needless to say, I was pretty shocked and thankful that I wasn't more drunk than I was. Also thankful that they saved me from the situation because I don't know where I would have ended up. I'm no rider, but it's 5 a.m. and it feels like a good time to get this off my chest. A while back, I went on a vacation to California I was taking two to three Ubers a day and usually made friendly small talk with the drivers. California weather was great, can't believe the prices here, and so on. One driver picked me up and by chance, I asked him if he could take me to In-N-Out 
a couple blocks from my hotel, and instead of the hotel itself, I was traveling alone. He asked me what I was doing in California, so I told him I was on vacation. He asked me who I came with. This made me instantly feel on edge, like I should save my boyfriend. It felt like he was trying to gauge if I was traveling alone. I said, I'm with family. He asked me where I was staying. I pretended I didn't hear him. He asked again and I said, a hotel. He asked me if it was near where he was dropping me off. Kinda. He asked me how long I had been in town. Oh, you know, vacation length, not too long. I had no problems telling my driver that I was from out of town, but I hated the questions he was asking. They felt off. He wanted too much detail for small talk. He started texting while driving. I was looking over his shoulder. The texts were not in English. I couldn't tell what language it was, but I could see my pickup location typed out. After he dropped me off, I watched his car. He pulled around the back of the parking lot and sat there, didn't leave the car. I stayed at the in and out for almost an hour, considering calling another Uber, and asked some random woman if they had a car that they could drive me in. Eventually, I walked a couple blocks to my hotel. I pretended to talk on the phone the entire time. Maybe I'm overreacting. The reason I walked back was because I convinced myself I was being judgmental and maybe he was just being friendly. But I had plenty of friendly drivers that trip that had no interest in sticking around an hour after dropping me off, texting about my location. This story happened about five years ago, back when I was still driving for Uber. I was driving back from Dallas after dropping a passenger in Ennis, Texas. It was a long trip and I was happy to make such a large amount of money for such a long trip. Ennis is about 50 miles south of Dallas, but I wasn't expecting to make anything on the way back. It's a risk you take when you drive for Uber. You might end up deadheading back. Nevertheless, I kept the app on just in case I got a ride. Uber allowed drivers to set their destinations and only accept rides as long as they're on the route or that ends up closer to your destination. About 20 minutes into my drive back, much to my surprise, I suddenly got a ping to pick up a woman named Sarah in Ferris, Texas. Ferris is about 40 miles from Dallas. I went to pick up the passenger and discovered that it was a young lady who appeared to be around 18 to 22 years old. The pickup spot was in front of the Ferris City Hall. That was kind of weird because it was Sunday and the whole town was basically closed. The young lady was standing at the curb in front of the City Hall with no one else around as far as the eyes can see. There were no houses or buildings or anything. She was standing there by herself wearing a t-shirt and blue jean shorts holding a duffel bag. The young lady got in my car and I confirmed that she was Sarah. Her destination was DFW International Airport. I confirmed the destination and set off to drop her off there. When I got to the airport, I quickly noticed that the map was directing me to the corporate headquarters of the international airport, not an actual gate. I asked Sarah if she had a terminal, airline, or gate information. She said, oh, any of them. I said, what? What do you mean? She said, just drop me off at the ticket counter. Ma'am, what airline? What terminal? Where do you have reservations? Oh, it doesn't matter. I haven't got my ticket yet. I again said, well, ma'am, you have to have a reservation, right? What airline and what terminal? No, I don't know where I'm going yet. They take cash, right? I don't know. I mean, I need a place to drop you off. The airport is huge. There are dozens of airlines and about six terminals. She finally just said to drop her off in front of the hotel's airport that is empty inside of the airport and she got out and walked off. Perplexed by the weirdness of this ordeal, on the way out, I flagged down an airport police officer and told him the whole story and told him where I dropped her off. He said he would check it out. This was five years ago. I never did find out what the heck that was all about. My race for possibilities. Was it human trafficking? 
Then why did she take the money and run? She didn't seem to be running from anyone though. Was she running away from home? If so, she seemed rather old for it. She appeared to be at least 18 and closer to 22. Escaping from an abusive husband? Maybe, but she didn't have a destination in mind. Drug mule? Several people suggested that to me. If so, why wouldn't she know where she was going? And if she's running from anything bad, why didn't she have me drop her off at the nearest police department? Anyway, that's my odd story. Any thoughts? I live in a city with a public transportation system. They have been extremely short-staffed, and more often than not, you have to call to make sure that your bus is coming. On weekdays, during business hours, the public transit operator will order a lift for you to get you to work if the bus isn't showing up or if they're short a driver. Tuesday, I'm at my bus stop. After checking multiple times if my bus is coming, I find out that it wasn't. They ordered me a lift and that was nice. An older gentleman was my driver. We had a casual conversation and he started to ask personal questions. I'm a bartender and I'm super friendly already, so I didn't think his questions were ill-intended. I told him I'm not married, and that I'm pretty much a loner, that I basically go to work and then home and spend time with my family. He says, I'd marry you in a heartbeat. Again, I'm just thinking he's being funny or nice. I asked him to drop me off at the downtown grocery so that I could pick up some things I needed for work. When we stopped, he said he was joking and that he was married and had a son my age. He asked if I was interested in maybe meeting him. Since I have a terrible track record, I figured it wouldn't hurt meeting someone out of my circle and comfort zone and gave the man my number and we parted ways. The next morning, he texted me and asked me if I needed a ride to work. I told him that he didn't have to do that and that I was sure that my bus was running. He said it would be his pleasure and that he would pick me up at my house around 3 p.m. Then about an hour later, he asked if I wanted to have lunch with him before work. I told him that I was already busy and that I couldn't do that. He said okay, see you at 3. He showed up at 3 and lets me know that he's outside. While I'm finishing getting my things together, I open the door and he starts walking up the stairs to my house. I told him I was ready and we could head downtown. When I get in the back seat, he turns around and says he has a confession. He told me from the time I took off my mask, his heart danced like a butterfly. He said he hasn't been able to stop thinking about me since the day before, and that he wanted to spend time with me, and that he'd pay for my time if I spent a day with him. That's when I started feeling super uncomfortable. The whole ride was making me cringe, but I know when you're in a situation like that with a predator, playing nice is safer than freaking out. He continued on the entire ride about how he loved me at first sight, and how he wanted to make me his Lebanese queen. As we got closer downtown, I started to feel relief. He dropped me off at my hotel and said that he'll see me tomorrow. That evening at work, I checked my phone after a busy happy hour. He had texted me a couple of times. He sent me a picture of the hotel and said that he would wait for me to get off work to give me a ride home. I told him I already have a ride, but thank you anyways. Fast forward to Thursday morning. I'm out running errands with my mom and sister. He texts me, How early can I come pick you up? Because I can't stop thinking about you. I asked him to please stop and that I was with my family. He continued to text me all day and evening, begging to see me, telling me that his heart was aching to see his Lebanese queen. I just kept saying stop. Friday morning, the shit hit the fan. He tells me that he loves me no matter what. He said, I told my wife about you and that I'm in love with you and I want a divorce. I told him please don't do that and it wasn't right to treat his wife that way. He said, It's not your fault. We're drifting apart anyways. Then he said, I'm picking you up for dinner at 5.30 and I'm not taking no for an answer. I ignored the messages during the day and just went about my day off. Around 5.25, my video doorbell rings and he's standing on my porch for at least 15 minutes. I told him that I wasn't home and that he should leave. He continues to text me and begs to come pick me up from my parents. 
I was at home the whole time, but I was too scared to let him know that. I eventually called the non-emergency police, but he had already left by the time I got through. I filed a general report, but technically they can't do anything unless he's standing on my porch threatening me. They advised me to report it through Lyft though, so I did. Haven't heard anything since, but that shit was just creepy as fuck. Come on, open up please. Be sweet. Don't disappoint me, please. Chat? Come on, hon, please open up. I know you're in there. Trigger warning for this story for sexual assault. There's timestamps to skip if you feel like doing so. Firstly, for reference, I was a 17 year old female at the time of the story. Okay, so about three years ago, I went on holiday with my boyfriend and his family. Long hot days at the beach, exploring the cities, swimming in the ocean. But I'm thinking of one particular night. My boyfriend and I had hung out with his stepsister most of the holiday. She was a year younger than us and likes getting drunk. Despite the fact that she annoyed us by following us all the time, we still hung out with her. So this one night, she suggests we go and find a club. I state that her and I are not old enough and only my boyfriend could get in. But nonetheless, we were walking to the other side of the island to go to this club. We're all pretty drunk. I fell over several times during this journey. So we finally get to the club, only to see all the people leaving it. We hadn't realized that it was 2am and it looks like the club had just closed. A bit disappointed, we looked to a McDonald's and I suggest that we refuel there. I go inside and order, but tell my boyfriend and the stepsister that I need some air. I go outside for a cigarette. I'm smoking when a black car pulls up into a taxi spot on the road. I have the idea that we might as well take a taxi back. I'm hurting from falling down and still am very drunk. How much for a taxi to the Bay Hotel? I asked him. 10 euros, he replied. Now, the problem was, we only had 5 euros left. I said to this man, please, will you drive us for 5? We're from the UK and we don't know here very well. So the man says, for you, 5 euro. My boyfriend and stepsister come out of McDonald's with the food and they see me talking to this man. I tell them he's a taxi man and that he's taking us back. The taxi man is surprised to see them and says he didn't know I was with friends, but come on, hop in. We're all about to get into the car, me and the stepsister in the back, boyfriend in front, when the man requests I sit in front. I had wanted to sit in the front anyway, and me being very drunk and stupid, please forgive me for my lack of intelligence in the story. I decided to just comply and go in the front, despite my boyfriend's protest. So, for the first part of the journey, everything's good. We're chatting and laughing together, and the taxi man is joining in. We have music on the radio, and I'm looking out the window at the wonderful oceanside views, plus the cool air is nice on my hot, drunken face. We all continue chatting away, and the taxi man is being friendly, asking us questions about the UK, and just generally making conversation. We all continue laughing and chatting away, and he takes my hand. His right hand is on the wheel. Bear in mind, this man is probably in his 50s, very chatty, so I thought nothing of it. He was just being friendly. Throughout our conversation, he's holding my hand every now and then. I'm starting to feel a little uncomfortable, but shrug it off, but it progresses. He placed my hand on his thighs, holding it tight in his hand. I move over on my seat away from him, but he keeps my hand there. I turned around and see the stepsister. She mouths, are you okay? I nod because the man had now let go of my hand. She then whispers something to my boyfriend and they go quiet for a minute. Seeing as he let go, the conversation continues. 
I can see that we're getting closer to our hotel, and I'm wishing for us to be there quickly. The man takes my hand again. This time, he places it on my thigh. He's holding my hand tightly. I'm very vulnerable at this point. I'm wearing a short, tight vest dress. I immediately clamp my legs together. I am now silent. I froze. My boyfriend notices and says, Mate, take your hands off her now. The man laughs and says, Friendly, I'm being friendly. He continues to keep his hand on my thigh. At this point, my boyfriend and her are telling him to stop it and pull over, but he just says that we are close to the hotel now. I feel sick. The alcohol is creeping up my stomach and throat. The man is still grasping my hand and he moves further at my thigh. I'm completely stiff at this point, knowing that if I even let my legs relax, even in the slightest, things would escalate. But they did anyway. He guided my hand up and with one of his fingers he touched me. I don't need to say where, because you already know. I stare out the window and I'm begging for the car to stop, and luckily, it does. I jump out of the car, and my boyfriend and her are looking at me. He touched me. My boyfriend races over to the driver's window, shouting and screaming at him, but the man speeds off very fast, and as he does, my boyfriend kicks his number plate, and we see it dent. We go back into the hotel, and needless to say, I drink more. The next morning we are going on a boat trip and my boyfriend's family are asking if I'm okay after hearing what happened. I said yes because it's true. It's over now. Could have gone a lot worse and I hope I'll never see him again. We leave the hotel lobby and that's when I see them. Taxis. White. Taxi signs on top of them pulled into the taxi ranks and I head over to one. Excuse me, I say to the taxi man. Are all the taxis white here? Yes, he says. The only taxi colors are white, with a sign on the top. I feel my insides churning. So let me reiterate this. A 50-year-old man thought me, a 17-year-old, was alone and pretended to be a taxi service to get me in the car. Creepy taxi predator. Please let's not meet again. I'm a 25 year old female. One day I had to get a lift from work. The driver was a normal looking dude in his 30s or so. We made normal conversation for the first few minutes about work and such. Then he randomly said something like, Lift and Uber can be pretty unsafe for young women. Uh, instant alarm bells. And how he said it, trying to pass it off in a normal conversation tone, but still could hear the creepiness behind it. He started driving really fast and I got even more freaked, but tried not to give him the satisfaction of showing it. He started going on a tirade about other female riders that he had had and how they were stupid for forgetting stuff or how they were chatty about dumb stuff like makeup and that I seemed smart and friendly and different. He seemed like he was trying to hide his anger for women in general. I was just replying to him trying to make it out okay. After 15 long minutes of him speeding, we're finally at my home. I get out of the car, and that's when I process what just happened, and my brain gives me permission to finally freak out. I feel shaken and report him. I doubted myself at first because he was really trying to pass it off as just a normal conversation. Lyft investigated it, and a month or so later I get a random 1 star rating on my writer profile. I'm guessing it was him wanting to get me back. Creepy Lyft driver, let's not meet again, and Lyft was wrong for letting you go back on. I'm a 32 year old female. I was in an Uber last night and I admit, I was quite drunk as I had a few beers. I ordered an Uber, then climbed in when the driver arrived. As I was quite drunk, I sort of dozed off a bit, however, I then noticed that we were going the wrong way. Not that he turned down a different road, but he was driving in the opposite direction. I started to freak out, and he basically laughed at me and was like, I'm trying to get you home. I'm not going to charge you more. And then he turned his car around. It should have been about a 10 minute trip, but took a half an hour. Honestly, if I hadn't noticed then, where the fuck was he going? 
as a woman, it really creeps me out. I'm going to put a complaint into Uber, but honestly, I'm not expecting any outcome from it. This was the first time I ever felt unsafe from an Uber ride. So to start this off, I'm a practicing pagan. I've been since around May of 2019. My best friend, let's call them M, is as well. So, we were using a paid traveling service to go to a local shop of religious items, and the driver that was taking us was extremely talkative. Eventually, he starts pestering us, wanting to know what the place we were going to is. I tell him it's a shop for religious studies, and he asked if it's for Christians. I tell him it's for everybody, no matter what religious background. He eventually decides to ask me what my favorite religion is. Immediately, I become uncomfortable, because based on his question about Christians earlier, I have a feeling as where this is going. I tell him, I don't have a favorite, but I'm pagan, because I don't want to lie about my faith. As I responded, he starts to slow down the car. We're on a very quiet street, so small that the road itself was made out of red bricks, rather than tar. He then asks, so you don't believe in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? My heart was literally thumping. Every single alarm I have is blaring, telling me that Emma and I need to get the hell out of this car. I tell him that I don't worship him as a religious figure, but I do believe in the historical documentation that he was alive. He begins to turn his head, and I could just see M in the seat next to me, internally freaking the hell out. Then, like a literal miracle, these men burst out of their house that the car had basically stopped in front of to hang dry their clothes. The driver immediately started the car up and sped away towards our destination. As we pulled up, he began to ask us how long we were going to take in the store. He told us, I could just take you back home so you won't have to pay for another ride. But we told him that it would be more than likely a few hours until we finished up. He said okay, but looked almost irritated. After we went in the store, he stayed in the parking lot for a good 30 to 40 minutes. We watched him for a while, and then we went to do our shopping. Halfway through, we realized he still hadn't left. We let the store owner know, and then called my grandmother to give us a ride home. I'll never forget the alarms that blared in my head that day. He was strange in the beginning, but obviously got more weird when all that started up. I don't care if you believe me when I say this, but... I'm extremely intuitive, and my intuition was telling me that this man wanted to hurt us. I'm a 29 year old female. I often go to the Target near my office during my lunch break. I either go to pick up stuff for the office as I'm an office manager, or I go to pick up stuff for my apartment. I also just like to browse the aisles to unwind. On this particular day, I just went to browse. I was looking through the dollar section near the entrance when a woman around my age approached me and asked me, Hey, I love your shoes. Where did you get it? I told her thank you and mentioned the name of the store that I bought my shoes from. Then she looked at me with her face scrunched and said, You look familiar. Did we go to school together? She seemed genuine enough but looked super unfamiliar to me so I responded, no. She looked a little taken aback by this and then quickly said, Well, my mistake. Have a good day. And then began looking for something on the shelves behind me. After about a minute or so, I decided to move to the snack aisle. I was looking for some chips until I noticed the woman at the end of the aisle holding something and looking at me. When I turned to look at her, she looked back down at the bag of candy that was in her hands. At this point, I didn't really think anything of it. If anything, I had assumed that she was still trying to place me as someone she knew. It wasn't until three to four aisles later when I kept catching her looking at me that something began to feel off. I walked over to the cleaning section to see if she would follow me and I noticed her again. This target was particularly busy so I felt okay approaching her. I asked her why she was following me. She replied, no, of course not. I'm just shopping around, with a smile on her face. 
I told her that it was making me feel uncomfortable because I felt like she was. She stated that it was just a coincidence. I didn't want to press it any further, so I told her that if I saw her again, that I would be telling Target security and would be asking them to escort me to my Uber. No, I actually drove my own car, but I didn't want her to know that if she didn't know already. A few minutes later, I saw her following me again, and without hesitation, I told her I was going to talk to an employee about her. And while I was beginning to walk up to a store employee, I saw the woman walking back to the store exit to leave, or so I thought so. The employee stated that they couldn't really kick out the lady since she hasn't really done anything, but that I could have someone walk me out to my car if I wanted. About 10 minutes or so after this, I completed my purchase and checked out. I went over to customer service to have someone escort me to my car, and I saw the woman in the clothing section speaking to another young woman and gave her the same line she gave to me. Did we go to school together? You look so familiar. I have no idea what her end goal was, but it definitely gave me the creeps. I went to a local craft store today around 10 a.m., an hour after they opened on a Tuesday, so not a lot of other customers in a decently large store. I was in an aisle near the back of the store trying to pick out some yarn colors for a few minutes when I suddenly felt a tap on my shoulder. The woman who tapped me then popped up on my right side and held out a piece of paper. The paper was a lengthy note about being born, unable to speak, that she's pregnant and asking for money. I honestly did not continue to read the rest. I can't even describe the strange vibe this woman was giving off as she stood there holding her note with an unsettling grin. I politely declined. I never carry cash anymore. Her grin disappeared like a switch and then she just folded up her note and walked away. I quickly left that aisle and went towards a more populated front of the store, trying to shake the uneasy feeling from the encounter. I started to browse around in another area and noticed the same girl lingering around the aisle across from me. I moved to another area and she seemed to follow. I then decided to just go find the one thing I actually came to the store for and leave. While I stopped to look in that aisle, the woman walked right behind me, paused for a second, then kept walking. At this point, I had enough. I quickly paid and got out of there. I am still just trying to shake the feeling. Something seemed very off about the situation, from the initial approach to her whole demeanor. I was looking forward to finding craft supplies, but I was more happy to just get home afterwards. As far as I could tell, she did nothing more than creep me out. I live 10 minutes away from Walmart, but honestly would rather drive 45 minutes to the next town's Walmart. The Walmart by me is just unpleasant. My brother and I decided one day to just go because we needed something quick and was short on time. We went in and browsed the electronic section. Sometimes they have cool stuff. With nothing found, I browsed the computers while my brother quickly looked at LED lights. As I was walking away, I noticed a tall man with gray hair walking super close to an older lady, and I just thought they knew each other. When I passed him, he got super close behind me. My eyes bugged out of my head because I knew how close he was, and my brother looked behind him because I was walking towards my brother. His eyes bugged out too, so I knew I wasn't imagining it. He got so close that I decided to turn around to see who he was and I didn't recognize him, and I ended up darting into the next aisle when my brother came up behind me and said to keep walking because he was behind us. Next to the electronics, the next aisle over is the arts and crafts supplies. We kept walking and my brother peered behind us and he loudly whispered, Oh my god, he's following us. Go, go. We made it to the auto section, which was the main reason for the visit. I was relieved when we got there, as there were more people around than in electronics. After getting what we needed, we made our way back to the electronics to pay. It was over 20 minutes since we last seen the Danny Phantom looking guy. We turned the corner and we see the guy again. His eyes dart right at me as I try to ignore it. 
The ladies at the electronic checkout looked a bit off and I noticed them speaking Spanish. I picked up that they had called security because the guy was just standing there. Meanwhile, in line to pay, security comes up and asks the guy if he's waiting on someone. And he replied no and turned away. After we paid, I told my brother that's why I don't shop here anymore. As we walked to the front of the store, the same guy was following us out. We ran to our jeep and locked the doors. My brother described his eyes as hunting eyes, dead and soulless. I don't know what happened after we left, but I now don't shop anywhere near my home to avoid the weirdos of my city. I'm a 22 year old male from Kentucky and this happened like an hour ago at my local Dollar General. I pulled up and saw this guy walking from the gas station. The gas station had a parking lot in the back for semi trucks. When I got out of my car, I looked at him from a distance and literally got the strangest vibes. Like I kept feeling like he was going to pull out a gun and shoot me. I go out all the time and I'm not scared of people like that, but I do feel like I'm good at picking up on people's energy. We both walk into the store basically at the same time, him being behind me. The whole time I felt like he was about to shoot me or something. After I'm in the store, I grab a basket and start looking at cereals to my right. The creepy guy didn't grab a basket or cart and just walked in and stood there, looked around, then went down another aisle. He walked past me a few different times and when I was looking at the candy I saw him walk around the corner and he was standing on the opposite of the aisle that I was on and I swear that he was watching me through the crack. I didn't see him anymore until after I checked out I saw him walking back towards where the semi truck drivers park. Possible serial killer alert. He was also not walking straight like he was slightly drunk. Why was I getting such insanely creepy vibes? And why did he look at me like that when we were walking in? So it's pretty early in the morning, like 7.30ish. Streets were pretty empty, not really pedestrians in sight despite it being a metropolitan city. I had to go to work that morning and I had gotten up earlier than usual. So I decided to go to a cafe to get my disgustingly heavily modded health drink. The cafe was completely empty, save for me and the lone barista. Suddenly, while I was waiting for my drink at the handoff area, this guy in his 50s walks into the cafe. He doesn't even go to the register. He stands two feet away from me, staring. He hasn't ordered anything, not even in line to order anything. He's just staring at me. I try to give him the benefit of the doubt and step aside to let him go to the restroom. He pulls on the door a few times before returning to my side to continue staring. I'm just so bewildered. I just give him this look. I don't know, like I'm shocked or something. I mention to the barista that he's a creepy weirdo and he immediately leaves, sits on one of the outside chairs. I got my drink, go outside to leave for work and he says something to me. I don't even know what he said because at this point I'm so creeped out that I'm basically running to my car. I don't know what his problem was, never saw him in my life. His facial expressions when he was staring wasn't angrily malicious but it definitely felt predatorial as fuck. Something about the intensity of his gaze. I wish I would have heard what he said so I could have some context but the entire experience was chilling. The other day I went to Target with my husband and my daughter. I wanted to go Halloween decor shopping so when we got there I was eagerly walking to their seasonal section. My husband veered off into another aisle and I just continued to walk by myself. A man came out of the aisle and kind of abruptly got my attention waving around a spatula saying, Hey, I have a question for you. I said, Okay. And he just asked me, what colors would you think a man should have in their kitchen? I just got my first apartment and I'm not sure what to go with. He looks like he's about 40 to me, so it struck me as odd, but he was seemingly friendly enough. So I told him that the black spatula he had in his hand seemed like a fine color. He then thanked me and introduced himself. I said it was nice to meet you, 
and he just stood there waiting for me to introduce myself. Because I felt pressured, and I am a really socially awkward people pleaser, I told him my first name, and that was the end of the convo. Well, almost two days go by, and I just got a follow request from him, and I'm really freaking weirded out right now. My husband is telling me that it's my fault, that I should have known better, and he's right, but I'm scared. I'm a woman in my mid-twenties. I went to Casey's earlier today, and when I tried to open the door, double door, it wouldn't open. I then pushed the left side, and it started to open. A middle-aged man had his hand on the handle to the door as I opened it. Turned out that he held the right door shut as I was trying to get in. He did it as a joke and I faked a laugh and went in and shopped. A few minutes later I'm checking out and he gets behind me real close and repeats, You just cut it, jokingly, about five times. I thought he had left because it looked like he was checking out earlier and I hadn't seen him in the store. I was the only one checking out so the joke was also coming out of nowhere. I didn't respond until the fifth time and said, it's still early. He eventually stopped as I wasn't showing interest. Luckily, nothing else happened after that. Just super odd. I stopped quickly at Safeway on the way home from work. As I was walking back to my car, I saw a couple walking a fluffy white husky dog. A big dog, and in my head, I marveled on how fluffy the dog was. I love dogs. I got in my car, and as I was climbing in, I heard a female voice say something unintelligible. I glanced around, saw the guy who had the dog standing behind the car next to me, which struck me as odd and a little disconcerting. I hit the door lock button immediately. I started the car, and as I did, I noticed the girl standing on the passenger side, peering into my window with her mouth moving, but I couldn't hear what she was saying. She clearly wanted me to roll down the window. I have watched way too many crime shows to consider this. Do you know how many women go missing from grocery store parking lots? Neither do I, but based on what I've watched, it's a whole fucking lot. I made eye contact for a half second, shook my head sternly, and put my car into gear. I reversed out of the spot, carefully not to hit her, but while also completely ignoring her, as she got more and more distraught, waving her arms and flailing at my car. She was wearing pajamas from what I could see, and getting more and more upset by me ignoring her. Her partner remained in the shadows with the dog, seemingly unaware that I had already clocked him and was watching him too. There was a teeny part in my brain asking, what if she needed help? but a much bigger part of my brain saying, Nope. If they need help, they can go into the store and ask them to call 911. Also, there were two of them and only one of me. I was outnumbered. Plus, they have a huge dog. Why the fuck would they ask a small, young, lone woman in the parking lot for help unless they had nefarious intentions? My mind went to drugs, maybe. I'm almost certain that they were asking for money or a ride somewhere. Even more sketchy or for some form of assistance. I'm under no obligation to help anyone, especially a stranger. Also, I have helped plenty of people today. I have helped people under careful, cautious observation. I work as a caregiver in a nursing home. If you're approaching a young woman in the dark at a parking lot at 10.30 p.m., I sincerely doubt you contribute anything positive to my life and I owe you absolutely nothing. Fuck off. Mama ain't raised no fool. Anyways, reminder to always trust your gut. Dating myself here with the department store reference, but I'll do you one better. When I was in my early teens, I would ride my bicycle to Kmart to look at and buy modeled cars and supplies. That was my thing back then, building model cars I can't say if I was in any real danger, but basically I was stalked. While I was deciding between a 66 Chevelle or an 85 Camaro, I see this man, mid-30ish, walk past the aisle I'm in. Then he passes the same aisle from the other end. Once I made up my mind and leave the aisle, he's on the far end and starts walking the parallel aisle to me. 
I'm not weirded out yet, but I make a detour down another aisle to ditch him, or so I thought. I doubled back and got to the main aisle and head towards the front, towards the registers. He popped out of another aisle, further up facing me, then turns down the next one. Each time I encounter him, he smiles, making eye contact. So I put my model down and turn 180, head towards the back of the store. There's a service entrance back there, so I make for that. Thinking I lost him or confused him, I still wanted to buy the Camaro, so I went back towards the front. There he is, sitting on a bench in the lobby, still making eye contact, still smiling. Now at this point, the obvious answer would have been to just turn around and bolt, but in an effort to keep my bike from getting stolen, I had secured it to the railing inside the lobby and I didn't want to stand still in his presence. I quickly went back into the store and zigzagged down the aisles trying to lose him. By now I was significantly freaked out but still don't want to make a scene. Every time I made my way back out onto the main aisle, there he was. I'm walking at a brisk pace and he's just casually strolling but always in my direction. At one point, I pass the sporting goods, so I pick up and start carrying a baseball bat. I pass him on the main aisle on purpose now, showing him my weapon. He's unfazed, just casually making his way up and down the aisles, still smiling, still eye contact. I'm just short of running now, almost back into the service department, when he gives up the subterfuge of chance encounters and directly follows me. He's not at my pace, but manages to keep up. I give up, I toss a bat and make for the service desk. A relatively stout African American man, hey, I think this guy, while throwing a thumb in his direction, is following me. Can you call someone? He hadn't came around the corner yet, so I never saw his reaction, but we heard crashing and heavy fast footfalls. He had ran towards the service entrance, knocking over a display on his way out. The service rider stood by me while the police were called. Once there, the cops took a statement, did a walk around. He was long gone. Then they put my bike in their cruises and drove me home. I didn't go back to Kmart on my own until I was old enough to drive and still never went back for that model Camaro, damn it. Backstory so I'm tiny, and I guess legally, and by other standards, I would be considered a little person. I also look a lot younger than I actually am. I'm in my mid-30s, look like I'm still in my early 20s. For some reason, I attract a lot of older gentlemen, and by older, I mean old enough to be my grandfather. This has happened since I was a teenager. I was with my mom, nieces, and nephews at a Burger King the other day. The restaurant was pretty empty, with it just being one other lady, us, and the employees. My mom ordered for herself and the kids, and I told her that I would pay for my own meal, so she went to go settle the kids down at a table. As she was doing that, two men walked in, I'm guessing father and son, walking up right behind me in line, and I'm already at the counter, standing very close. The older gentleman asked me if I was in line, and I said yes, a little forcefully. I was facing the cashier this entire time. Next thing I know, I hear in my right ear, I like the way you said yes, nice and strong. I kind of give a nervous chuckle and say thank you. Then I hear in my ear again, I like your ponytail. And again, I give a nervous chuckle, express my thanks again, and give my order to the cashier. I turn around and went to go sit with my family. Again, the whole restaurant was empty and these two men decided to sit at the table right next to us. The older gentleman talks to my mom a little about being a grandparent. When we finally leave, I told my mom how uncomfortable the guy made me. Why did he stand so close and it was so creepy hearing the voice right next to me. I ran to Target around 6pm today, alone to get some Alani's and coffee. I was dressed nicely with my hair done, not looking distressed or anything. I walk past this lady on my way to get coffee pods and I hear her say something like, oh my god, ew. I honestly figured she was talking about me but I didn't really give a fuck because I have really bad social anxiety 
and hate confrontation. I avoid it at all costs. Blah blah. I'm on the coffee aisle now and I turn around and the woman is approaching me. She asked me if I believe in readings and I said, I don't know. What's super creepy is last evening I was watching videos on something called Rue, which is some sort of black magic. I was reading some pretty creepy comments. Anyways, she proceeded to tell me that I have blackness surrounding me completely and that I'm cursed. She said that she doesn't know if it was passed down or was put on me in this lifetime. She said she could barely stand to look at me and that I'm a beautiful soul that was trapped by darkness. The beginning of this year, I lost my first child to a horrific pregnancy loss where I could have died. I also lost one of my best friends to a Xanax OD amongst a life filled with tragic shit like that. Once when I was 20, I was hanging out with my friend and his cousin. His cousin would not look at me for what was like two hours. When he finally did, he told me that he couldn't look at me because I looked like a witch and that he knew as soon as he saw me. I don't remember much, but I remember him saying that I needed to get a book and follow everything in order to have peace in my life. He said I had no choice in being a witch and that I must either accept it and play by the rules or I will live a life of sadness and misery. He said that he was a fucking warlock. I don't know. I'm just super creeped out. When the lady walked away from me, she said that I needed to pray to change my life. She said that I needed a reading immediately. It was already triggering and when she walked away, I started crying and just pacing. I left everything in the basket on the floor and waited a bit. I didn't know she was following me or something. It scared me too because I'm from Moroccan descent and I know that some of my family has fucked around with voodoo. It's big in Africa. I've had so many health issues this year too. Just wanted to share this because I'm still pretty shaken up. This happened to me when I was a small child around 6 years old at a discount store in Ohio. I was one aisle away from my mother admiring toys when someone walked up and took my hand. I assumed it was my mother and just started walking without looking up because I was still too busy checking out the toys. Halfway out the store when I realized that we were heading to the doors and not checking out. I glanced up and saw the person holding my hand was a middle aged man with dark hair and a leather jacket, certainly not my mother. He grinned at me and tried to keep walking but I immediately froze on spot and dropped his hand, booking it back where I last saw my mother while crying. Once I made it back to my mother my memory becomes a lot more of a blur but the next thing I can remember is being in the car with my mother while she sobbed on the phone with the police. She had a car phone back then. They never caught the guy though, so no charges were ever pressed. It's scary to think that that could have been the end of my life if I hadn't glanced up when I did. She never let me out of her sight in public again the rest of my childhood, understandably so. It was late afternoon in a relatively busy grocery store. I was happy to find a parking spot not too far away from the entrance. I had just finished buying my groceries and as soon as I walked out of the store, I see this man just standing around where my car was parked. I had to pass him in order to get to my car. I immediately feel something in my stomach that triggered me to walk on the opposite way. So I changed my course on the dime and just tried to make my way to the parking lot from a different direction. As soon as I crossed the street, the man started walking in my direction. Right away, my alarms are going off. I quickly pick up the pace and so does he. At that point, my heart starts racing and I pick up the pace even more. I keep looking back to make sure he knows that I see him. He's about less than 10 feet behind me and closing in. So when I look behind me, I notice that he's trying to look not suspicious by looking in the other direction. At that point, I quickly made a right into a space between two cars and thankfully lost his line of sight. I hid behind the two cars and watched him look around for me. I'm not far away from my car and at this point, I position myself so that I am now behind him and he's far in front of me, still looking around for me. I get safely in my car and drive out of the parking lot, never taking my eyes off the man who just sat at the end of the lot on the curb as I drove away. 
Be safe out there, everyone, and always be aware of your surroundings. I'm a female, and this happened when I was 18. Back in October 2020, I was visiting my boyfriend, who was 17 at the time, in England for the first time. Since I had never been to England before, we obviously went sightseeing in London. And before anyone thinks that we were bad people, this was a few weeks before England went into lockdown again, and we made sure to wear our masks. So, on one of the days out, my boyfriend's mom decided that I should go see Camden Town Market, as it's a very popular area. When we got there, it was loaded with people, surprisingly, and many shops were open. My boyfriend and I split up from his parents and just walk around aimlessly, just seeing all the places and cool artwork on the building and such. Now, at this time, alternative clothing and music was very trendy on social media, and there were a few alt clothing shops on the strip of market. I saw a specific place that was crowded with merchandise, and even though I never actually wore alt clothing, I just wanted to see what the shop sold. Now, I won't actually give the name of the place for obvious reasons, but I just wanted it stated for a reason of the story that the shop isn't even there anymore. I have researched this place many times since this happened, and it's seemingly gone. So we head into the shop. It was packed tight with clothes everywhere. I generally couldn't believe how much there was, but it all seemed almost the same. It was all gothic alternative, and was just spilling everywhere. Seriously, the walkway was so small. You couldn't even really see out of the store's front window. There was two guys working in the store, dressed like normal English guys, black hoodies, and just regular sweatpants. When my boyfriend and I walked up to the end of the store, which wasn't too far back as the store was very small, we stopped and looked at the clothes for a few minutes. It's something to note that my boyfriend and I are both very awkward and shy people. So when we entered the shop, I personally was already anxious socially as it was dead quiet. There was no noise. It was just us whispering and even that felt too loud. I was trying to find a nice way to leave without seeming odd since we just arrived and already I was not interested in the clothes. I pulled out my phone and guy one said something along the lines of, no phones please. And there's also a sign above us that stated no pictures. So I just thought they didn't like pictures taken, which is fair enough. At this point, Guy One was standing a few feet behind us, next to a side door along the wall of the shop, and Guy Two was sitting in a chair across from the side door. I was getting bored and just wanted to leave, so I whispered to my boyfriend, We can go now. As we turned, Guy One opened up the side door and said, We have more downstairs, come look. Now a few things to note, I'm slightly paranoid of being abducted, but then again, what girl isn't? Two, yes, it's not bizarre for a shop in Camden to have a lower underground floor, as many shops we went to did. It was just slightly bizarre that the stairwell resembled a basement, if you will, not an open and large stairway to the lower level, like the other shops. Just one door that opened to a U-shaped stairwell into the basement. After he said this, my boyfriend, the silly night he is, just followed the man downstairs. I stood in the doorway, having an awful pit in my stomach, and just watched him get halfway down, when all of a sudden guy number two, who was still behind me at this point, said, Go on. And I felt so uncomfortable after hearing him say that, that I just said, No, I'm okay. I called for my boyfriend and said, We're leaving, come on. And I just grabbed his hand and left very quickly. We walked down the road a bit, and I was very shaken up as it was a very bizarre situation. If they had more clothes downstairs, why do they say it's so creepy? Why not just say, if you're interested, we have some more downstairs, just let me know. My boyfriend was not as spooked as me. He actually told me that I was most likely overthinking it, and I understand why. It wasn't until I got home to the States and told my mom and coworkers about this encounter that anyone raised any sort of concern. Everyone I've told this story to has agreed that something was off, and on top of the store not being there anymore just makes me feel a little weirded out. I understand, it could have been a genuine store, but the no phone thing, and the creepy basement gesture, and the certain way they spoke to us just made me not want to risk it. 